This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Edited by D. Lang Purves. Note by the reader. The preface you are about to hear has been modified. The original preface was written for an edition that included Spencer's The Fairy Queen, lesser-known poems by both Chaucer and Spencer, and copious notes by the editor, D. Lang Purves. In this LibriVox recording of the Canterbury Tales, a decision was taken to focus only on the text itself. To view the notes, which are very helpful, please go to the LibriVox catalogue page of the Canterbury Tales, where you will find a link to the Gutenberg e-text used for this reading. Preface The object of this volume is to place before the general reader our early poetic masterpiece, The Canterbury Tales, to do so in a way that will render its popular perusal easy in a time of little leisure and unbounded temptations to intellectual languor. The Canterbury Tales, so far as they are in verse, have been printed without any abridgment or designed change in the sense. But the two tales in prose, Chaucer's tale of Melibius and the parson's long sermon on penitence, have been contracted so as to exclude thirty pages of unattractive prose. The gaps thus made in the prose tales, however, are supplied by careful outlines of the omitted matter, so that the reader need be at no loss to comprehend the whole scope and sequence of the original. As regards the manner in which the text is presented, the editor is aware that some whose judgment is weighty will differ from him. This volume has been prepared for popular perusal, and its very raison d'être would have failed if the ancient orthography had been retained. It has often been affirmed by editors of Chaucer in the old forms of the language that a little trouble at first would render the antiquated spelling and obsolete inflections a continual source not of difficulty but of actual delight, for the reader coming to the study of Chaucer without any preliminary acquaintance with the English of his day, or of his copyist's days. Despite this complacent assurance, the obvious fact is that Chaucer in the old forms has not become popular in the true sense of the word. He is not understanded of the vulgar. In this volume, therefore, the text of Chaucer has been presented in nineteenth-century garb. But there has been not the slightest attempt to modernize Chaucer in the wider meaning of the phrase, to replace his words by words which he did not use or, following the example of some operators, to translate him into English of the modern spirit as well as the modern forms. So far from that, in every case where the old spelling or form seemed essential to metre, to rhyme or to meaning, no change has been attempted. But wherever its preservation was not essential, the spelling of the monkish transcribers, for the most ardent purist must now despair of getting the spelling of Chaucer himself, has been discarded for that of the reader's own day. It is a poor compliment to the father of English poetry to say that by such treatment the bouquet and individuality of his works must be lost. If his masterpiece is valuable for one thing more than any other, it is the vivid distinctness with which English men and women of the fourteenth century are there painted for the study of all the centuries to follow but we wantonly balk the artist's own purpose and discredit his labour when we keep before his picture the screen of dust and cobwebs which, for the English people in these days, the crude forms of the infant language have practically become. Shakespeare has not suffered by similar changes. Spencer has not suffered. It would be surprising if Chaucer should suffer when the loss of popular comprehension and favour in his case are necessarily all the greater for his remoteness from our day. In his other poems we behold Chaucer as he was, a courtier, a gallant, pure-hearted gentleman, a scholar, a philosopher, a poet of gay and vivid fancy, playing around themes of chivalric convention, of deep human interest, or broad-sighted satire. 
In the Canterbury Tales we see not Chaucer, but Chaucer's times and neighbours. The artist has lost himself in his work. To show him honestly and without disguise, as he lived his own life, and sung his own songs at the brilliant court of Edward III, is to do his memory a moral justice far more material than any wrong that can ever come out of spelling. From books the editor has derived valuable help, as from Mr. Cowden Clark's revised modern text of the Canterbury Tales, published in Mr. Mimo's library edition of the English Poets, from Mr. Wright's scholarly edition of the same work, from the indispensable Tyrwit, from Mr. Bell's edition of Chaucer's poem, and from many others. The editor leaves his task with the hope that his attempt to remove artificial obstacles to the popularity of one of England's earliest poets will not altogether miscarry. D. Lane Purves End of Preface Recorded by Gazina in Valletta, June 2006
and whose descent was traced to the demigods. Leyland may seem to have had fair opportunities of getting at the truth about Chaucer's birth, for Henry the Eighth had him, at the suppression of the monasteries throughout England, to search for records of public interest the archives of the religious houses. But it may be questioned whether he was likely to find many authentic particulars regarding the personal history of the poet in the quarters which he explored, and Leyland's testimony seems to be set aside by Chaucer's own evidence as to his birthplace, and by the contemporary references which make him out an aged man for years preceding the accepted date of his death. In one of his prose works, The Testament of Love, the poet speaks of himself in terms that strongly confirm the claim of London to the honour of giving him birth, for he there mentions the city of London that is to me so dear and sweet in which I was forth growed, and more kindly love, says he, have I to that place than to any other in earth, as every kindly creature hath full appetite to that place of his kindly engenderer and will rest and peace in that place to abide. This tolerably direct evidence is supported, so far as can be at such an interval of time, by the learned Camden. In his Annals of Queen Elizabeth he describes Spencer, who was certainly born in London, as being a fellow-citizen of Chaucer's, Edmundus Spencerus Patria Londinesis, Musius adeo aridindibus natus ut omnis anglicos superiosus avi poetas, ne chocero quidem concibe excepto supranet. The records of the time notice more than one person of the name of Chaucer who held honorable positions about the court, and though we cannot distinctly trace the poet's relationship with any of these namesakes or antecessors, we find excellent ground of belief that his family or friends stood well at court, in the ease with which Chaucer made his way there, and in his subsequent career. Like his great successor, Spencer, it was the fortune of Chaucer to live under a splendid, chivalrous, and high-spirited reign. 1328 was the second year of Edward the Third, and, what with Scotch wars, French expeditions, and the strenuous and costly struggle to hold England in a worthy place among the states of Europe, there was sufficient bustle, bold achievement, and high ambition in the period to inspire a poet who was prepared to catch the spirit of the day. It was an age of elaborate courtesy, of high-paced gallantry, of courageous venture, of noble disdain for mean tranquillity, and Chaucer, on the whole a man of peaceful avocations, was penetrated to the depth of his consciousness with the lofty and lovely civil side of that brilliant and restless military period. No record of his youthful years, however, remains to us. If we believe that on the age of eighteen he was a student at Cambridge, it is only on the strength of a reference in his Court of Love, where the narrator is made to say that his name is Philogenet of Cambridge Clerk, while he had already told us that when he stirred to seek the court of Cupid, he was at eighteen year of age. According to Leyland, however, he was educated at Oxford, proceeding thence to France and the Netherlands to finish his studies, but there remains no certain evidence of his having belonged to either university. At the same time, it is not doubted that his family was of good condition, and whether or not we accept the assertion that his father held the rank of knighthood, rejecting the hypothesis that made him a merchant or a vintner at the corner of Curtain Lane, it is plain from Chaucer's whole career that he had introductions to public life and recommendations to courtly favor wholly independent of his genius. We have the clearest testimony that his mental training was of wide range and thorough excellence, although rare for a mere courtier in those days. His poems attest his intimate acquaintance with the divinity, the philosophy, and the scholarship of his time, and show him to have had the sciences, as then developed and taught, at his fingers' ends. 
Another proof of Chaucer's good birth and fortune would be found in the statement that, after his university career was completed, he entered the inner temple, the expenses of which could be borne only by men of noble and opulent families. But although there is a story that he was once fined two shillings for thrashing a Franciscan friar in Fleet Street, we have no direct authority for believing that the poet devoted himself to the uncongenial study of the law. No special display of knowledge on that subject appears in his works, yet in the sketch of the Mansiple, in the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, may be found indications of his familiarity with the internal economy of the inns of court. While numerous legal phrases and references hint that his comprehensive information was not at fault on legal matters. Leyland says that he quitted the university a ready logician, a smooth rhetorician, a pleasant poet, a grave philosopher, an ingenious mathematician, and a holy divine, and by all accounts, when Geoffrey Chaucer comes before us authentically for the first time, at the age of thirty-one, he was possessed of knowledge and accomplishments far beyond the common standard of his day. Chaucer at this period possessed also other qualities fitted to recommend him to favor in a court like that of Edward the Third. Urey describes him, on the authority of a portrait, as being then of fair, beautiful complexion, his lips red and full, his size of a just medium, and his port and air graceful and majestic. So continues the ardent biographer, so every ornament that could claim the approbation of the great and fair, his abilities to record the valor of the one and celebrate the beauty of the other, and his wit and gentle behavior to converse with both, conspired to make him a complete courtier. If we believe that his court of love had received such publicity as the literary media of the time allowed in the somewhat narrow and select literary world, not to speak of Troilus and Cressida, which, as Lydgate mentions, is first among Chaucer's works, some have supposed to be a youthful production. We find a third and not less powerful recommendation to the favor of the great cooperating with his learning and his gallant bearing. Elsewhere, reasons have been shown for doubt whether Trollius and Cressida should not be assigned to a later period of Chaucer's life, but very little is positively known about the dates and sequence of his various works. In the year 1386, being called as witness with regard to a contest on a point of heraldry between Lord Scrope and Sir Robert Grosvenor, Chaucer deposed that he entered on his military career in 1359. In that year Edward III invaded France for the third time in pursuit of his claim to the French crown, and we may fancy that in describing the embarkation of the knights in Chaucer's dream, the poet gained some of the vividness and stir of his picture from his recollections of the embarkation of the splendid and well-appointed royal host at Sandwich, on board the eleven hundred transports provided for the enterprise. In this expedition the laurels of Poitiers were flung on the ground. After vainly attempting Rennes and Paris, Edward was constrained by cruel weather and lack of provisions to retreat toward his ships. The fury of the elements made the retreat more disastrous than an overthrow in pitched battle. Horses and men perished by the thousands, or fell into the hands of the pursuing French. Chaucer, who had been made a prisoner at the siege of Retter, was among the captives in the possession of France when the Treaty of Brittany, the Great Peace, was concluded. In May, 1360. Returning to England, as we may suppose, at the peace, the poet, ere long, fell into another and a pleasanter captivity, for his marriage is generally believed to have taken place shortly after his release from foreign durance. He had already gained the personal friendship and favor of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the king's son, the duke, while Earl of Richmond had courted and won to wife after a certain delay, Blanche, daughter and co-heiress of Henry, Duke of Lancaster, 
and Chaucer is by some believed to have written The Assembly of Fowls to celebrate the wooing, as he wrote Chaucer's Dream to celebrate the wedding of his patron. The marriage took place in 1359, the year of Chaucer's expedition to France, and, as in The Assembly of Fowls, the formel, or female eagle, who is supposed to represent the Lady Blanche, begs that her choice of a mate may be deferred for a year. 1358 and 1359 have been assigned as the respective dates of the two poems already mentioned. In the dream, Chaucer prominently introduces his own lady love, to whom, after the happy union of his patron with the Lady Blanche, he is wedded amid great rejoicing, and various expressions in the same poem show that not only was the poet high in favor with the illustrious pair, but that his future wife had also peculiar claims on their regard. She was the younger daughter of Sir Payne Roet, a native of Hainault, who had, like many of his countrymen, been attracted to England by the example and patronage of Queen Philippa. The favorite attendant on the Lady Blanche was her elder sister, Catherine, subsequently married to Sir Hugh Swinford, a gentleman of Lincolnshire, and destined, after the death of Blanche, to be in succession governess of her children, mistress of John of Gaunt, and lawfully wedded Duchess of Lancaster. It is quite sufficient proof that Chaucer's position at court was of no mean consequence, to find that his wife, the sister of the future Duchess of Lancaster, was one of the royal maids of honor, and even, as Sir Harris Nicholas conjectures, a goddaughter of the queen, for her name was also Philippa. Between 1359, when the poet himself testifies that he was made prisoner while bearing arms in France, and September 1366, when Queen Philippa granted her former maid of honor, by the name of Philippa Chaucer, a yearly pension of ten marks, or six pounds thirteen shillings four pence, we have no authentic mention of Chaucer, express or indirect. It is plain from this grant that the poet's marriage with Sir Payne Roet's daughter was not celebrated later than 1366. The probability is that it closely followed the return from the wars. In 1367, Edward the Third settled upon Chaucer a life pension of twenty marks, for the good service which our beloved valet, Delectius Valetus Noster, Geoffrey Chaucer has rendered, and will render in time to come. Camden explains Valetus Hospitii to signify a gentleman of the privy chamber. Selden says that the designation was bestowed upon young heirs designed to be knighted, or young gentlemen of great descent and quality. Whatever the strict meaning of the word, it is plain that the poet's position was honorable and near to the king's person, and also that his worldly circumstances were easy, if not affluent, for it need not be said that twenty marks in those days represented twelve or twenty times the sum in these. It is believed that he found powerful patronage, not merely from the Duke of Lancaster and his wife, but from Margaret, Countess of Pembroke, the king's daughter. To her Chaucer is supposed to have addressed the goodly ballad in which the lady is celebrated under the image of the daisy. Her he is by some understood to have represented under the title of Queen Alcestis in the Court of Love, and the prologue to The Legend of Good Women, and in her praise we may read his charming descriptions and eulogies of the daisy, French Marguerite, the name of his royal patroness. To this period of Chaucer's career we may probably attribute the elegant and courtly, if somewhat conventional, poems of The Flower and the Leaf, The Cuckoo and the Nightingale, etc. The Lady Margaret, says Uri, would frequently compliment him on his poems, but this is not to be meant of his Canterbury Tales, they being written in the latter part of his life, when the courtier and the fine gentleman gave way to solid sense and plain descriptions. In his love-pieces he was obliged to have the strictest regard to modesty and decency, 
the ladies at that time insisting so much on the nicest punctilios of honor, that it was highly criminal to deprecate their sex, or do anything that might offend virtue. Chaucer, in their estimation, had sinned against the dignity and honor of womankind by his translation of the French Roman de la Rose and by his Troilus and Cressida, assuming it to have been among his less mature works, and to atone for those offenses the Lady Margaret, though other and older accounts say it was the first queen of Richard II, Anne of Bohemia, prescribed to him the task of writing the legend of good women. About this period, too, we may place the composition of Chaucer's ABC, or The Prayer of Our Lady, made at the request of the Duchess Blanche, a lady of great devoutness in her private life. She died in 1369, and Chaucer, as he had allegorized her wooing, celebrated her marriage, and aided her devotions, now lamented her death in a poem entitled The Book of the Duchess, or The Death of Blanche. In 1370 Chaucer was employed on the King's service abroad, and in November 1372, by the title of Suctifer Noster, our esquire or shield-bearer, he was associated with Jacobus Pronan and Johannes de Mari Sibis Janususis, in a royal commission bestowing full powers to treat with the Duke of Genoa, his council and state. The object of the embassy was to negotiate upon the choice of an English port at which the Genoese might form a commercial establishment, and Chaucer, having quitted England in December, visited Genoa and Florence, and returned to England before the end of November 1373, for on that day he drew his pension from the exchequer in person. The most interesting point connected with this Italian mission is the question whether Chaucer visited Petrarch at Padua. That he did is unhesitatingly affirmed by the old biographers, but the authentic notices of Chaucer during the years 1372 and 1373, as shown by the researches of Sir Harris Nicholas, are confined to the facts already stated and we are left to answer the question by the probabilities of the case, and by the aid of what faint light the poet himself affords. We can scarcely fancy that Chaucer, visiting Italy for the first time in a capacity which opened for him easy access to the great and famous, did not embrace the chance of meeting a poet whose works he evidently knew in their native tongue and highly esteemed. With Mr. Wright we are strongly disinclined to believe that Chaucer did not profit by the opportunity of improving his acquaintance with the poetry, if not the poets, of the country he thus visited, whose influence was now being felt on the literature of most countries of Western Europe. That Chaucer was familiar with the Italian language appears not merely from his repeated selection as envoy to Italian states, but by many passages in his poetry from Assembly of Fowls to the Canterbury Tales. In the opening of the first poem there is a striking parallel to Dante's inscription on the gate of hell. The first song of Trollius, in Trollius and Cressida, is a nearly literal translation of Petrarch's eighty-eighth sonnet. In the prologue to The Legend of Good Women, there is a reference to Dante which can hardly have reached the poet at second hand, and in Chaucer's great work, as in The Wife of Bath's Tale and The Monk's Tale, direct reference by name is made to Dante, the wise poet of Florence, the great poet of Italy, as the source whence the author has quoted. When we consider the poet's high place in literature, and at court, which could not fail to make him free of the hospitalities of the brilliant little Lombard states, his familiarity with the tongue and the works of Italy's greatest bards, dead and living, the reverential regard which he paid to the memory of great poets, of which we have examples in The House of Fame, and at the close of Trollius and Cressida, along with his own testimony in the prologue to The Clerk's Tale, we cannot fail to construe that testimony as a declaration that the tale was actually told to Chaucer by the lips of Petrarch in 1373, 
the very year in which Petrarch translated it into Latin from Boccaccio's Decameron. Mr. Bell notes the objection to this interpretation, that the words are put into the mouth not of the poet, but of the clerk, and meets it by the counter-objection that the clerk, being a purely imaginary personage, could not have learned the story at Padua from Petrarch, and therefore that Chaucer must have departed from the dramatic assumption maintained in the rest of the dialogue. Instances could be adduced from Chaucer's writings to show that such a sudden departure from the dramatic assumption would not be unexampled. Witness the aside in the Wife of Bath's prologue, where, after the jolly dame has asserted that, half so boldly, where can no man swear and lie as woman can, the poet hastens to interpose in his own person these two lines. I say not this by wives that be wise, but if it be when they them misadvise. And again in the prologue of The Legend of Good Women, from a description of the daisy, She is the clearness and the very light that in this dark world me guides and leads. The poet, in the very next line, slides into an address to his lady. The heart within my sorrowful heart you dreads and loves so sore that ye be verily the mistress of my wit, and nothing I. When, therefore, the clerk of Oxford is made to say that he will tell a tale, the which that I learned at Padua of a worthy clerk, as proved by his words and his work, he is now dead and nailed in his chest. I pray to God give his soul good rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, hight this clerk, whose rhetoric so sweet illumined all Italy of poetry, but forth to tellen of this worthy man that taught me this tale, as I began. We may without violent effort believe that Chaucer speaks in his own person, though dramatically the words are on the clerk's lips. And the belief is not impaired by the sorrowful way in which the clerk lingers on Petrarch's death, which would be less intelligible if the fictitious narrator had only read the story in the Latin translation than if we suppose the news of Petrarch's death at Arcua in July of 1374 to have closely followed Chaucer to England, and to have cruelly and irresistibly mingled itself with our poet's personal recollections of his great Italian contemporary. Nor must we regard as without significance the manner in which the clerk is made to distinguish between the body of Petrarch's tale and the fashion in which it was set forth in writing, with a poem that seemed a thing impertinent, save that the poet had chosen in that way to convey his matter, told or taught so much more directly and simply by word of mouth. It is impossible to pronounce positively on the subject. The question whether Chaucer saw Petrarch in 1373 must therefore remain a moot point, so long as we have only our present information, but fancy loves to dwell on the thought of the two poets conversing under the vines at Arcua, and we find in the history of the writings of Chaucer nothing to contradict, a good deal to countenance, the belief that such a meeting occurred. Though we have no express record, we have indirect testimony that Chaucer's Genoese mission was discharged satisfactorily, for on the 23rd of April, 1374, Edward the Third grants at Windsor to the poet, by the title of Our Beloved Squire, Dilecto Armigero Nostro, Unum Sicer, Vini, one pitcher of wine, daily, to be perceived in the port of London a grant which, on the analogy of more modern usage, might be held equivalent to Chaucer's appointment as Poet Laureate. When we find that soon afterwards the grant was commuted for a money payment of twenty marks per annum, we need not conclude that Chaucer's circumstances were poor, for it may be easily supposed that the daily perception of such an article of income was attended with considerable prosaic inconvenience. A permanent provision for Chaucer was made on the 8th of June, 1374, when he was appointed controller of the customs in the port of London, 
for the lucrative imports of wools, skins, or wool fells and tanned hides, on condition that he should fulfill the duties of that office in person, and not by deputy, and should write out the accounts with his own hand. We have what seems evidence of Chaucer's compliance with these terms in the House of Fame, where, in the mouth of the eagle, the poet describes himself, when he has finished his labor and made his reckonings, as not seeking rest and news in social intercourse, but going home to his own house, and there, all so dumb as any stone, sitting at another book, until his look is dazed, and again, in the record that in 1376 he received a grant of 731 pounds, four shillings, sixpence, the amount of a fine levied on one John Kent, whom Chaucer's vigilance had frustrated in the attempt to ship a quantity of wool for Dordrecht without paying the duty, the seemingly derogatory condition that the controller should write out the accounts or rolls, rotulus, of the office with his own hand, appears to have been designed or treated as merely formal. No records in Chaucer's handwriting are known to exist, which could hardly be the case if, for the twelve years of his controllership, 1374 through 1386, he had duly complied with the condition, and during that period he was more than once employed abroad, so that the condition was evidently regarded as a formality, even by those who had imposed it. Also, in 1374, the Duke of Lancaster, whose ambitious views may well have made him anxious to retain the adhesion of a man so capable and accomplished as Chaucer, changed into a joint life annuity remaining to the survivor, and charged on the revenues of the Savoy a pension of ten pounds, which two years before he settled on the poet's wife, whose sister was then the governess of the Duke's two daughters, Philippa and Elizabeth and the duke's own mistress. Another proof of Chaucer's personal reputation and high court favor at the time is his selection in 1375 as ward to the son of Sir Edmund Staplegate of Bilsington in Kent, a charge on the surrender of which the guardian received no less a sum than one hundred four pounds. We find Chaucer in 1376 again employed in a foreign mission. In 1377, the last year of Edward III, he was sent to Flanders with Sir Thomas Percy, afterwards Earl of Worcester, for the purpose of obtaining a prolongation of the truce, and in January 1378 he was associated with Sir Gouchard Dongle and his commissioners, to pursue certain negotiations for a marriage between Princess Mary of France and the young King Richard the Second, which had been set on foot before the death of Edward the Third. The negotiation, however, proved fruitless, and in May of 1378 Chaucer was selected to accompany Sir John Barclay on a mission to the court of Bernardo Visconti, Duke of Milan, with the view, it is supposed, of concerting military plans against the outbreak of war with France. The new king, meantime, had shown that he was not insensible to Chaucer's merit, or to the influence of his tutor and the poet's patron, the Duke of Lancaster, for Richard the Second confirmed to Chaucer his pension of twenty marks, along with an equal annual sum for which the daily pitcher of wine granted in 1374 had been commuted. Before his departure for Lombardy, Chaucer, still holding his post in the customs, selected two representatives or trustees to protect his estate against legal proceedings in his absence, or to sue in his name defaulters and offenders against the imports which he was charged to enforce. One of these trustees was called Richard Forrester, the other was John Gower, the poet, the most famous English contemporary of Chaucer, with whom he had for many years been on terms of admiring friendship, although from the strictures based on certain productions of Gower's in the prologue of The Man of Law's Tale, it has been supposed that in the later years of Chaucer's life the friendship suffered some diminution. To the moral Gower and the philosophical Strode, Chaucer directed or dedicated his Trollius and Cressida, while in the Confessio Amantis, 
Gower introduces a handsome compliment to his greater contemporary as the disciple of the poet of Venus, with whose glad songs and ditties made her praise during the flowers of his youth. The land was filled everywhere. Gower, however, a monk and a conservative, held to the party of the Duke of Gloucester, the rival of the Withcliffiate and innovating Duke of Lancaster, who was Chaucer's patron, and whose cause was not a little aided by Chaucer's strictures on the clergy. And thus it is not impossible that political differences may have weakened the old bonds of personal friendship and poetic esteem. Returning from Lombardy early in 1379, Chaucer seems to have been again sent abroad, for the records exhibit no trace of him between May and December of that year. Whether by proxy or in person, however, he received his pensions regularly until 1382, when his income was increased by his appointment to the post of Controller of Petty Customs in the Port of London. In November of 1384 he obtained a month's leave of absence on account of his private affairs, and a deputy was appointed to fill his place, and in February of the next year he was permitted to appoint a permanent deputy, thus at length gaining relief from that close attention to business which probably curtailed the poetic fruits of the poet's most powerful years. Chaucer is next found occupying a post which has not often been held by men gifted with his particular genius, that of a county member. The contest between the Dukes of Gloucester and Lancaster and their inheritance for the control of the government was coming to a crisis, and when the recluse and studious Chaucer was induced to offer himself to the electors of Kent as one of the knights of their share, where presumably he held property, we may suppose that it was with the view of supporting his patron's cause in the impending conflict. The Parliament, in which the poet sat, assembled at Westminster on the 1st of October, and was dissolved on the 1st of November, 1386. Lancaster was fighting and intriguing abroad, absorbed in the affairs of his Castilian succession. Gloucester and his friends, at home, had everything their own way. The Earl of Suffolk was dismissed from the Woolsack and impeached by the Commons, and although Richard at first stood out courageously for the friends of his uncle Lancaster, he was constrained by the refusal of supplies to consent to the proceedings of Gloucester. A commission was wrung from him under protest appointing Gloucester, Arundel, and twelve other peers and prelates a permanent council to inquire into the condition of all the public departments, the courts of law, and the royal household, with absolute powers of redress and dismissal. We need not ascribe to Chaucer's parliamentary exertions in his patron's behalf, nor to any malpractices of his official conduct, the fact that he was among the earliest victims of the commission. In December 1386 he was dismissed from both his offices in the port of London, but he retained his pensions, and drew them regularly, twice a year at the Exchequer, until 1388. In 1387 Chaucer's political reverses were aggravated by a severe domestic calamity. His wife died, and with her died the pension which had been settled on her by Queen Philippa in 1366, and confirmed to her at Richard's accession in 1377. The change made in Chaucer's pecuniary position by the loss of his offices and his wife's pension must have been very great. It would appear that during his prosperous times he had lived in a style quite equal to his income, and had no ample resources against a season of reverse, for on the 1st of May, 1388, less than a year and a half after being dismissed from customs, he was constrained to assign his pensions by surrender in chancery to one John Scalby. In May, 1389, Richard II, now of age, abruptly resumed the reins of government, which, for more than two years, had been ably but cruelly managed by Gloucester. The friends of Lancaster were once more supreme in the royal councils, and Chaucer speedily profited by the change. 
On the 12th of July he was appointed clerk of the King's Works at the Palace of Westminster, the Tower, the Royal Manors of Kennington, Eltham, Clarendon, Sheen, Byfleet, Children Langley, and Feckenham, the Castle at Berkhamstead, the Royal Lodge at Hathenburg in the New Forest, the lodges in the parks of Clarendon, Children Langley, and Feckingham, and the Mews for the King's Falcons at Charing Cross. He received a salary of two shillings per day, and was allowed to perform the duties by deputy. For some reason unknown, Chaucer held this lucrative office little more than two years, quitting it before the 16th of September, 1391, at which date it had passed into the hands of one John Gedney. The next two years and a half are blank, so far as authentic records are concerned. Chaucer is supposed to have passed them in retirement, probably devoting them principally to the composition of the Canterbury Tales. In February 1394 the king conferred upon him a grant of twenty pounds a year for life, but he seems to have had no other source of income, and to have become embarrassed by debt, for frequent memoranda of small advances on his pension show that his circumstances were, in comparison, greatly reduced. Things appear to have grown worse and worse for the poet, for in May 1398 he was compelled to obtain from the king letters of protection against arrest, extending over a term of two years. Not for the first time, it is true, for similar documents had been issued at the beginning of Richard's reign, but at that time Chaucer's missions abroad, and his responsible duties in the port of London, may have furnished reasons for securing him against annoyance or frivolous prosecution, which were wholly wanting at later date. In 1398 fortune began again to smile on him. He received a royal grant of a tun of wine annually, the value being about four pounds. Next year Richard the Second, having been deposed by the son of John of Gaunt, Henry of Bolingbroke, Duke of Lancaster, the new king, four days after his accession, bestowed on Chaucer a grant of forty marks, twenty-six pounds, thirteen shillings, fourpence, per annum, in addition to the pension of twenty pounds conferred by Richard the Second in 1394. But the poet, now seventy-one years of age, and probably broken down by the reverses of the past few years, was not destined long to enjoy his renewed prosperity. On Christmas Eve of 1399 he entered on the possession of a house in the garden of the Chapel of the Blessed Mary of Westminster, near to the present site of Henry the Seventh's chapel, having obtained a lease from Robert Hermedesworth, the monk of the adjacent convent, for fifty-three years at an annual rent of four marks, two pounds, thirteen shillings, fourpence. Until the first of March, 1400, Chaucer drew his pensions in person. Then they were received for him by another hand, and on the 25th of October in the same year he died at the age of seventy-two. The only lights thrown by his poems on the closing days are furnished in a little ballad called Good Counsel of Chaucer, which, though they were said to have been written when, upon his deathbed lying in his great anguish, breathes the very spirit of courage, resignation, and philosophic calm, and by the retractation at the end of the Canterbury Tales, which, if it was not foisted in by monkish transcribers, may be supposed the effect of Chaucer's regrets and self-reproaches on that solemn review of his life-work, which the close approach of death compelled. The poet was buried in Westminster Abbey, and not many years after his death the slab was placed on a pillar near his grave, bearing the lines taken from the epitaph or eulogy made by Stephanus Sigurius of Milan at the request of Caxton, Galfridus Chaucer, Vates, et fama poesis, materne hoc sucrosum, tumultuous umo. Around 1555, Mr. Nicholas Brigham, a gentleman of Oxford, who greatly admired the genius of Chaucer, erected the present tomb, as near to the spot where the poet lay before the chapel of St. Bennet, 
as was then possible by reason of the cancelli, which the Duke of Buckingham subsequently obtained leave to remove, that room might be made for the tomb of Dryden. On the structure of Mr. Brigham, besides a full-length representation of Chaucer, taken from a portrait drawn by his scholar, Thomas O'Clave, was, or is, though now almost illegible, the following inscription. M. S. Qui fuit anglorum vates ter maximus olum, Galfridus Chaucer, conditur hoc tumulo, anum si queres domini, si tempora vitae, ece note substunt, que tibi chunca notant. 25 Octobris, 1400. Er Nirmanum requis mors, en brigam ost fecit, musarem nomni sumptus. 1556. Concerning his personal appearance and habits, Chaucer has not been reticent in his poetry. Uri sums up the traits of his aspect and character fairly thus. He was of a middle stature, the latter part of his life inclinable to be fat and corpulent, as appears by the hosts bantering him in his journey to Canterbury, and comparing shapes with him. His face was fleshy, his features just and regular, his complexion fair and somewhat pale, his hair of a dusky yellow, short and thin, the hair of his beard in two forked tufts of a wheat color, his forehead broad and smooth, his eyes inclining usually to the ground, which is intimated by his host's words, his whole face full of liveliness, a calm, easy sweetness, and a studious, venerable aspect. As to his temper, he was a mixture of the gay, the modest, and the grave. The sprightliness of his humor was more distinguished by his writings than by his appearance, which gave occasion to Margaret, Countess of Pembroke, often to rally him upon his silent modesty in company, telling him that his absence was more agreeable to her than his conversation, since the first was productive of agreeable pieces of wit in his writings. But the latter was filled with a modest deference, and too distant respect. We see nothing merry or jocose in his behavior with his pilgrims, but a silent attention to their mirth rather than any mixture of his own. While disengaged from public affairs, his time was entirely spent in study and reading. So agreeable to him was this exercise that he says he preferred it to all other sports and diversions. He lived within himself, neither desirous to hear, nor busy to concern himself with the affairs of his neighbors. His course of living was temperate and regular. He went to rest with the sun, and rose before it, and by that means enjoyed all the pleasures of the better part of the day, his morning walk and fresh contemplations. This gave him the advantage of describing the morning in so lively a manner as he does everywhere in his works. The springing sun glows warm in his lines, and the fragrant air blows cool in his descriptions. We smell the sweets of the bloomy halls, and hear the music of the feathered choir, wherever we take a forest walk with him. The hour of the day is not easier to be discovered from the reflection of the sun in Titian's paintings than in Chaucer's morning landscapes. His reading was deep and extensive, his judgment sound and discerning. In one word, he was a great scholar, a pleasant wit, a candid critic, a sociable companion, a steadfast friend, a grave philosopher, a temperate economist, and a pious Christian. Chaucer's most important poems are Trollius and Cressida, The Romant of the Rose, and The Canterbury Tales. Of the first, containing 8,246 lines, an abridgment with a prose connecting outline of the story is given in this volume, with the second, consisting of 7,699 octosyllabic verses, like those in which the House of Fame is written, it is found impossible to deal with in the present edition. The poem is a curtailed translation from the French Roman de la Rose, commenced by Guillaume de Loris, 
who died in 1260 after contributing 4,070 verses, and completed in the last quarter of the 13th century by Jean de Meun, who added some 18,000 verses. It is a satirical allegory, in which the vices of courts, the corruptions of the clergy, the disorders and inequalities of society in general are unsparingly attacked, and the most revolutionary doctrines are advanced, and though, in making his translation, Chaucer softened or eliminated much of the satire in the poem, still it remained in his verse a caustic exposure of the abuses of the time, especially those which discredited the church. The Canterbury Tales are presented in this edition with as near an approach to completeness in regard for the popular character of the volume permitted. The 17,385 verses of which the poetical tales consist have been given without abridgment or purgation, save in a single couplet, but the main purpose of the volume being to make the general reader acquainted with the poems of Chaucer and Spencer, the editor has ventured to contract the two prose tales, Chaucer's Tale of Melobius and the Parson's Sermon, or Treatise on Penitence, so as to save about thirty pages for the introduction of Chaucer's minor pieces. At the same time, by giving prose outlines of those omitted parts, it has been sought to guard the reader against the fear that he was losing anything essential or even valuable. It is almost needless to describe the plot, or point out the literary place of the Canterbury Tales. Perhaps in the entire range of ancient and modern literature there is no work that so clearly and freshly paints for future times the picture of the past. Certainly no Englishman has ever approached Chaucer in the power of fixing forever the fleeting traits of his own time. The plan of the poem had been adopted before Chaucer chose it, notably in the Decameron of Boccaccio, although there the circumstances under which the tales were told, with the terror of the plague hanging over the merry company, lent a grim grotesqueness to the narrative, unless we can look at it abstracted from its setting. Chaucer, on the other hand, strikes a perpetual keynote of gaiety whenever he mentions the word pilgrimage, and at every stage of the connecting story we bless the happy thought which gives us the incessant incident, movement, variety, and unclouded but never monotonous joyousness. The poet, the evening before he starts on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Thomas at Canterbury, lies at the Tabard Inn in Southwark curious to know in what companionship he is destined to fare forward on the morrow. Chance sends him nine and twenty in a company, representing all orders of English society, lay and clerical, from the knight and the abbot down to the ploughman and the sompador. The jolly host of the Tabard, after supper, when tongues are loosed and hearts are opened, declares that not this year he has seen with such company at once under its roof-tree, and proposes that, when they set out the next morning, he should ride with them and make them sport. All agree, and Harry Bailey unfolds his scheme. Each pilgrim, according to the poet, shall tell two tales on the road to Canterbury, and two on the way back to London, and he whom the general voice pronounces to have told the best tale shall be treated to supper at the common cost, and, of course, to mine host's profit, when the cavalcade returns from the saint's shrine to the Southwark hostelry. All joyously assent, and early on the morrow, in the gay spring sunshine, they ride forth, listening to the heroic tale of the brave and gentle knight who has been gracefully chosen by the host to lead the spirited competition of the storytelling. To describe thus the nature of the plan, and to say that when Chaucer conceived, or at least began to execute it, he was between sixty and seventy years of age, is to proclaim that the Canterbury Tales could never be more than a fragment. Thirty pilgrims, each telling two tales on the way out and two more on the way back, 
that makes one hundred twenty tales, to say nothing of the prologue, the description of the journey, the occurrences at Canterbury, and all the remnant of their pilgrimage, which Chaucer also undertook. No more than twenty-three of the one hundred twenty stories are told in the work as it comes down to us. That is, only twenty-three of the thirty pilgrims tell the first of the two stories on the road to Canterbury, while of the stories on the return journey we have not one, and nothing is said about the doings of the pilgrims at Canterbury, which would, if treated like the scene at the Tabard, have given us a still livelier picture of the period. But the plan was too large, and although the poet had some reserves in stories which he had already composed in an independent form, death cut short his labor ere he could even complete the arrangement and connection of more than a very few of the tales. Incomplete as it is, however, the magnum opus of Chaucer was in its own time received with immense favor. Manuscript copies are numerous, even now, no slight proof of its popularity, and when the invention of printing was introduced into England by William Caxton, the Canterbury Tales issued from his press in the year after the first English printed book, The Game of Cheese, had been struck off. Innumerable editions have since been published, and it may fairly be affirmed that few books have been so much in favor with the reading public of every generation as this book, which the lapse of every generation has been rendering more unreadable. Apart from the Romant of the Rose, no really important poetical work of Chaucer's is omitted from or unrepresented in the present edition. Of the legend of good women, the prologue only is given, but it is the most genuinely Chaucerian part of the poem. Of the court of love, three-fourths are here presented. Of the assembly of fowls, the cuckoo and the nightingale, the flower and the leaf, all of Chaucer's dream, one-fourth of the house of fame, two-thirds, and of the minor poems such a selection as may give an idea of Chaucer's power in the occasional department of verse. Necessarily, no space whatever could be given to Chaucer's prose works, his translation of Berthius's treatise on the consolation of philosophy, his treatise on the astrolabe, written for the use of his son Lewis, and his testament of love composed in his later years, and reflecting the troubles that then beset the poet. If, after studying in a simplified form the salient works of England's first great bard, the reader is tempted to regret that he was not introduced to a wider acquaintance with the author, the purpose of the editor will have been more than attained. The plan of the volume does not demand an elaborate examination into the state of our language when Chaucer wrote, or the nice questions of grammatical and metrical structure which conspire with the obsolete orthography to make his poems a sealed book for the masses. The most important element in the proper reading of Chaucer's verses, whether written in the decasyllabic or heroic meter, which he introduced to our literature, or in the octosyllabic measure, used with such animated effect in The House of Fame, Chaucer's Dream, etc., is the sounding of the terminal E, where it is now silent. The letter is still valid in French poetry, and Chaucer's lines can be scanned only by reading them as we would read Racine's or Moliere's. The terminal E played an important part in grammar. In many cases it was a sign of the infinitive, the N being dropped from the end. At other times it pointed the distinction between singular and plural, between adjective and adverb. The pages that follow, however, being prepared from the modern English point of view, necessarily no account is taken of these distinctions, and the now silent E has been retained in the text of Chaucer only when required by the modern spelling or the exigencies of meter. Before a word beginning with a vowel, or with the letter H, the final E was almost without exception mute. And in such cases, in the plural forms and infinitives of verbs, the terminal N was generally retained for the sake of euphony. 
no reader who is acquainted with the French language will find it hard to fall into Chaucer's accentuation, while, for such as are not, a simple perusal of the text according to the rules of modern verse should remove every difficulty. So ends The Life of Geoffrey Chaucer from the Canterbury Tales and Other Poems of Geoffrey Chaucer Edited by D. Lang Purpose This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Hoover the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer Edited by D. Lang Purvis This recording is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales The Prologue when that aprilis with his shower's swoot, the drought of March hath pierced to the root, and bathed every vein in such lacour, of which virtue engendered is the flower, when Zephyrus eke with his swoot a breath, inspired hath in every holt and heath, the tender crops in the youngest son hath in the rim his half coursey run, and small fowls make melody, that sleep in all the night with open eye, so pricketh them nature in their courages, then long a folk to go on pilgrimages and palmers for to seek strange strands, to fern hollows couth in sundry lands. And specially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury they wend, the holy blissful martyr for to seek, that them hath holpen when that they were sick. Befell that in that season on a day, in Southwark at the tabard as I lay, ready to wend in on my pilgrimage to Canterbury with devout courage, at night was come into that hostelry well nine and twenty in a company of sundry folk by adventure ye fall in fellowship and pilgrims were they all that toward canterbury would ride the chamber and the stables were wide and well we were in eased at the best and shortly when the sun was to rest so had i spoken with them every one that i was of their fellowship anon and made forward early for to rise to take our way there as i you devise but natheless, while I have time and space, ere that I farther in this tale pace, methinketh it accordant to reason to tell you all of the condition of each of them, so as it seemed to me, and which they were in, and of what degree, and eke in what array that they were in, and at a night then will I first begin. A night there was, and that a worthy man, that from the time that he first began to ridden out, he loved chivalry, truth and honour, freedom and courtesy. Full worthy was he in his lord's war, and thereto had he ridden, no man far as well in Christendom as in heathenness, and ever honoured for his worthiness at Alessander he was, when it was won. Full often time he had the board begun above all nations in Prussia. In Letua had he raised, and in Russia no Christian man so oft of his degree. In Grenade at the siege eke had he be of Algeser, and ridden in Belmarie. At Lays was he, and at Saddley when they were won, and in the great sea at many a noble army had he be. At mortal battles had he been fifteen, and foughten for our faith at Tremacene, and lists thrice, and I slain his foe. This ilka worthy knight had been also some time with the lord of Palati against another heathen in Turkey, and evermore he had a sovereign price. And though he was worthy, he was wise, and of his port as meek as is a maid. He never yet no villainy nay said in all his life, unto no man or wight. He was a very perfect gentle knight. But for to tell you of his array, his horse was good, but yet he was not gay. A fustian he weared a jippon, all besmottered with his haberdin, for he was late to come from his voyage, and went to for to do his pilgrimage. With him there was his son, a young squire, a lover and a lusty bachelor, with locks crow as they were laid in press. Of twenty years of age he was, I guess. Of his stature he was of even length, and wonderly deliver, and great of strength. And he had been some time in Chevetie, 
in Flanders, in Artois, in Picardy, and borne him well, as of so little space, and hoped to stand in his lady's grace. Embroidered was he, as it were met, all full of fresh flowers, white and red. Singing he was, or fluting all the day, he was as fresh as is the month of May. Short was his gown, with sleeves long and wide. Well could he sit on horse, and fare a ride. He could a songs make, and well indite, joust and eke dance, as well portray and write. So hot he loved, that by night or tale he slept no more than doth the nightingale. Courteous he was, lowly and serviceable, and carved before his father at the table. A yeoman had he, and servants no mo at that time, for him lestride so, and he was clad in coat and hood of green. A sheaf of peacock arrows bright and keen under his belt he bare full thriftily. Well could he dress his tackle yeomanly, his arrows droop not with feathers low, and in his hands he bare a mighty bow. A nuthead had he with a brown visage, of woodcraft could he well all the usage. Upon his arms he bare a gay bracer, and by his side a sword and a buckler, and on that other's side a gay dagger, harnessed well, and sharp as point of spear. Christopher on his breast of silver sheen, and horn he bare, the baldric was of green. A forester was he, soothly, as I guess. There was also a nun, a prioress, that of her smiling was full simple and coy. Her greatest oath was but by St. Loy, and she was clepid Madam Eglantine. Full well she sang the service divine, and tuned in her nose full seemly. In French she spake full fair and fettisly after the school of Stratford at a bow, for French of Paris was to her unknow. At Meta was she well you taught withal, she let no morsel from her lippis fall, nor wet her fingers in her sauce deep. Well could she carry a morsel, and well keep that no drop a nay fell upon her breast, and courtesy was set full much her lest. Her over lip a white she so clean, that in her cup there was no farthing seen of grease, when she drunken had her draught. Full seemly after her meat she wrought, and sickerly she was of great disport, and full pleasant, and amiable of port, and pained her to counterfeit a cheer of court, and be a stately of manner, and to behold in dignity of reverence. But for to speaken of her conscience, she was so charitable and so piteous, she would a-weep if that she saw a mouse caught in a trap, if it were dead or bled. Of small a hounds had she, that she fed with roasted flesh and milk and wastel bread, but sore she wept if one of them were dead, or if men smote it with a yard a smart. And all was conscience and tender heart. Full seemly her wimple ye pinched was, her nose tretis, her eye in grey as glass, her mouth full small, and there too soft and red, but sickerly she had a fair forehead. It was almost a span a brow, I trow, for hardly she was not undergrow. Full fetus was her cloak, as I was wear, of small coral about her arm she bare a pair of beads, gauded all with green, and thereon hung a brooch of gold full sheen, on which first you written, in crown day, and after, Amor Vincent Omnia. Another nun also with her had she, that was her chapeline, and priestess three. A monk there was, a fair for the mastery, an outrider that loved venery, a manly man, to be an abbot able, for many a dainty horse had he in stable, and when he rode, men might his bridle hear jingling in a whistling wind as clear and eke as loud as doth the chapel bell, there as his lord was keeper of the cell. The rule of St. Mary and of St. Benet, because that was old and some deal straight, this ilk a monk let old a thing's pace, and held after the newer world the trace. He was not of the text a pulled hen that saith that hunters be not holy men. Nay, that a monk, when he is cloisterless, is like to a fish that is waterless. This is to say, a monk out of his cloister, the silk a text held he not worth an oyster. And I say his opinion was good. Why should he study and make himself wood upon a book and cloister always poor? Or swink in with his hands, and labor as Austin bid? How shall the world be served? Let Austin have his swink to him reserved. Therefore he was a pricasaur all right. Greyhounds he had as swift as fowl of flight. Of prickering and of hunting for the hare was all his lust, 
for no cost would he spare. I saw his sleeves are filled at the hand with gris, and that the finest of the land. And for to fasten his hood under his chin, he had of gold you wrought a curious pin, a love knot in the greater end there was. His head was bald, and shone as any glass, and eke his face, as it had been anoint. He was a lord full fat and in good point, his eye in steep and rolling in his head, that steamed as a furnace of a lead. His boots supple, his horse in great estate, now certainly he was a fair prelate. He was not pale as a four-pined ghost, a fat swan loved he best of any roast. His palfrey was as brown as is a berry. A friar there was, a wanton and a merry, a limitor, a full solemn man, and all the orders four is none that can so much of dalliance in fair language. He had ye made full many a marriage of young a woman at his own cost. Unto his order he was a noble post full well beloved and familiar was he with franklins over all in his country and eke with worthy women of the town for he had power of confession as said himself more than a curate for of his order he was licentiate full sweetly heard he confession and pleasant was his absolution he was an easy man to give penance there as he wist to have a good pittance for unto a poor order for to give is sign that a man is well ye shrive for if he gave, he durst make a vaunt, he wist that the man was repentant. For many a man so hard is of his heart, he may not weep, although him sore smart. Therefore, instead of weeping and prayers, men must give silver to the poor frères. His tippet was I farced full of knives and pins for to give to fair wives, and certainly he had a merry note. Well could he sing and play and on a rote. Of yettings he bare utterly the prize. His neck was white as is the fleur de lis, thereto he strong was as a champion. He knew well the taverns in every town, and every hostler and gay tapster better than a lazer or a beggar. For unto such a worthy man as he accordeth not, as by his faculty, to have with such lazers acquaintance. It is not honest, it may not advance, as for to deal with no such poor ale but all with rich and sellers of the tale. And over all there is profit should arise. Courteous he was, and lowly of service, and as no man nowhere so virtuous. He was the best beggar in all his house, and gave a certain frame for the grant. None of his brethren came into his haunt. For though a widow had a but one shoe, so pleasant was his in principio, yet he would have a farthing ere he went. His purchase was well better than his rent. And rage he could and play as any whelp in love days. There could he much will help. For there was he not like a cloisterer, with threadbare scope as is a poor scholar. But he was like a master or a pope. Of double worsted was his semicope, that rounded him as a bell out of press. Somewhat he lisped for his wantonness, to make his English sweet upon his tongue, and in his harping when that he had sung, his eye and twinkled in his head aright, as do the stars in a frosty night. This worthy limitor was called Hubert. A merchant was there with a forked beard, and motley, and high on his horse he sat, upon his head a flandrish beaver hat. His boots clasped fair and fetisly, his reasons eye spake he full solemnly, sounding alway the increase of his winning. He would the sea were kept for anything betwixt a Middleburg and Orwell, well could he in exchange shields sell, this worthy man full well his wit beset. There wist no wight that he was in debt, so estately was he of governance with his bargains and with his chevesence. For sooth he was a worthy man withal, but sooth to say I not how men him call. A clerk there was of Oxenford also, that unto logic had a long ago. As Lena was his horse as is a rake, and he was not right fat, I undertake but looked hollow, and there too soberly. Full threadbare was his overus courtpy, for he had not gotten him yet no benefice, nay was not worldly to have an office. For him was lever have at his bed's head twenty books, clothed in black or red, of Aristotle and his philosophy, than robes rich or fiddle or psaltery. But all be that he was a philosopher, yet had a he but little gold in coffer, but all that he might of his friends hent, on books and on learning he it spent, and busily gan for the soul's prey of them that gave him wherewith to scholay, 
of study took he most care and heed. Not one word spake he more than was need, and that was said in form and reverence, and short and quick, and full of high sentence. Sounding in moral virtue was his speech, and gladly would he learn, and gladly teach. A sergeant of the law, wary and wise, that often had ye been at the parvis, there was also full rich of excellence. Discreet he was, and of great reverence. He seemed such, his words were so wise, justice he was full often in a size, by patent and by plain commission. For his science and for his high renown, of fees and robes had he many one, so great a purchaser was nowhere none. All was fee simple to him. In effect, his purchasing might not be in suspect. Nowhere so busy a man as he there was. And yet he seemed busier than he was. In terms had he case and doom as all that from the time of King Will were fall. Thereto he could indict, and make a thing there could a no white pinch at his writing. In every statute could he plain by rote. He rode but homely in a medley coat, girt with a scent of silk, with bare as small, of his array tell I no longer tala. A Franklin was in this company, white was his beard as is the daisy, of his complexion he was sanguine, well loved he in the morn a sop in wine, to live in and delight was ever his one, for he was Epicurus Owen's son, that held opinion in plain delight was verily felicity per fight, an householder, and that a great was he, St. Julian, he was in his country. His bread, his ale, was always after one. A better and vine man was nowhere none. Without bake meat never was his house. Of fish and flesh, and that so plenteous. It snowed in his house of meat and drink, Of all the dainties that men could think. After the sundry seasons of the year, So changed he his meat and his super. Many full of fat partridge had he and mew, and many a bream, and many a loosened stew. Woe was his cook, but if his sauce were poignant and sharp, and ready all his gear. His table dormant in his hall always stood ready covered all the long a day. At sessions there was he lord and sire. Full often time he was knight of the shire. An anlace and a gipsier, all of silk, hung at his girdle, white as morning milk. A sheriff had he been, and the contour was nowhere such a worthy vavasor. An haberdasher, and a carpenter, a webba, a dyer, and a tapasser, were with a seek, clothed in one livery, of a solemn and great fraternity. Full fresh and new their gear ye picked was, their knives were ye chipped not with brass, but all with silver wrought full clean and well, their girdles and their pouches every deal. Well seemed each of them a fair burgess, to sitten in a guild hall on the dais. Ever reach for the wisdom that he can, was shapely for to be an alderman. For chattels had a they enough, and rent, and eke their wives would it well assent, and ellis certain that they had been to blame. It is full fair to be a clept madame, and for to go to vigils all before, and have a mantle royally bore. A cook they had a with them for the knowns, to boil the chickens and the marrow bones, and powder merchant tart and gallingal, well could he know a drought of London ale. He could roast and stew and broil and fry, make more truce and well bake a pie. But great harm was it, as it thought to me, that on his shin a mormal had a he. For Blanc Manger, that made he with the best. A shipman was there, one far by west, for aught I wot be was of Dartmouth. He rode upon a rouncy as he couth, all in a gown of falding to the knee. A dagger hanging by a lace had he about his neck under his arm adown. The hot summer had made his hue all brown. And certainly he was a good fellow. Full many a draught of wine had he a draw. From Bordeaux ward, while the chapmen sleep, a nice conscience took he no keep. If that he fought, and had the higher hand, by water he sent them home to every land. But of his craft to reckon well his tides, his steam is, and his strand is him besides. His herberal, his moon, and laud mainage, there was none such from hull unto Carthage. Hardly he was, and wise, I undertake, with many a tempest had his beard been shake. He knew well all the havens as they were, from Scotland to the Cape of Finister, in every creek in Britain and in Spain, his barge eclipsed was the Magdalene. 
with us there was a doctor of physic in all of this world was there none him like to speak of physic and of surgery for he was grounded in astronomy he kept his patient a full great deal in hours by his magic natural well could he fortune the ascendant of his images for his patient he knew the cause of every malady were it of cold or hot or moist or dry and where engendered and of what humour he was a very perfect practiser the cause you know and of his harm the root and on he gave the sick man his boot full ready had he his apothecaries to send his drugs and his lecturies for each of them made other for to win their friendship was not new to begin well knew he the old escalopus and dioscorides and eke rufus old hippocras holly and gallion serapion rassus and avicen averroes damascene and constantine bernard and gattiston and gilberton of his diet measurable was he for it was of no superfluity but of great nourishing and digestible his study was but little on the bible in sanguine and in purse he glad was all lined with taffeta and with sendal and yet he was but easy of dispense he kept that he won in the pestilence for gold in physic is a cordial therefore he loved gold in special a good wife was there of beside bath but she was some deal deaf and that was scath of cloth making she had in such an haunt she passed them of ypres and of gaunt and all the parish wife was there none that to the offering before her should gone and if there did certain so wroth was she that she was out of all a charity her cover chiefs were full fine of ground they durst to swear they weighed a ten pound that on sunday were upon her head her hosen were of fine scarlet red full straight ye tied and shoes full moist and new bold was her face and fair and red of hue she was a worthy woman all her life husbands at the church door had she had five without an other company in youth but thereof needeth not to speak as nooth and thrice had she been at jerusalem she had a past many a strange stream at rome she had been and at boulogne in gallus and st james and at cologne she could a much of wandering by the way gat toothed was she soothly for to say upon an ambler easily she sat he wimpled well and on her head and hat as broad as is a buckler or a targe a foot mantle about her hips large and on her feet a pair of spurs sharp in fellowship well could she laugh and carp of remedies of love she knew perchance for of that art she could the older dance a good man there was of religion that was a poor parson of a town but rich he was of holy thought and work and he was also a learned man a clerk that christ's gospel truly would he preach his parishions devoutly would he teach benign he was and wonder diligent and in adversity full patient and such he was he proved often scythes full loth were him to curse for his tithes but rather would he given out of doubt unto his poor parishions about of his offering and eke of his substance he would in little thing have sufficience wider was his parish and houses far asunder but he nay left naught for no rain nor thunder in sickness and in mischief to visit the farthest in his parish much and lit upon his feet and in his hands a staff this noble example to his sheep he gaff that first he wrought and afterward he taught out of the gospel he the word is caught in this figure he added yet thereto that if gold rust what should iron do for if a priest be foul on whom we trust no wonder is a lewd man to rust and shame it is if that a priest take keep to see a shitten shepherd and clean sheep well ought a priest and sample for to give by his own cleanness how his sheep should live he set a not his benefice to hire and left his sheep encumbered in the mire and ran unto london unto st paul's to seek him a shantery for souls or with a brotherhood to be withhold but dwelt at home and kept a well his fold so that the wolf nay made it not miscarry he was a shepherd and no mercenary and though he holy were and virtuous he was to sinful men not dispiteous nor of his speech a dangerous nor dine but in his teaching discreet and benign to draw folk to heaven with fairness by good ensample was his business but it were any person obstinate whatso he were of high or low estate him would he snibba sharply for the knowns 
a better priest i trow that nowhere none is he waited after no pomp nor reverence nor maked him a spiced conscience but christ is lord and his apostles twelve he taught and first he followed it himself with him there was a ploughman was his brother but had he laid of dung full many a father a true swinker and a good was he living in peace and perfect charity god loved he best with all his heart at all the times were it gain or smart and then his neighbour right as himself he would a thresh and there to dyke and delve for christ's sake for every poor wight without an hire if it lay in his might his tithes paid he full fair and well both of his proper swink and his chattel in a tabard he rode upon a mare there was also a reeve and a millera a sompner and a pardoner also a mancipal and myself there were no mo the miller was a stout carl for the knowns full big he was of brawn and eke of bones that proved well for over all where he came at wrestling he would bear away the rein he was short-shouldered broad a thick a gar there was no door that he hold heave off bar or break it out of running with his head his beard as any so or fox was red and there too broad as though it were a spade upon the cop right of his nose he had a wart and thereon stood a tuft of hairs red as the bristles of a sow's ear his nose thurls black were and wide a sword and buckler bare he by his side his mouth as wide as was a furnace he was a jangler and a golardice and that was most sin and harlotrize well could he steal a corn and toll a thrice and yet he had a thumb of gold pardy a white coat and a blue hood weared he a bagpipe well could he blow and sound and therewithal he brought us out of town a gentle mancipal was there of a temple of which akators might a take and sample for to be wise and buying of vitale for whether that he paid or took by tale algate he waited so in his acate that he was aye before in good estate now is not that of god a full fair grace that such a lewd man as which shall pace the wisdom of and heap of learned men of masters had he more than thrice ten that were of law expert and curious of which there was a dozen in that house worthy to be stewards of rent and land of any lord that is in england to make him live by his proper good in honour debtless but if he were would or live as scarcely as him list desire and able for to help in all a shire in any case that might a fall or hap and yet this mansipal set their all her cap the reeve was a slender choleric man his beard was shaved as high as ever he can his hair was by his ears round you shorn his top was docked like a priest before and full long over his legs and full lean e like a staff there was no calf you seen well could he keep a garner and a bin there was no auditor could on him win well wist he by the draught and by the rain the yielding of his seed and of his grain his lord's sheep his neat and his dairy his swine his horse his store and his poultry were wholly in this reeve's governing and by his covenant gave he reckoning since that his lord was twenty year of age there could no man bring him in a rearage there was no bailiff herd nor other hind that he ne knew his slight and his cavine they were a drad of him as of the death his wonning was full fair upon and heath with green trees as shadowed was his place he could a better than his lord purchase full rich he was he stored privily his lord well could he please subtly to give and lend him of his own good and have a thank and yet a coat and hood in youth he learned had a good mister he was well good right a carpenter the reeve sat upon a right good stot that was all palmly grey and height a scot a long surcoat of purse upon he had and by his side he bare a rusty blade of norfolk was this reeve of which i tell beside a town man clepin baldswell tucked he was as is a friar about and never rode the hinderest of the rout a sompner was there with us in that place that had a fire-red cherubin's face for sauce flame he was with eye and narrow as hot he was and lecherous as a sparrow with scallop brows black and pilled beard of his visage children were sore afeard and as quicksilver litharge nor brimstone bore a cerus nor oil of tartar none nor ointment that would cleanse or bite that him might help him of his welkis white nor of the knobs sitting on his cheeks well loved he garlic onions and leeks and for to drink strong wine as red as blood 
then would he speak and cries he were wood and when he well drunken had the wine then would he speak no word but latin a few terms knew he two or three that he had learned out of some decree no wonder is he heard it all the day and eke ye know and well how that a jay can clap and wat as well as can the pope but whoso would another thing him grope that he had spent all his philosophy i quistio quidjuris would he cry he was a gentle harlot and a kind a better fellow should a man not find he would a suffer for a quart of wine a good fellow to have his concubine a twelvemonth and excuse him at the full full privily a finch eke could he pull and if he found o where a good fellow he would teach him to have none awe in such a case is the archdeacon's curse but if a man's soul were in his purse for in his purse he should ye punished be purse is the archdeacon's hell said he but well i wot he lied right indeed of cursing not each guilty man to dread for curse will slay right as a sailing sabbath and also wear him of significat in danger had he at his own guise the younger girl was of the diocese and knew their counsel and was of their reed the garland had he set upon his head as great as if it were for an ale stake a buckler had he made him of a cake with him there rode a gentle pardoner of Ronceville, his friend and his compare that straight was coming from the court of rome full loud he sang come hither love to me the sompner bare to him a stiff burden was never trump of half so great a sound this pardoner had hair as yellow as wax but smooth it hung as doth a strike of flax by ounces hung his locks that he had and therewith he his shoulders overspread full thin it lay by culpins one and one but hood for jollity he weared none for it was trussed up in his wallet him thought he rode all of the new agate dishevel save his cap he rode all bare such glaring iron had he as in hair a vernicle had he sewed upon his cap his wallet lay before him in his lap fretful of pardon come from rome all hot a voice he had as small as hath a goat no beard had he nor ever one should have as smooth it was as it were new ye shave i trow he were a gelding or a mare but of his craft from berwick unto ware nay was there such another pardoner for in his mail he had a pillow bare which as he said was our lady's veil he said he had a goblet of the sail that saint peter had when that he went upon the sea till jesus christ him hent he had a cross of latin fowl of stones and in a glass he had pig's bones but with these relics when that he fawned a poor parson dwelling upon land upon a day he got him more money than the parson got in moneth's tway and thus with feigned flatterings and japes he made the parson and the people his apes but truly to tell in at the last he was in church a noble ecclesiast well could he read a lesson or a story but alderbast he sang an offertory for well he wista when that song was sung he must a preach and well afile his tongue to win silver as he right well could therefore he sang full merrily and loud now have i told you shortly in a clause the estate the array the number and eke the cause why that assembled was this company in southwark at this gentle hostelry that heighta the tabard fast by the bell but now is time for you to tell how that we bear in us that ilken night when we were in that hostelry aright and after will i tell of our voyage and all the remnant of our pilgrimage but first i pray you of your courtesy that ye are at it not my villainy though that i plainly speak in this matter to tell in you their words and their cheer not though i speak their words properly for this ye know and all so well as i whoso shall tell a tale after a man he must rehearse as nigh as ever he can every word if it be in his charge i'll speak he ne'er so rudely and so large or else he must tell his tale untrue or feign things or find a words new he may not spare although he were his brother he must as well say one word as another christ spake himself full broad and holy writ and well ye wot no villainy is it eke plato saith whoso that can him read the words must be cousin to the deed also i pray you to forgive it me as have i not set folk in their degree here in this tale is that they shouldn't stand my wit is short ye may well understand great cheer made our host us every one and to the supper set he us anon and served us with victual of the best 
strong was the wine, and well to drink us lest. A seemly man our host was withal, for to have been a marshal in an hall. A large man he was with iron steep, a fairer burgess is there none and cheap. Bold of his speech, and wise, and well he taught, and of manhood a lacked him right naught. Eke thereto he was right a merry man, and after supper playin' he began, and spake of mirth amongst other things, when that we had a made our reckonings, and said of us, Now, lordings, truly ye be to me welcome right heartily, for by my troth, if that I shall not lie, I saw not this year such a company at once in this herbero, the Mizinel. Fain would I do you mirth, and I wist how. And of a mirth I am right now bethought, to do you ease, and it shall cost naught. Ye go to Canterbury, God you speed, the blissful martyr quite you your mead. And well I wot, as ye go by the way, ye shapen you to talkin' and to play, for truly comfort nor mirth is none to ride by the way as dumb as stone. And therefore would I make you disport, as I said erst, and do you some comfort. And if you liketh all by one assent, now for to stand in at my judgment, and for to work in as I shall you say to-morrow, when ye ride in on the way, now by my father's soul that is dead, but ye be merry, smiteth off mine head. Hold up your hands without more speech. Our counsel was not long afore to seech. Us thought it was not worth to make it wise, and granted him without more of eyes, and bade him say his verdict as him lest. Lordings, quoth he, now hearken for the best, but take it not, I pray you, in disdain. This is the point, to speak it plat and plain, that each of you, to shorten with your way in this voyage, shall tell in tales tway, to canterbury word, I mean it so, and homeward he shall tell in other two, of adventures that Willem have befall, and which you that beareth him best of all, that is to say, that telleth in this case tales of best sentence and most solace, shall have a supper at your aller cost, here in this place, sitting by this post, when that ye come again from Canterbury. And for to make you the more merry, I will myself gladly with you ride, right at mine own cost, and be your guide. And whoso will my judgment with say, shall pay for all we spend in by the way. And if ye vouchsafe that it be so, tell me anon without words mo, and I will early shape me therefore. This thing was granted, and our oath we swore with full glad heart, and prayed him also that he would vouchsafe for to do so, and that he would be our governor, and of our tales judge and repertoire, and set a supper at a certain price, and we will rule to be at his device, in high and low, and thus by one assent we be accorded to his judgment, and thereupon the wine was fetten on, we drunken, and to rest went each one without any longer tarrying. A morrow, when the day began to spring, up rose our host, and was our allercock, and gathered us together in a flock, and forth we ridden all a little space unto the watering of St. Thomas. And there our host began his horse arrest, and said, Lords, hearken if you lest, to wheat your foreword, and I at record, if even song and morning song accord, let's see now who shall tell of the first tale. As ever may I drink a wine or ale, whoso is rebel to my judgment, shall pay for all that by the way is spent. Now draw ye cuts, ere that ye farther twin, he which that hath the shortest shall begin. Sir Knight, quoth he, my master and my lord, now draw the cut, for that is mine accord. Come near, quoth he, my lady prioress, and ye, sir clerk, let be your shamefastness, nor study not, lay hand to every man. And on to draw, and every white began, and shortly for to tell as it was, were it by a venture, or sort, or cost, the sooth is this, the cut fell to the knight, of which full blithe and glad was every wight, and tell he must his tale as was reason, by foreword and by composition, as ye have heard. What needeth words mo? And when this good man saw that it was so, as he that wise was and obedient to keep his foreword by his free assent, he said, Sithen, I shall begin this game. Why welcome be the cut in God as name? Now let us ride, and hearken what I say. And with that word we ridden forth our way, and he began with right to merry cheer his tale anon, and said, as you shall hear. End of the General Prologue This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during June 2006. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Knight's Tale Willem, as older stories tellen us, there was a duke that hight Theseus. Of Athens he was lord and governor, and in his time such a conqueror that greater was there none under the sun. Full many a rich country had he won. What with his wisdom and his chivalry, he conquered all the reign of Femini. That Willem was eclept Scythia, and wedded the queen Hippolyta, and brought her home with him to his country, with much glory and great solemnity, and eke her younger sister Emily, and thus with victory and with melody let I this worthy duke to Athens ride, and all his host in arms him beside. And, certes, if it ne'er too long to hear, I would have told you fully the manner how one in was the reign of Femini, by Theseus and by his chivalry, and of the great battle for the nonce betwixt Athenis and the Amazons, and how assieged was Hippolyta, uh, the fair hardy queen of Scythia, and of the feast that was at her wedding, and of the tempest at her homecoming, but all these things I must as now forbear. I have got what a f large field to air. And weak be the oxen in my plough, the remnant of my tale is long enow. I will not let an eke none of this rout. Let every fellow tell his tale about. And let's see now who shall the supper win. There, as I left, I will again begin. This duke, of whom I make mention, when he was come almost unto the town, in all his weal and in his most a pride, he was ware, and he cast his eye aside, where that there kneeled in the high way a company of ladies tway and tway, each after other, clad in clothes black, but such a cry and such a woe they make that in this world this creature living that heard of such another way menting and of this crying would they never stenten till they the rainness of his bridal henten what folk be ye that at mine home coming perturbin so my feast with crying quoth theseus have ye so great envy of mine honour, and that thus complain and cry? Or who hath you misboten or offended? Do tell me, if it may be amended. And why that ye be clad thus all in black? The oldest lady of them all then spake, when she had swooned with a deadly cheer that it was ruth for to see or hear she said lord to whom fortune hath given victory and as a conqueror to live in naught grieveth us your glory and your honour but we beseech in mercy and succour have mercy on our woe and our distress some drop of pity through thy gentleness upon us wretched women let now fall for certes lord there is none of us all that hath not been a duchess or a queen now we be caitiffs as it is well seen thank it be fortune and her false wheel that none estate ensureth to be well and certes lord to biden your presence here in this temple of the goddess Clements, 
we have been waiting all this for to-night now help us lord since it lies in thy might i wretched wight that weep and wail thus was willem wife to king capanias that staff at phoebus cursed be that day and all we that be in this array and making all this lamentation we lost in all our husbands in that town while that the siege thereabouten lay and yet the old creon well away that lord is now of phoebus the city fulfilled of ire and of iniquity he for despite and for his tyranny to do the dead body's villainy of all our lords which that had been his slaw hath all the bodies on and heap a draw and will not suffer them by none assent neither to be buried nor a brent but maketh hounds eat them in despite and with that word without more respite they fallen groff and cried in piteously have on us wretched women some mercy and let our sorrow sink in in thine heart this gentle duke down from his courser's start with heart piteous when he heard them speak him thought that his heart would all to break when he saw them so piteous and so mate that willem weren of so great estate and in his arms he them all uphent and them comforted in full good intent and swore his oath as he was true knight he would do so faithfully his might upon the tyrant creon them to wreak that all the people of greece should speak how creon was of theseus is served as he had his death full well deserved and right anon without more abode his banner he displayed and forth he rode to thebes ward and all his host beside no ne'er athens would he go nor ride nor take his ease fully half a day but onward on his way that night he lay and sent anon hippolyta the queen and emily her youngest sister sheen unto the town of athens for to dwell and forth he writ there is no more to tell the red statue of mars with spear and targe so shineth in his white banner large that all the field is glitter up and down and by his banner borne is his pinnon of gold full rich in which there was a beat the minotaur which that he slew in crete thus writ this duke thus writ this conqueror and in his host of chivalry the flower till that he came to thebes and the light fair in a field there as he thought to fight but shortly for to speaken of this thing with creon which that was of thebes king he fought and slew him manly as a knight in plain battle and put his folk to flight and by assault he won the city after and rent adown both wall and spar and rafter and to the ladies he restored again the bodies of their husbands that were slain to do obsequies as was then the guise but it were all too long for to devise that great clamour and the way menting which the ladies made at the brenning of the bodies and the great honour that theseus the noble conqueror did to the ladies when they from him went but shortly for to tell is mine intent when that this worthy duke this theseus had creon slain and won in thebes thus still in the field he took all night his rest and did with all the country as him lest to ransack in the tasks of bodies dead 
them for to strip of harness and to weed the pillars did their business and cure after the battle and discomfiture and so befell that in the task they found through girt with many a grievous bloody wound two young knights ligging by and by both in one arms wrought full richly of which two arsita hight that one and he that other hight palamon not fully quick nor fully dead they were but by their coat armor and by their gear the heralds knew them well in special as those that were in of the blood royal of thebes and of sistrin too born out of the task the pillars have them torn and have them carried soft unto the tent of theseus and he full soon them sent to athens for to dwell in prison perpetually he in old no ransom and when this worthy duke had thus it done he took his host and home he writ anon with laurel crowned as a conqueror and there he lived in joy and in honour term of his life what needeth word is mo and in a tower in anguish and in woe dwell in this palamon and eke arsita for evermore there may no gold them quite thus passed year by year and day by day till it fell a once a morn of may that emily that fairer was to seen than is the lily upon his stalk green and fresher than the may with flowers new for with the rose colour strove her hue i note which was the finer of them two ere it was day as she was wont to do she was arisen and already dight for may will have no sluggardy a night the season pricketh every gentle heart and maketh him out of his sleep to start and saith arise and do thine observance this maketh emily have remembrance to do honour to may and for to rise it clothed was she fresh for to devise her yellow hair was braided in a tress behind her back a yard along i guess and in the garden at the sun up wrist she walketh up and down where as her list she gathereth flowers party white and red to make a sotel garland for her head and as an angel heavenly she sung the great tower that was so thick and strong which of the castle was the chief dungeon whereas these knights were in prison of which i told you and tell it shall was even joinant to the garden wall there as this emily had her playing bright was the sun and clear that morning and palamon this woeful prisoner as was his wont by leave of his jailer was risen and roamed in a chamber on high in which he all the noble city sigh and eke the garden full of branches green there as this fresh emilia the sheen was in her walk and roamed up and down this sorrowful prisoner this palamon went in his chamber roaming to and fro and to himself complaining of his woe that he was born full oft he said alas and so befell by adventure or cast that through a window thick of many a bar of iron great and square as any spar he cast his eyes upon emilia and therewithal he blent and cried ah as though he stung and were unto the heart and with that cry arsita anon upstart and said cousin mine what aileth thee that art so pale and deadly for to see why criedst thou 
who hath thee done offence? For God's love take all in patience. Our prison, for it may none other be, Fortune hath given us this adversity. Some wick aspect of disposition, Of Saturn, by some constellation, Hath given us this, although we had it sworn, So stood the heaven when that we were born, We must endure, this is the short and plain. This Palamon answered and said again, Cousin, forsooth of this opinion, Thou hast a vain imagination. This prison caused me not for to cry, But I was hurt right now through mine eye, Into mine heart, that will my bane be. The fairness of the lady that I see, Yond in the garden roaming to and fro, is cause of all my crying and my woe. I know to her she be woman or goddess, but Venus is it suitly as I guess. And therewithal on knees adown he fill and said, Venus, if it be your will, you in this garden thus to transfigure before me, sorrowful, wretched creature, out of this prison help that we may scape, And if so be our destiny be shape, By eternal word to dine in prison, Of our lineage have some compassion, That is so low brought by tyranny. And with that word our seat gonna spy, Whereas this lady roam to and fro, And with that sight her beauty hurt him so, that if that Palamon was wounded sore, Our seat was hurt as much as he or more. And with a sigh he said piteously, The fresh beauty slayeth me suddenly Of her that roameth yonder in the place. And but I have her mercy and her grace That I may see her at the least way, I am but dead. There is no more to say. This Palamon, when he these words heard, Dispiteously he looked and answered, Whether sayest thou this in earnest or in play? Nay, quoth Arcite, in earnest, by my fay, God help me so, me lustful ill to play. This Palamon gan knit his brows tway. It were, quoth he, to thee no great honour, for to be false, nor for to be traitor to me that am thy cousin and thy brother, is sworn full deep, and each of us to other, that never for to die in the pain, till that the death departin shall us twain, neither of us in love to hinder other, nor in none other case, my liver brother. But that thou shouldest truly father me in every case, as I should father thee. This was the thine oath, and mine also certain. I wot it well, thou darest it not with saying. Thus art thou of my counsel out of doubt, and now thou wouldest falsely be about to love my lady, whom I love and serve and ever shall, until my heart sterve. Now, certes, false Asita, thou shalt not so. I loved her first, and told thee my woe. As to my counsel and my brother sworn to father me, as I have told before but which thou art bounden as a knight to help me, if it lie in thy might, or else art thou false, I dare well sayne. This our seat of fool proudly spake again. Thou shalt, quoth he, be rather false than I, and thou art false, I tell thee utterly, for paramour I loved her first ere thou. What wilt thou say? Thou wist it not right now, whether she be a woman or a goddess. Thine is affection of holiness, and mine is love as to a creature, for which I told thee mine aventure. 
as to my cousin and my brother sworn i pose that thou lovest her before wast thou not well the old clerk is saw that who shall give a lover any law love is a greater law by my pen than may be given to any earthly man therefore positive law and such decree is broke away for love in each degree a man must needs love maugre his head he may not flee it though he should be dead all be she maid or widow or else wife and eke it is not likely all thy life to stand in in her grace no more than i for well thou wouldst thyself verily that thou and i be damned to prison perpetual us gaineth no ransom we strive as did the hounds for the bone they fought all day and yet their part was none there came a kite while that they were so wroth and bare away the bone betwixt them both and therefore at the king's court my brother each man for himself there is no other love if thee list for i love and i shall and suitly lever brother this is all here in this prison musten we endure and each of us take his aventure great was the strife and long between these twain if that i had leisure for to say but to the effect it happened on a day to tell it you as shortly as i may a worthy duke that hight perithous that fellow was to the duke theseus since thilke day that they were children light was come to athens his fellow to visit and for to play as he was wont to do for in this world he loved no man so and he loved him as tenderly again so well they loved as old book sayn that when that one was dead soothly to sayn his fellow went and sought him down in hell but of that story list me not to write duke perithous loved well our sight and had him known at thebes year by year and finally at request and prayer of perithous without ransom duke theseus let him out of prison freely to go wear him list all over in such a guise as i tell and shall this was the forward plain to indict betwixt theseus and him our sight that if so were that our sight were found ever in his life by day or night one stound in any country of this theseus and he were caught it was accorded thus that with a sword he should lose his head but took his leave and homeward he him sped let him beware his neck lieth to wed how great a sorrow suffereth now our sight the death he feeleth through his heart a smite he weepeth and waileth crieth piteously to slay himself he waiteth privily he said alas the day that i was born now is my prison worse than before now is me shape eternally to dwell not in purgatory but right in hell alas that ever i knew perithous for ellis had i dwelt with theseus effettered in his prison evermore then had i been in bliss and not in woe only the sight of her whom that i serve though that i never may her grace deserve would have sufficed right enough for me o oh, dear cousin palamon quoth he thine is the victory of this aventure full blissfully in prison to endure in prison <laughs> nay certes in paradise well hath fortune turned thee the dice that hast the sight of her 
and I the absence. For possible is, since thou hast her presence, and art a knight, a worthy and an able, that by some cast, since fortune is changeable, thou mayst to thy desire some time attain. But I that am exiled and barren of all grace, and in so great despair, that there in his earth water, fire, nor air, nor creature, that of them make it is, that may help nor comfort in this. Well ought I sterve in one hope and distress. Farewell, my life, my lust, and my gladness. Alas, why plainen men so in commune Of purveyance of God or of fortune That giveth them full oft in many a guise? well better than they can themselves devise some man desireth for to have riches that causes of his murder or great sickness and some man would out of his prison fain that in his house is of his manis slain infinite harm must be in this matter we wot never what thing we pray for here. We fare as he that drunk is as a mouse. A drunken man wot well he hath an house. But he wot not which is the right way thither. And to a drunken man the way is slither. And certus in this world so fare we. We seek a fast after felicity, but we go wrong full often truly. Thus we may say in all, and namely I, that weened and had a great opinion, that if I might escape from prison, then had I been in joy and perfect hell. For where now I am exiled from my well, since that I may not see you, Emily, I am but dead. There is no remedy. Upon that other side, Palamon, when that he wist our sight was gone, much sorrow maketh that the great tower resoundeth of his yelling and clamour the pure fetters on his shinnes great were of his bitter salt tears wet alas quoth he our sight cousin mine of all our strife god what the fruit is thine thou walkest now in thebes at thy large and of my woe thou givest little charge Thou mayest, since thou hast wisdom and manhead, assemble all the folk of our kindred, and make a war so sharp on this country, that by some aventure or some treaty thou mayst have her to lady and to wife, for whom that I must needs lose my life. For as by way of possibility, since thou art at thy lodge of prison free, and art a lord, great is thine advantage, more than is mine that sterve here in a cage. For I must weep and wail while that I live, with all the woe that prison may me give, and eke with pain that love me gives also, that doubles all my torment and my woe. Therewith the fire of jealousy upstart within his breast, and hint him by the heart so woodly that he like was to behold the box tree, or the ashes dead and cold. Then said, O cruel goddess that govern this world with binding of your word etern, and written in the table of adamant your parliament and your eternal grant what is mankind more unto you hold 
than is the sheep that rooketh in the fold. For slain is man, right as another beast, and dwelleth eke in prison and arrest, and hath sickness and great adversity, and oftentimes guiltless pardy, what governess is in your prescience, that guiltless tormenteth innocence, and yet increaseth this all my penance, that man is bounden to his observance. For God's sake, to letten of his will, whereas a beast may all his lust fulfil. And when a beast is dead, he hath no pain. But man after his death must weep and plain, though in this world he have care and woe, without a doubt it may stand in so. The answer of this leave I to divines, but well I wot, that in this world great pine is. Alas, I see a serpent or a thief, that many a true man hath done mischief. Go at his lodge, and where him list may turn, but I must be in prison through Saturn, and eke through Juno, jealous and eke wood, that hath well nigh destroyed all the blood of Thebes, with his waist wallace wide, and Venus slayeth me on that other side. For jealousy and fear of him are sight. Now will I stent of Palamon alight, and let him in his prison still a-dwell, and of our seat forth I will you tell. The summer passeth, and the night is long, increase double-wise the pain is strong, both of the lover and the prisoner, I note which hath the woefuller mister. For shortly for to say this Palamon perpetually is damned to prison, in chains and in fetters to be dead, and our sight is exiled on his head for evermore as out of that country nor never more he shall his lady see. You lovers, ask I now this question, Who lieth the worse, our sight or Palamon? The one may see his lady day by day, But in prison he dwell must all way. The other, where him list may ride or go, But see his lady shall he never mow. Now deem all as you list, ye that can, For I will tell you forth as I began. When that our sight to Thebes common was, Full oft a day he swelt and said, Alas, for see this lady he shall know never mo, And shortly to concluden all his woe, So much sorrow had never creature that is or shall be, While the world may dure. His sleep, his meat, his drink is him by raft, That lean he wex, and dry as any shaft, His iron hollow, grisly to behold, His hue sallow, and pale as ashes cold, And solitary he was, ever alone, And wailing all the night, making his moan, And if he heard a song or instrument, then would he weepen, he might not be stent, So feeble were his spirits, and so low, And changed so, that no man could know his speech, Neither his voice, though men it heard. And in his gear, for all the world he fard, Not only like the lover's malady of Eros, But rather like many, Engendered of humours melancholic, Before his head in his cell fantastic, And shortly turned was all upside down, Both habit and eke disposition, Of him this woeful lover dan our sight, Why should I all day of his woe indict? When he endured had a year or two, This cruel torment, and this pain and woe, 
at thebes in his country as i said upon a night in sleep as he him laid him thought how that the winged god mercury before him stood and bade him to be merry his sleepy yard in hand he bare upright a hat he wore upon his hair as bright arrayed was this god as he took keep and he was when that argus took his sleep and said him thus to athens shalt thou wind there is thee shapen of thy woe an end and with that word our sight woke and start now truly how sore that air me smart quoth he to athens right now will i fare nor for no dread of death shall i not spare to see my lady that i love and serve in her presence i reck not to stirve and with that word he caught a great mirror and saw that changed was all his color and saw his visage all in other kind and right anon it ran him ill his mind that since his face was so disfigured of malady the which he had endured he might well if that he bare him low live in athenis evermore unknow and see his lady well nigh day by day and right anon he changed his array and clad him as a poor laborer and all alone save only a squire that knew his privity and all his cast which was disguised poorly as he was to athens is he gone the next away and to the court he went upon a day and at that gate he proffered his service to drudge and draw what so men would devise and shortly of this matter for to say in he fell in office with a chamberlain the which that dwelling was with emily for he was wise and could as soon espy of every servant which that served her well could he hew wood and water bear for he was young and mighty for the nonce and thereto he was strong and big of bones to do that any wight can him devise a year or two he was in this service page of the chamber of emily the bright and philostrate he said that he hight but half so well beloved a man as he ne'er was there never in court of his degree he was so gentle of condition that throughout all the court was his renown they said that it were a charity that theseus would enhance his degree and put him in some worshipful service there as he might his virtue exercise and thus within a while his name sprung both of his deeds and of his good tongue that theseus hath taken him so near that of his chamber he hath made him squire and gave him gold to maintain his degree and eke men brought him out of his country from year to year full privily his rent but honestly and slyly he it spent that no man wondered how that he it had and three year in this wise his life be led and bear him so in peace and eke in war that there was no man that theseus had so dear and in this bliss leave i now our sight and speak i will of palamon alight in darkness horrible and strong prison this seven year hath sitten palamon for pined what for love and for distress who feeleth double sorrow and heaviness but palamon that love distraineth so that would out of his wits he went for woe and eke thereto he is a prisoner perpetual not only for a year who could rhyme in english proper lie his martyrdom forsooth it is not i therefore i pass as lightly as i may it fell that in the seventh year in may the third night as old a book is saying 
that all this story tellen more plain were it by a venture or destiny as when a thing is shapen it shall be that soon after the midnight palamon by helping of a friend brake his prison and fled the city fast as he might go for he had given drink his jailer so of a clary made of a certain wine with narcotis and opiae of phoebus fine that all the night though that men would him shake the jailer slept he might not wake and thus he fled as fast as ever he may the night was short and fast by the day that need is cast he must himself to hide and to a grove fast there beside with dreadful foot then stalked palamon for shortly this was his opinion that in the grove he would him hide all day and in the night then would he take his way to thebes ward his friend is for to pray on theseus to help him to warre and shortly either he would lose his life or win an emily unto his wife this is the effect and his intention plain now i will turn to our sight again that little wist how nigh was his care till that fortune had brought him in the snare the busy lark the messenger of day saluteth in her song the morning grey and fiery phoebus riseth up so bright that all the orient laugheth at the sight and with his streamus drieth in the greaves the silver drops hanging on the leaves and our sight that is in the court royal with theseus his squire principal is risen and looketh on the merry day and for to do his observance to may remembering the point of his desire he on his courser starting as the fire is ridden to the fields him to play out of the court were it a mile or tway and to the grove of which i have you told by a venture his way began to hold to make him a garland of the greaves were it of woodbine or of hawthorn leaves and loud he sang against the sun so sheen o may with all thy flowers and thy green right welcome be thou fair fresh may i hope that i some green here getten may and from his courser with a lusty heart into the grove full hastily he start and in a path he roamed up and down there as by a venture this palamon was in a bush that no man might him see for sore afeard of his death was he nothing ne he knew that it was our sight god wot he would have trod it full light but sooth is said gone since full many years the field hath iron and the wood hath ears it is a full fare a man to bear him even for all day meeten men at unset stephen full little wot our sight of his fellow that was so nigh to hearken of his saw for in the bush he sitteth now full still when that our sight had roamed all his fill and sung in all the roundel lustily as do those lovers in their quaint gears now in the crop and now down in the brares now up now down as bucket in a well right as the friday soothly for to tell now shineth it and now it raineth fast right so can geary venus overcast the heartest of her folks right as her day is gearful right so changeth she array seldom is friday all the week like when our sight had a song he gan to psyche and sat him down withouten any more alas quoth he the day that i was bore how long juno through thy cruelty wilt thou warre in thebes the city alas it brought is to confusion the blood royal of cadm 
and Amphion, of Cadmus, which that was the first man that Thebes built, or the first town began, and of the city first was crowned king, of his lineage am I, and his offspring, by very line, as of the stock royal. And now I am so caitiff, and so thrall, that he that is my mortal enemy, I serve him as his squire poorly. And yet doth Juno me well more shame, for I dare not be no mine own name. But there, as I was wont to hight our sight, now hight I philostrate, not worth a mite. Alas, thou fell Mars, and alas, Juno, thus hath your ire our lineage all fordo, save only me and wretched Palamon, that Theseus martyreth in prison. And over all this to slay me utterly, love hath his fiery dart so burningly is sticked through my true careful heart that shapen was my death erst than my shot ye slay me with your eyes emily ye be the cause wherefore that i die of all the remnant of mine other care ne'er set i not the mountains of a tear so that I could do aught to your pleasance. And with that word he fell down in a trance a long time. And afterward upstart this Palamon, that thought through his heart he felt a cold sword suddenly to glide, for ire he quoke, no longer would he hide. And when that he had heard our sight's tale, as he were wood, with face dead and pale, he start him up out of the bushes thick, and said, False our sight, false traitor wick, now art thou hint that lovest my lady so, for whom that I have all this pain and woe, and art my blood, and to my counsel sworn, as I full oft have told thee here before and hast be japed here duke theseus and falsely changed hast thy name thus i will be dead or else thou shalt die thou shalt not love my lady emily for i will love her only and no more for i am palamon thy mortal foe and though I have no weapon in this place, but out of prison am a start by grace, I dread not that either thou shalt die, or else thou shalt not love in Emily. Choose which thou wilt, for thou shalt not a start. This our sight then, with full dispiteous heart, when he him knew and had his tale heard, as fierce as lion, pulled out a sword, and said thus, By God, that sitteth above, Ne'er it that thou art sick and wood for love, And eke that thou no weapon hast in this place, Thou shouldst never out of this grove pace, That thou ne'er shouldst dine of mine hand, For I defy the surety and the band, Which that thou sayest I have made to thee. What? very fool think well that love is free and i will love her more than all thy might but for thou art a worthy gentle knight and willness to darain her by battle have here my troth to-morrow i will not fail without weeting of any other wight that here i will be founden as a knight and bring harness right enough for thee, and choose the best, and leave the worst for me, and meat and drink this night will I bring enough for thee, and clothes for thy bedding. And if so be that thou my lady win, and slay me in this wood that I am in, thou mayst well have thy lady as for me. This Palamon answered, I grant it thee. And thus they be departed till the morrow, when each of them hath laid his faith 
to borrow. O oh, Cupid, out of all a charity, O oh, Regna, that wilt no fellow have with thee, Full sooth is said that love nor lordship Will not his thanks have any fellowship. Well finden that our sight and Palamon. Our sight is ridden on unto the town, And on the morrow, ere it were daylight, Full privily two harness hath he dight, Both sufficient and meet to Darain, And battle in the field betwixt them twain. And on his horse alone, as he was born, He carrieth all this harness him before, And in the grove, at time and place is set, This our sight and this Palamon be met. Then change gan the color of their face, Right as the hunter in the regna of Thrace, That standeth at a gap with a spear, When hunted is the lion or the bear, And heareth him come rushing in the greaves, And breaketh both the boughs and the leaves, Thinketh, here comes my mortal enemy, Without fail he must be dead or I, For either I must slay him at the gap, or he must slay me, if that me mishap. So fared they, in changing of their hue, As far as either of them other knew, There was no good day, and no saluting, But straight, without words, rehearsing, Ever reach of them hope to arm the other, As friendly as he were his own brother. And after that, with sharp spears strong, they foined each at other wonder long. Thou mightest ween that this Palamon in fighting were as a wood lion, and as a cruel tiger was our sight. As wild boars gan they together smite, that froth as white as foam, for I a wood, up to the ankle fought they in their blood. And in this wise I let them fighting dwell, And forth I will of Theseus you tell. The destiny, minister general, That executeth in the world o'er all The purveyance that God hath seen before, So strong it is that though the world had sworn The contrary of a thing, by yea or nay, Yet some time it shall fallen on a day, that falleth not eft in a thousand year. For certainly our appetites here, Be it of war, or peace, or hate, or love, All is this ruled by the sight above. This mean I now by mighty Theseus, That for to hunten is so desirous, And namely the great heart in May, That in his bed there dawneth him no day That he is not glad, and ready for to ride, With hunt and horn and hounds by his side. For in his hunting hath he such delight, That it is all his joy and appetite, To be himself the great heart's bane, For after Mars he serveth now Diane. Clear was the day, as I have told ere this, And Theseus, with all a joy and bliss, And with his Hippolyta the fair queen, and Emily, clothed all in green, On hunting be they ridden royally, And to the grove that stood there fast by, In which there was a heart, as men him told, Duke Theseus the straight way doth hold, And to the land he rideth him full right, There was the heart I want to have his flight, And over a brook, and so forth on his way. This duke will have a course at him or tway with houndes, such as him lust to command. And when this duke was come to the land, under the sun he looked, and anon he was ware of our sight and Palamon, that fought Brame, as it were bullis too. The bright swords went to and fro so hideously that with the least stroke it seemed that it would fell an oak. But what they were, nothing yet he wot. This duke, his courser, 
with his spurs smote, and at a start he was betwixt them two, and pulled out a sword and cried, Ho! Oh, no more, on pain of losing your head. By mighty Mars he shall anon be dead, that smiteth any stroke that I may see. But tell to me what mystery men ye be, that be so hardy for to fight here, without judge or other officer, as though it were in lists royally. This Palamon answered hastily, and said, Sir, what needeth word us mo? We have the death deserved both the two. Two woeful wretches be we, and caitives, that be a cumbered of our own lives. And as thou art a rightful lord and judge, so give us neither mercy nor refuge. And slay me first for saint to charity, but slay my fellow eke as well as me. Or slay him first, for, though thou know it light, this is thy mortal foe, this is our sight, that from thy land is banished on his head, for which he hath deserved to be dead. For this is he that came unto thy gate, and said that he hight Philostrate. Thus hath he japed thee full many year, and thou hast made of him thy chief esquire. And this is he that loveth Emily, for since the day is come that I shall die, I make plainly my confession that I am Thilke woeful Palamon, that hath thy prison broken wickedly. I am thy mortal foe, and it am I that so hot loveth Emily the bright, that I would die here present in her sight. Therefore I ask death, and my choice, and slay my fellow eke in the same wise, for both we have deserved to be slain. This worthy duke answered anon again, and said, This is a short conclusion. To your own mouth, by your own confession, hath damned you, and I will it record. It needeth not to pain you with the cord. Ye shall be dead by mighty Mars the Red. The queen anon, for very womanhead, began to weep, and so did Emily, and all the ladies in the company. Great pity was it, as it thought them all, that ever such a chance should befall, for gentle men they were of great estate, and nothing but for love was this debate. They saw their bloody wounds wide and sore, and cried all at once, both less and more, Have mercy, Lord, upon us women all, and on their bare knees adown they fall, and would have kissed his feet there as he stood, till at the last a slaked was his mood for pity runneth soon in the gentle heart. And though at first for ire he quoke and start, he hath considered shortly in a clause the trespass of them both, and eke the cause. And although that his ire their guilt accused, yet in his reason he hath them both excused. As thus, he thought well that every man will help himself in love, if that he can, and eke deliver himself out of prison, of women, for they wept in ever in one, and eke his heart had compassion, and in his gentle heart he thought anon, and soft unto himself he said, Fie upon a lord that will have no mercy! but be a lion both in word and deed, to them that be in repentance and dread, as well as to a proud, dispiteous man, that will maintain what he first began. That lord hath little of discretion, that in such case can no division, but weigheth pride and humbleness after one. And shortly, when his ire is thus agone, he gan to look on them with iron light, 
and spake these same words all on height. The God of love, ah, Benedicite, how mighty and how great a lord is he! Against his might there gain none obstacles. He may be called a god for his miracles, for he can maken at his own guise of every heart as that him list devise. Lo here this Arcite and this Palamon, that quietly were out of my prison, and might have lived in Thebes royally, and weet I am their mortal enemy, and that their death lieth in my might also, and yet hath love more their eyen too. It brought them hither both for to die. Now look ye, is this not an high folly? Who may not be a fool, if but he love? Behold, for God's sake that sits above, see how they bleed. Be they not well arrayed? Thus hath their lord, the god of love, them paid. Their wages and their fees for their service. And yet they ween for to be full wise, that serve love, for aught that may befall. But this is yet the best game of all, that she for whom they have this jealousy, can them therefore as much ill thank as me. She wot no more of all this hot fair, by God, than what a cuckoo or an hare. But all must be assayed, hot or cold. A man must be a fool, or young, or old. I wot it by myself full yore agone, for in my time a servant was I one, and therefore, since I know of love's pain, and what how sore it can a man distrain, and he that oft hath been caught in his last, I you forgive wholly this trespass, at request of the queen that kneeleth here, and eke of Emily, my sister dear. And ye shall both anon unto me swear, that never more ye shall my country dare, nor make war upon me night or day, but be my friends in all of that ye may. I you forgive this trespass every deal, and they him swear his asking fair and well, and him of lordship and of mercy prayed, and he them granted grace, and thus he said, to speak of royal lineage and richness, though that she were a queen or a princess, each of you both is worthy doubtless to wed when time is. But natheless I speak as for my sister Emily, for whom ye have this strife and jealousy. Ye wot yourselves she may not wed the two at once, although ye fight for evermore. But one of you, all be him loth or leaf, he must go pipe into an ivy leaf. This is to say, she may not have you both, all be ye never so jealous nor so wroth. And therefore I you put in this degree, that each of you shall have his destiny as him is shape, and hearken in what wise. Lo, hear your end of that I shall devise, my will is this, for plain conclusion, withouten any replication. If that you liketh, take it for the best, that ever reach of you shall go where him lest, freely, without ransom or danger. And this day, fifty weeks far near near, ever reach of you shall bring a hundred knights, armed for lists up at all rights, all ready to darain her by battle, and this be to you, I you without fail. Upon my troth, and as I am a knight, that whether of you both that hath might, that is to say, that whether he or thou may with his hundred, as I spake of now, slay his contrary, or out of lists drive, 
him shall i give emily to wife to whom that fortune gives so fair a grace the lists shall i make here in this place and god so wisely on my soul rule as i shall even judge be and true yet shall none other end with me maken than one of you shall be dead or taken and if you think it this as well is said say your advice and hold yourselves apaid this is your end and your conclusion who looketh lightly now but palamon who springeth up for joy but our sight who could it tell or who could it indite the joy that is naked in the place when theseus hath done so fair a grace but down on knees went every manner white and thanked him with all their heart's might and namely these thebans oft sigh and thus with good hope and with heart blithe they take their leave and homeward gan they ride to thebus word with his old wall is wide this ends the knight's tale part 1 the story concludes on the next file this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina during june 2006 the canterbury tales by jeffrey chaucer edited by d lang purvis this reading is based on the book the canterbury tales and other poems the original text contains poems by chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor to view these please click on the gutenberg e-text link on the librivox catalog page of the canterbury tales and now we continue with the knight's tale part 2 i trow men would deem it negligence if i forgot to tell the dispense of theseus that went so busily to making up the lists royally that such a noble theater as it was i dare well say in all this world there nas the circuit a mile was about walled of stone and ditched all without round was the shape in manner of compass full of degrees the height of 60 pass that when a man was set on one degree he let it not his fellow for to see eastward there stood a gate of marble white westward right such another opposite and shortly to conclude such a place was never on earth made in so little space for in the land there was no craftsman that geometry or arithmetic can nor portrayer nor carver of images that theseus ne'er gave him meat and wages the theatre to make and to devise and for to do his right and sacrifice he eastward hath upon the gate above in worship of venus goddess of love done make an altar and an oratory and westward in the mind and in memory of mars he make it hath right such another that cost largely of gold a father and northward in a turret on the wall of alabaster white and red coral an oratory reach for to see in worship of dian of chastity hath theseus done work in noble wise but yet had i forgotten to devise the noble carving and the portraitures the shape the countenance of the figures that were in their oratories three first in the temple of venus mayst thou see wrought on the wall full piteous to behold the broken sleeps and the seekest cold the sacred tears and the waymentings the fiery strokes of the desirings that love's servants in this life endure the oaths that their covenants assure 
pleasance and hope, desire, foolhardiness, beauty and youth, and baldry and riches, charms and sorcery, leasings and flattery, dispense, business, and jealousy, that wore of yellow goldus a garland, and had a cuckoo sitting on her hand, feasts, instruments, and carols, and dances, lust and array, and all the circumstances of love, which I reckoned and reckon shall, in order, were painted on the wall, and more than I can make of mention, for soothly all the mount of Scytheron, where Venus hath her principal dwelling, was showed on the wall in portraying, with all the garden, and the lustiness, nor was forgot the porter idleness, nor Narcissus the fair of Yoragon, nor yet the folly of King Solomon, nor yet the great strength of Hercules, the enchantments of Medea and Circes, nor of Turnus the hardy fierce courage, the rich Croesus, caitiff in servage, Thus may ye see that wisdom nor riches, beauty nor slight nor strength nor hardiness, nay may with Venus hold Champati, for as her list the world may she guide. Lo, all these folks so caught were in her lass, till they for woe full often said, Alas, suffice these in samples one or two although I could reckon a thousand more. The statue of Venus, glorious to see, was naked floating in the large sea, and from the navel down all covered was, with wave as green and bright as any glass. A sitol in her right hand had she, and on her head full seemly for to see a rose garland fresh and well smelling above her head her doves flickering before her stood her son cupido upon his shoulders wings had he too and blind he was as it is often seen a bow he bare and arrows bright and keen why should I not as well he could tell you all the portraiture that was upon the wall, within the temple of mighty Mars the Red? All painted was the wall in length and bread, like to the estress of the grisly place that hight the great temple of Mars in Thrace, in thilke gold and frosty region. There, as Mars had his sovereign mansion, in which there dwelled neither man nor beast, with knotty, gnarly, barren trees old, of stubs sharp and hideous to behold, in which there ran a rumble and a saw, as though a storm should burst in every bough, and downward from an hill under a bent there stood the temple of Mars omnipotent, wrought all of burnished steel, of which the entry was long and straight, and ghastly for to see. And thereout came a rage, and such a vice, that it made all the gates for to rise. The northern light in at the door shone, for window on the wall was there none, through which men mighten any light discern. The doors were all of adamant turn, it clenched over thwart, an end along, with iron tough, and for to make it strong, every pillar the temple to sustain was tongue great of iron bright and sheen. There saw I first the dark imagining of felony, and all the compassing, the cruel ire as red as any gleed, the pick purse and eke the pallid red, the smiler with the knife under the cloak, the shepin burning with the black of smoke, the treason of the murdering in the bed, 
the open war, with wound is all be bled. Con take with bloody knife and sharp menace. All full of checking was that sorry place. The slayer of himself there saw I there. His hot blood had bathed all his hair. The nail had driven in the shod at night. The cold death with mouth gaping upright. Amid us of the temple sat mischance, with discomfort and sorry countenance. Eke saw I woodness, laughing in his rage, armed complaint, outhase and fierce outrage, the carain in the bush with throat a cove, a thousand slain, and not of quorm estove. The tyrant, with the prey by force ereft, The town destroyed, that there was nothing left. Yet saw I burnt the ship's hope stairs, The hunter strangled with the wild bears, The sow freighting the child right in the cradle, The cook scalded for all his long ladle. Nor was forgot by the infortune of Mart, the carter overridden with his cart under the wheel full low he lay adown there were also of mars division the armourer the bowyer and the smith that forgeth sharp sword is on his stith and all above depainted in a tower saw i conquest sitting in great honour with a sharp sword over his head hanging by a subtle etwined thread. Painted the slaughter was of Julius, of cruel Nero and Antonius, although at that time they were yet unborn, yet was their death depainted there before. By menacing of Mars right by figure, so was it showed in that portraiture, as is depainted in the stars above, who shall be slain, or else dead for love? Sufficeth one in sample in stories old. I may not reckon them all, though I would. The statue of Mars upon a cart stood, Armed, and looked grim as he were wood, And over his head there shone two figures of stars That be clept in scriptures. That one, Puella, that other, Rubius. This god of arms was arrayed thus. A wolf there stood before him at his feet, With iron red, and of a man he eat. With subtle pencil painted was this story, In redoubting of Mars and of his glory. Now to the temple of Diane, the chaste, As shortly as I can I will me haste, To tell you all the description, Depainted be the walls up and down, Of hunting, and of shamefast chastity. There saw I how woeful Callistope, When that Diane a grievet was with her, Was turned from a woman to a bear, and after was she made the lodestar. Thus was it painted, I can say no far. Her son is eke a star, as men may see. There saw I Dane turned into a tree. I mean not the goddess Diane, but Peneus' daughter, which that height Dane. There saw I Acteon, and heart emaked for vengeance that he saw Diane all naked. I saw how that his hounders have him caught, and threaten him, for that they knew him not. Yet painted was a little farther more how Atalanta hunted the wild boar, and Meliaga, and many other more, for which Diana wrought them care and woe. There saw I many another wondrous story, 
the which me list not drawn to memory. This goddess on an art full high was set, with small hounds all about her feet, and underneath her feet she had a moon, waxing it was, and should wane soon. In gaudy green her statue clothed was, with bow in hand and arrows in a case, her iron cast she full low adown, where Pluto hath his dark region. A woman travailing was her beforn, but for her child so long was unborn, full piteously Lucina gan she call, and said, Help, for thou mayst best of all. Well could he paint life like that it wrought, with many a florin he the hues had bought. Now be these listes made, and Theseus, that at his great cost arrayed thus the temples and the theatre every deal, when it was done, him like it wonder well. But stint I will of Theseus alight, and speak of Palamon and of our sight. The day approacheth of their returning, that ever each an hundred knights should bring the battle to Darain, as I you told, and to Athens their covenant to hold. Hath ever each of them brought an hundred knights, well armed for the war at all rights, and sickerly there trowed many a man, that never sithen that the world began, for to speaken of knighthood of their hand. As far as God hath maked sea and land, was of so few so noble a company. For every white that loved chivalry, and would his thanks have a passant name, had prayed that he might be of that game. And well was him that thereto chosen was, for if there fell to-morrow such a case, ye know well that every lusty knight that loveth paramour, and hath his might were it in England or elsewhere, they would their thanks willin to be there, to fight for a lady, Benesit. It were a lusty sight for to see. And right so fared they with Palamon, with him there went knights many one, some will be armed in an abergjon, and in a breastplate, and in a jipon, some will have a pair of plates large, and some will have a process shield or targe. Some will be armed on their leg as well. Some have an axe, and some a mace of steel. There is no new guise, but it was old. Armed they were in, as I have you told, ever each after his opinion. There mayst thou see coming with Palamon. Lycurgus himself, the great king of Thrace, black was his beard, and manly was his face. The circles of his iron in his head, they glowed betwixt yellow and red, like a griffin looked he about, with kempt hair on his brow stout. His limbs were great, his bronze were hard and strong, his shoulders broad, his arms round and long, and as the guise was in his country, full high upon a car of gold he stood, with four white bullets in the trace, instead of coat armor on his harness, with yellow nails, and bright as any gold, he had a bear's skin, coal-black for old, his long hair was a kimped behind his back, as any raven's feather it shone for black. A wreath of gold arm great of huge weight upon his head set, full of stones bright, of fine rubies and clear diamonds. About his car there went white alarms, twenty and more, as great as any steer, to hunt the lion or the wild bear and followed him with muzzle fast abound, collars of gold and torrets filed around, and hundred lords had he in his rout, 
armed full well with heart stern and stout. With our sight in stories as men find, the great Emetrius, the king of Ind, upon a steed bay trapped in steel, covered with cloth of gold diapered well, came riding like the god of arms, Mars, his coat armor was a cloth of tars, couched with pearls white and round and great, his saddle was of burnished gold new beat, a mantlet on his shoulders hanging breadful of rubies red as fires sparkling, his crisp hair like ringers was a-run, and that was yellow, glittering as the sun. His nose was high, his iron bright citrine. His lips were round, his color was sanguine. A few of frackness in his face is sprint, betwixt a yellow and black some deal a mint, and as a lion he his looking cast, of five and twenty year his age I cast, his beard was well begunnen for to spring, his voice was as a trumpet thundering, upon his head he wore of laurel green a garland fresh and lusty to be seen. Upon his hand he bare, for his delight, an eagle tame as any lily white. An hundred lords had he with him there, all armed, save their heads in all their gear, full richly in all manner things. For trust ye well that earls, dukes, and kings were gathered in this noble company, for love and for increase of chivalry. About this king there ran on every part full many a tame lion and leopard, and in this wise these lordes all and some be on the Sunday to the city come, about a prime, and in the town alight. This Theseus, this duke, this worthy knight, when he had brought them into his city, and inned them, ever each at his degree, he feasteth them, and doth so great labor to ease in them, and do them all honor, that yet men ween that no manis wit of none estate could amend in it. The minstrelsy, the service at the feast, the great gifts to the most and least, the rich array of Theseus's palace, nor who say to first or last upon the death, what ladies fairest be, or best dancing, or which of them can carol best, or sing, or who most feelingly speaketh of love, what hawk is sitting on the perch above, what hound is legging on the floor adown, of all this now I make no mention, but of the fact that thinketh me the best, now comes the point, and hearken if you lest. The Sunday night, ere day began to spring, when Palamon the larker heard a sing, although it were not day by hours too, yet sang the lark, and Palamon right though, with holy heart and with a high courage, arose to Wenden on his pilgrimage, unto the blissful Cythera benign, I mean Venus honourable, and dine, and in her hour he walketh forth a pace unto the lists where her temple was, and down he kneeleth, and with humble cheer and heart sore he said, as ye shall hear, Fairest of fair, O lady mine of Venus, daughter to Jove and spouse of Vulcanus, Thou gladder of the mount of Cytheron, For thilke love thou hadst to adorn, Have pity on my bitter tears smart, And take mine humble prayer to thine heart. Alas, I have no language to tell The effect nor the torment of mine hell. Mine heart may mine harm is not betray, I am so confused that I cannot say, 
but mercy lady bright that knowest well my thought and seest what harm that i feel consider all this and rue upon my sore as wisely as i shall for evermore enforce my might thy true servant to be and hold a war alway with chastity that make i mine avow so ye me help i keep not of arms for to yelp nor ask i not to-morrow to have victory nor renown in this case nor vain glory of prize of arms blowing up and down but i would have fully possession of emily and die in her service find thou the manner how and in what wise i reckon not but it may better be to have victory of them or they of me so that i have my lady in mine arms for though so be that mars is god of arms your virtue is so great in heaven above that if you list i shall well have my love thy temple will i worship evermore and on thine altar where i ride or go i will do sacrifice and fires bait and if ye will not so my lady sweet then i pray you to-morrow with a spear that our sight me through the heart to bear then reck i not when i have lost my life though that our sight to win her to his wife this is the effect and the end of my prayer give me my love thou blissful lady dear when the orison was done of palamon his sacrifice he did and that anon full piteously with all the circumstances all tell i not as now his observances but at the last the statue of venus shook and made a sign whereby that he took that his prayer accepted was that day for though the sign showed a delay yet wist he well that granted was his boon and with glad heart he went him home full soon the third hour unequal that palamon began to venus's temple for to gone up rose the sun and up rose emily and to the temple of dian gone she her maidens that she thither with her lad the incense the clothes and the remnant all that to the sacrifice belong shall the horn is full of mead as was the guise there lacked naught to do her sacrifice smoking the temple full of clothes fair this emily with heart debonair her body washed with water of a well but how she did her right i dare not tell but it be any thing in general and yet it were a game to hear in all to him that meaneth well it were no charge but it is good a man to be at large her bright hair combed was untressed all a coronet of green oak serial upon her head was set full fair and meet two fires on the altar gan she beat and did her thingis as men may behold in stays of thebes and these bookis old when kindled was the fire with piteous cheer unto diane she spake as ye may hear o chaste goddess of the woodes green to whom both heaven and earth and sea is seen queen of the realm of pluto dark and low goddess of maidens that mine heart has no full many a year and wast what i desire to keep me from the vengeance of thine ire that actaeon abort cruelly chaste goddess well wottest thou that i desire to be a maiden all my life nor never will i be no love nor wife 
I am, thou wast, yet of thy company, a maid, and love hunting and venery, and for to walk in, in the woodest wild, and not to be a wife and be with child. Nought will I know the company of man. Now help me, lady, since ye may and can, for those three formers that thou hast in thee, and Palamon that hath such love to me, and Egarsite that loveth me so sore, this grace I pray thee without more, as send a love and peace betwixt them two, and from me turn away their heart is so, that all their hot love and their desire, and all their busy torment and their fire be quaint, or turned into another place, and if so be thou wilt do me no grace, or if my destiny be shapen so, that I shall needes have one of them too, so send me him that most desireth me. Behold, goddess of clean chastity, the bitter tears that on my cheeks fall, since thou art maid and keeper of us all, my maidenhead thou keep and well conserve, and while I live, a maid I will thee serve. The fires burn upon the altar clear, while Emily was thus in her prayer. But suddenly she saw a sight to quaint, for right anon one of the fires gained, and quicked again, and after that anon that other fire was quaint, and all agone, and as it quaint it made a whistling as doth a brand wet in its burning, and at the brand's end out ran anon, as it were, bloody drops, many one, for which so sore aghast was Emily, that she was well nigh mad, and gan to cry, for she ne'er wist what it signified, but only for fear thus she cried, and wept that it was pity for to hear, and therewithal Diana can appear, with bow in hand, right as an hunteress, and said, Daughter, stint thine heaviness. Among the goddess high it is affirmed, and by eternal word writ and confirmed, thou shalt be wedded unto one of the that have for thee so much a care and woe, but unto which of them I may not tell. Farewell, for here I may no longer dwell. The fires which that on mine altar burn shall thee declare, ere that thou go hen, thine aventure of love, as in this case. And with that word the arrows in the case of the goddess did clatter fast and ring, and forth she went and made a vanishing. For which this Emily astonished was, and said, What amount is this? Alas! I put me under thy protection, Diane, and in thy disposition. And home she went anon the next way. This is the effect. There is no more to say. The next hour of Mars following this, our sight to the temple walk it is of fierce Mars, to do his sacrifice with all the rites of his pagan guise. With piteous heart and high devotion, right thus to Mars he said his orison, O stronger God that in the ring is old of Thrace honored art, and Lord ehold, and hast in every ring and every land of armis all the bridle in thine hand and them fortunest as the list devise accept of me my piteous sacrifice if so be that my youth may deserve and that my might be worthy for to serve thy godhead that i may be one of thine then pray i thee to rue upon my pine for thilke pain and thilke hot fire, in which thou, Willem, burnest for desire, when that thou usedest the beauty of fair young Venus 
fresh and free, and haddest her in armus at thy will, and though thee wonnest on a time misfill, when Vulcanus had caught thee in his lass, and found thee lagging by his wife, alas, for thilka's sorrow that was in thine heart, have ruth as well upon my pain as smart. I am young and uncunning, as thou knowest, and as I trow with love offended most, that e'er was any living creature. For she, that doth me all this woe endure, ne recketh ne'er whether I sink or fleet, and well I wot ere she me mercy heat, I must with strength win her in the place, and well I wot, without help or grace of thee, nay may my strength not avail then help me lord to-morrow in my battle for thilk a fire that will burned thee as well as this fire that now burneth me and do that i to-morrow may have victory mine be the travail all thine be the glory thy sovereign temple will i most honour of any place and always most labour in thy pleasance and in thy craft is strong and in thy temple i will my banner hung and all the armors of my company and evermore until the day i die eternal fire i will before thee find and eke to this my vow i will me bind my beard, my hair that hangeth long adown, that never yet hath felt a fincion of razor, nor of shears, I will thee give, and be thy true servant while I live. Now, Lord, have ruth upon my sorrow sore, give me the victory, I ask no more. The prayer stint of our sight of the strong, the ring is on the temple door that hung, and eke the doors clattered full fast, of which our Sita somewhat was aghast. The fires burned upon the altar bright, that it gan all the temple for to light. A sweet smell anon the ground up gaff, and our sight anon his hand up half, and more incense into the fire he cast, with other rites more and at the last the statue of mars began his hauberk ring and with that sound he heard a murmuring full low and dim that said thus victory for which he gave to mars honour and glory and thus with joy and hope well to fare our sight anon unto his inn doth fare as fain as foul is of the brightest sun and right anon such strife there is begun for thilk granting in the heaven above betwixt venus the goddess of love and mars the stern god omnipotent that jupiter was busy it to stint till that the pale saturnus the cold that knew so many of adventures old found in his old experience such an art that he full soon hath pleased every part and sooth is said eld hath great advantage in eld is both wisdom and usage men may the old outrun but not outread saturn anon to stint the strife and tread albeit that it is against his kind of all this strife gan a remedy find my dear daughter venus quoth saturn my course that hath so wide for to turn hath more power than what any man mine is the drowning in the sea so wan mine is the prison in the dark coat mine the strangling and hanging by the throat the murmur and the churlish rebelling the groining and the privy poisoning i do vengeance and plain correction 
I dwell in the sign of the lion. Mine is the ruin of the high halls, the falling of the towers and the walls upon the miner or the carpenter. I slew Samson in shaking the pillar. Mine also be the maladies cold, the dark treasons and the castes old. My looking is the father of pestilence. Now weep no more. I shall do diligence that Palamon, that is thine Owen knight, shall have his lady as thou hast him hight. Though Mars shall help his knight, yet nevertheless, betwixt you there must sometime be peace. All be ye not of one complexion, that each day causeth such division. I am thine ale, ready at thy will. Weep now no more, I shall thy lust fulfill. Now will I stinton of the gods above, of Mars and of Venus, goddess of love, and tell you as plainly as I can the great effect for which that I began. Great was the feast in Athens till day, and eke the lusty season of that May made every wight to be in such pleasance that all that Monday jousten they and dance and spend in it in Venus' high service. But by the cause that they should rise early a morrow for to see that fight, unto their rest went they that night. And on the morrow, when the day gan spring, of horse and harness, noise and clattering, there was in the hostelries all about, and to the palace rode there many a rout, of lordes upon steeds and palfreys. There may thou see devising of harness, so uncouth and so rich, and wrought so well, of goldsmithry, of broding and of steel. The shield is bright, the testers and trapeurs, the gold hewn helmets, hauberks, coat armures, lords in paraments on their courses, knights of retinue and eke squires, nailing the spears and helmets buckling, niding of shields with laners lacing, there as need is they were nothing idle the foamy steeds upon the golden bridle, gnawing, and fast the armourers also, with file and hammer picking to and fro. Yeomen on foot, and knaves a many one, with short staves thick as they may gone, pipes, trumpets, necares, and clarions, that in the battle blow bloody sounds, the palace full of people up and down, there three, there ten, holding their question, divining of these Theban knights too. Some said in thus, some said it shall he so, some held in with him with the black beard, some with the bald, some with the thick haired, some said he looked grim and would fight. He had a sparth of twenty pound of weight. Thus was the hall full of divining, long after that the sun gan up spring. The great Theseus, that of his sleep is waked with minstrelsy and noise that was maked, held yet the chamber of his palace rich, till that the Theban nightus both the lich, honoured were, and to the palace fate, Duke Theseus is at a window set, arrayed right as he were a god on a throne the people presseth thitherward full soon him for to see and do him reverence and eke to hearken his hest and his sentence and herald on a scaffold made an o oh, till the noise of the people was ado and when he saw the people of noise all still Thus showed he the duke's mighty will. The Lord hath of his high discretion considered that it were destruction to gentle blood to fighten in the guise of mortal battle now in this emprise. 
wherefore to shape that they shall not die he will his first purpose modify no man therefore on pain of loss or life no manner shot nor pole-axe nor short knife into the lists shall send or thither bring nor short sword for to stick with point biting no man shall draw nor bear it by his side and no man shall unto his fellow ride but one course with a sharp a grounden spear foin if him list on foot himself to wear and he that is at mischief shall be take and not slain but be brought unto the stake that shall be ordained on either side thither he shall by force and there abide and if so fall the chieftain be take on either side or else slay his make no longer then the tourneying shall last god speed you go forth and lay on fast with long sword and with mace fight your fill go now your way this is the lord's will the voice of the people touched the heaven so loud a cried they with merry staven god save such a lord that is so good he willeth no destruction of blood up go the trumpets and the melody and to the listus rode the company by ordinance throughout the city large hanged with cloth of gold and not with sarge full like a lord this noble duke gan ride and these two thebans upon either side and after rode the queen and emily and after them another company of one and other after their degree and thus they passed through that city and to the listus came they by time it was not of the day yet fully prime when set was theseus full rich and high hippolyta the queen and emily and other ladies in their degrees about unto the cetus presseth all the rout and westward through the gates under mart our sight and ache the hundred of his part with banner red is entered right anon and in the self a moment palamon is under venus eastward in the place with banner white and hardy cheer and face in all the world to seeken up and down so even without variation there were such companies never tway for there was none so wise that could say that any had of other advantage of worthiness nor of estate nor age so even were they chosen for to guess and in two ranges fair they them dress when that their names read were every one that in their number guile were there none then when the gates shut and cried was loud do now your devour young knights proud the heralds left their pricking up and down now ring the trumpet loud and clarion there is no more to say but east and west in go the spears sadly in the rest in go the sharper spurs into the side there see me who can joust and who can ride there shiver shafts upon shield is thick he feeleth through the heart a spoon the prick up spring the spears twenty foot on height out go the swords as the silver bright the helm is they to hewn and to shred out burst the blood with stern a stream as red with mighty maces to the bone they to breast he through the thickest of the throng and threst there stumbles steed is strong and down go all he rolleth under foot at doth a ball he foineth on his foe with a truncheon and he him hurleth with his horse adown he through the body hurt is and sith take maugre's head and brought unto the stake as forward was right there he must abide another led is on that other side and sometime doth them theseus to rest 
them to refresh, and drinken if them lest, full oft a day hath the Thebans too together met, and wrought each other woe. Unhorsed hath each other of them tway. There is no tiger in the vale of Galifay. When that her whelp is stole, when it is light, so cruel on the hunter as our sight, for jealous heart upon this Palamon. Nor in Belmarie there is no fell lion that hunted is, or for his hunger would, or for his prey desireth so the blood as Palamon to slay his foe our sight. The jealous strokes upon their helmets abite, out runneth blood on both their sides red. Sometime an end there is of every deed, for ere the sun unto the rest awent, the strong king Emetrius gan hint this Palamon as he fought with our sight, and made his sword deep in his flesh to bite and by the force of twenty is he take unyielding and is drawn unto the stake and in the rescue of this palamon the strong king lycurgus is borne down and king emetrius for all his strength is borne out of his saddle a sword's length so hit him palamon ere he were take but all for naught he was brought to the stake his hardy heart might him help not. He must abide when that he was caught by force, and eke by composition. Who sorroweth now but woeful Palamon, that must no more go again to fight? And when that Theseus had seen that sight, unto the folk that fought thus each one he cried, Ho, no more, for it is done. I will be true judge and not party. Our sight of Thebes shall have Emily, that by his fortune hath her fairly won. Anon there is a noise of people gone for joy of this, so loud and high withal, it seemed that the listes should fall. What can now fair Venus do above? What saith she now? What doth this queen of love but weepeth so, for wanting of her will? till that her tears in the listes fill. She said, I am ashamed, doubtless. Saturnus said, Daughter, hold thy peace. Mars hath his will, his knight hath all his boon, but by mine head thou shalt be eased soon. And the trumpeters with the loud minstrelsy, the heralds that full loud a yell and cry, be in their joy for wail of Dan our sight. But hearken me, and stent noise alight, for what a miracle there befell anon. This fierce our sight hath off his helm a done, and on a courser for to show his face, he pricketh end along the large place looking upward upon this Emily, and she again him cast a friendly eye, for women as to speaken in commune, they follow all the favour of fortune, and was all his in cheer, as his in heart, out of the ground a fire infernal start, from Pluto sent, at request of Saturn, for which his horse for fear began to turn, and leap aside, and founder as he leap, and ere that our sight may take any keep, he pite him on the pummel of his head, that in the place he lay as he were dead, his breast to bursten with his saddle-bow, as black he lay as any coal or crow, so was the blood run into his face. Anon he was borne out of the place with heart sore to Theseus' palace. Then was he carven out of his harness, and in a bed brought full fair and blithe, for he was yet in memory and alive, and always crying after Emily. Duke Theseus, with all his company, is come home to Athens, his city, with all a bliss and a great solemnity. Albeit that this aventure was fall, 
he would not discomfort them all. Then said Eka that Arcite should not die, he should be healed of his malady. And of another thing they were as fain, that of them all was there no one slain. All were they sorely hurt, and namely one that with a spear was thurled his breastbone to other wounds, and to broken arms. Some hadn't salves, some hadn't charms, and pharmacies of herbs and eke salve. They dranken, for they would their lives have, for which this noble duke, as well he can, comforteth and honoureth every man, and made revel all the long night unto the strange lords, as was right. Nor there was holden no discomforting, but as at jousts or at attorneying, forsoothly there was no discomfiture, for falling is not but an adventure, nor to be led by force unto a stake unyielding, and with twenty knights it take one person all alone, without mo, and harried forth by arms, foot, and toe, and eke his steed driven forth with staves, with footmen, both yeomen, and eke knaves, it was arretted him no villainy, there may no man clepen it cowardy. For which anon Duke Theseus let cry, to stenton all a rancor and envy, the gree as well on one side as the other, and either side alike as other's brother, and gave them gifts after their degree, and held a feast fully days three, and conveyed the king is worthily out of his town a journey largely, and home went every man the right away. There was no more but farewell, have good day. Of this battle I will no more indite, but speak of Palamon and of our sight. Swelleth the breast of our sight, and the sore increaseth at his heart more and more the clotted blood for any leechcraft corrupteth and is in his book elaft that neither vain blood nor ventus sing nor drink of herbis may be his helping the virtue expulsive or animal from thilke virtue called natural nor may the venom void nor expel the pipes of his lungs began to swell, and every lay certain his breast adown is shent with venom and corruption. Him gaineth neither for to get his life, vomit upward nor downward laxative, all is to burst in thilke region. Nature hath now no domination, and certainly where nature will not work, farewell physic go bear the man to church this all and some is our sight must die for which he sendeth after emily and palamon that was his cousin dear then said he thus as ye shall after hear naught may the woeful spirit in mine heart Declare one point of all my sorrows smart to you, my lady, that I love the most, but I bequeath the service of my ghost to you above in every creature, since that my life nay may no longer dure. Alas, the woe, alas, the pain is strong that I for you have suffered and so long. Alas, the death, alas, mine Emily, alas, departing of our company. Alas, mine heart is queen, alas, my wife, mine heart is lady, ender of my life. What is this world? What ask men to have, now with his love, now in his colder grave, all one without any company. Farewell, my sweet, farewell, mine Emily. 
and softly take me in your arms tway for love of god and hearken what i say i have here with my cousin palamon had strife and rancor many a day agone for love of you and for my jealousy and jupiter so is my soul agi to speaken of a servant properly with all the circumstances truly that is to say truth honour and knighthead wisdom humblest estate and high kindred freedom and all that longeth to that art so jupiter have of my soul a part as in this world right now i know not one so worthy to be loved as palamon that serveth you and will do all his life and if th that you shall ever be a wife forget not palamon the gentle man and with that word his speech to fail began for from his feet up to his breast was come the cold of death that had him over numb and yet moreover in his arms too the vital strength is lost and all ago only the intellect without more that dwelled in his heart sick and sore gan fail when the heart felt death dusked his eye in two and failed his breath but on his lady yet he cast his eye his last word was mercy emily his spirit changed in house and went to there as i came never i cannot tell where therefore i stint i am no divinister of soul as find i not in this register name me list not the opinions to tell of them though that they written where they dwell our sight is cold there mars his soul a guy now will i speak forth of emily shrieked emily and howled palamon and theseus his sister took anon swooning and bare her from the corpse away what helpeth it to tarry forth the day to tell her how she wept both eve and morrow for in such cases women have such sorrow when that their husbands be from them ego that for the more part they sorrow so or else a fall into such malady that at the last certainly they die infinite be the sorrows and the tears of old folk and folk of tender years in all the town for death of this theban for him there weepeth both child and man so great a weeping was there none certain when hector was abroad all fresh is slain to troy alas the pity that was there scratching of cheeks and rending ache of hair and haddest gold enough and emily no man a man might gladden theseus saving his old father aegeus that knew this world's transmutation as he had seen it changing up and down joy after woe and woe after gladness and shewed him example and likeness right as there died never man quoth he that he ne lived in earth in some degree right so there lived never man he said in all this world that sometime be not died this world is but a thoroughfare full of woe and we be pilgrims passing to and fro death is an end of every worldly sore and over all this said he yet much more to this effect full wisely to exhort the people that they should 
them re-comfort. Duke Theseus, with all his busy cure, casteth about where that the sepulture of good our sight may best make it be, and eke the most honourable in his degree. And at the last he took conclusion that there, as first our sight and Palamon had for love the battle them between, that in that selva grove sweet and green, there, as he had his amorous desires, his complaint, and for love his heart of fires, he would make a fire in which the office of funeral he might all accomplish, and let anon command to hack and hew the oaks old and lay them on a rue in culpons well arrayed for to burn. His officers with swift feet they run, and ride, anon at his commandment. And after this Duke Theseus hath sent after a beer, and it all over spread with cloth of gold, the richest that he had, and of the same suit he clad our sight. Upon his hand as with a glove as white, eke on his head a crown of laurel green, and in his hand a sword full bright and keen. He laid him bare the visage on the bier. Therewith he wept, that pity was to hear. And for the people should see him all, when it was day he brought them to the hall, that roareth of the crying and the sound. Then came this woeful Theban, Palamon, with slottery beard and ruggy ashy hairs, in clothes black, they drop it all with tears, and, passing over, weeping Emily, the ruefulest of all the company. And inasmuch the service should be the more noble and rich in its degree, Duke Theseus set forth three steeds a bring that trapped were in steel all glittering, and covered with the arms of Dan Arsite. Upon these steeds that were great and white there sat a folk, of whom one bare his shield, another his spear in his hand as held, the third bare with him his bow Turkish, of brent gold was the case and harness and ride forth apace with sorrowful cheer toward the grove, as ye shall after hear. The noblest of the Greekest that were there upon their shoulders carried the bier with slack apace, and iron red and wet throughout the city by the master street that spread was all with black and wondrous high Right of the same is all the street awry. Upon the right hand went old Aegeus, and on the other side Duke Theseus, with vessels in their hand of gold full fine, all full of honey, milk, and blood, and wine. Echopalamon, with a great company, and after that came woeful Emily with fire in hand, as was that time the guise, to do the office of funeral service. High labor and full great apparelling was at the service, and the pyre making, that with its green top the heaven wrought, and twenty fathom broad its arms strought, this is to say, the boughs were so broad of straw, first there was laid many a load. But how the pyre was make it up on height, and eke the names how the trees height, as oak, fir, birch, asp, alder, holm, poplar, willow, elm, plain, ash, box, chestnut, lind, laurel, Maple, thorn, beech, hazel, yew, whipple tree, how they were felled shall not be told for me, nor how the goddess ran in up and down, disinherited of their habitation, 
in which they wanted had rest and peace, nymphous fauns and hamadryads, nor how the beasts and the birdies all fledden for fear when the wood gan fall, nor how the ground aghast was of the light that was not wont to see the sun bright, nor how the fire was couched first with straw, and then with dry stickers cloven in three, and then with green wood and spicery, and then with cloth of gold and with perrier, and garlands hanging with full many a flower, the myrrh, the incense, with so sweet odour, nor how Arcita lay among all this, nor what riches about his body is, nor how that Emily, as was the guise, put in the fire of funeral service, nor how she swooned when she made the fire, nor what she spake, nor what was her desire, nor what jewels men in the fire then cast, when that the fire was great and burned fast, nor how some cast their shield and some their spear, and of their vestments which that they wear, and cuppes full of wine and milk and blood into the fire that burnt as it were wood, nor how the Greeks with a huge rout three times ridden all the fire about, upon the left hand with a loud shouting, and thrice with their spears clattering, and thrice how the ladies gan to cry, nor how that lead was homeward, Emily, nor how our sight is burnt to ashes cold, nor how the like wake was a hold. All this night, nor how the Greekers play, the wake plays ne keep I not to say, who wrestled best naked with oil anoint, nor who that bare him best in no disjoint, I will not tell ek how they all are gone home to Athenis when the play is done, but shortly to the point now will I wend, and maken of my long tale an end. By process and by length of certain years, all stinted is the mourning and the tears of Greeks by one general assent. Then seen me there was a parliament at Athens upon certain points and case, among the which pointus is spoken was to have with certain countries alliance and have of Thebans full obeisance for which this noble Theseus anon let send after the gentle Palamon, on wist of him that was the cause and why, but in his black clothes sorrowfully he came at his commandment on high, then sent to Theseus for Emily. When they were set, and hushed was all the place, and Theseus abided had a space, ere any word came from his wise breast, his eyen set he there as was his lest, and with a sad visage he sighed still, and after that right thus he said his will. The first mover of the cause above, when he first made the fair chain of love, great was the effect, and high was his intent, well wist he why, and what thereof he meant. For with that fair chain of love he bond the fire, the air, the water, and the land, in certain bondes, that they may not flee. That same prince and mover eke, quoth he, hath stablished in this wretched world adown certain of days and duration, to all that are engendered in this place, over the which day they may not pace. All may they yet their day as well abridge, there needeth no authority to allege. For it is proved by experience, that, but that me list declare my sentence, that may men by this order well discern, that the mover stable is and etern. 
Well may men know, but that it be a fool, That every part deriveth from its whole. For nature hath not ta'en its beginning Of no party nor cantle of a thing, But of a thing that perfect is and stable, Descending so till it be corruptible. And therefore of his wise purveyance he hath so well beset his ordinance that species of things and progressions shall endure by successions and not etern withouten any lie this mayest thou understand and see at eye lo the oak that hath so long a nourishing from the time that it geneth first to spring and hath so long a life as ye may see yet at the last he wasted is the tree. Consider, Eka, how that the hardest stone under our feet, on which we tread and gone, yet wasteth, as it lieth by the way. The broader river sometime waxes stray, the great town as see we wane and wind. Then may ye see that all things have an end. Of man and woman see we well also, that need us in one of the term is two, that is to say, in youth or else in age, he must be dead, the king as shall a page, some in his bed, some in the deep sea, some in the large field, as ye may see. There helpeth not all go that ilk away. Then may I say that all a thing must die. What maketh this but Jupiter the king, the which is prince and cause of all a thing, converting all unto his proper will, from which it is derived sooth to tell? And here against no creature alive of no degree availeth for to strive. Then is it wisdom, as it thinketh me, to make a virtue of necessity, and take it well that we may not eschew, and namely what to us all is due, and whoso grudgeth aught, he doth folly, and rebel is to him that all may gee, and certainly a man hath most honour to die in his excellence and flower, when he is sicker of his good name, then hath he done his friend nor him no shame. And gladder ought his friend be of his death, When with honour is yielded up his breath, Than when his name appalled is for age, For all forgotten is his vassalage. Then is it best, as for a worthy fame, To die in when a man is best of name. The contrary of all this is wilfulness. Why grudge we? Why have we heaviness? that good our sight of chivalry the flower departed is with duty and honour out of this foul prison of this life why grudge here his cousin and his wife of his welfare that loved him so well can he them thank nay god wot never deal that both his soul and eke themselves offend, And yet they may their lustes not amend. What may I conclude of this long assyri? But after sorrow I read us to be merry, And thank Jupiter for all his grace. And ere that we depart from this place, I read that we make of sorrows too, one perfect joy lasting evermore and look now where most sorrow is herein there will i first amenden and begin sister quoth he this is my full assent with all the vice here of my parliament that gentle palamon your own knight that serveth you with will and heart and might and ever hath since first time ye him knew, That ye shall of your grace upon him rue, And take him for your husband and your lord. Lend me your hand, for this is our accord. 
Let's see now of your womanly pity. He is a king's brother's son, pardie, and though he were a poor bachelor, since he hath served you so many a year, and had for you so great adversity, it must be considered, leaveth me, for gentle mercy oweth to passen right. Then said he thus to Palamon the knight, I trow there needeth little sermoning to make you assent to this thing. Come near, and take your lady by the hand. Betwixt of them was made anon the band that height matrimony or marriage by all the counsel of the baronage. And thus with all a bliss and melody hath Palamon wedded Emily. And God, that all this wide world hath wrought, send him his love, that hath it dearly bought. For now is Palamon in all his will, living in bliss, in riches, and in hell. And Emily him loves so tenderly, and he her serveth all so gently, that never there was word them between of jealousy, nor of none other teen. Thus endeth Palamon and Emily, and God save all this fair company. End of the Knight's Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Miller's Tale. The Prologue. When that the knight had thus his tale told, in all the rout was neither young nor old that he not said it was a noble story, and worthy to be drawn to memory, and namely the gentles every one. Our host then laughed and swore, So may I gone. This goes aright. Unbuckled is the mail. Let's see now who shall tell another tale, for truly this game is well begun. Now telleth ye, Sir Monk, if that ye can, somewhat to quitten with the knight's tale. The miller, that for drunken, was all pale, so that unneths upon his horse he sat, he would availen neither hood nor hat, nor abide no man for his courtesy. But in Pilate's voice he gan to cry, And swore by arms and by blood and bones, I can a noble tale for the nuns, With which I will now quite the knight's tale. Our host saw well how drunk he was of ale, And said, Robin, abide my leave, brother. Some better man shall tell us first another abide and let us work thriftily by god's soul quoth he that will not i for i will speak or else go my way our host answered tell on a devil way thou art a fool thy wit is overcome now hearken, quoth the miller, all and some, for first I make a protestation, that I am drunk, I know it by my sound, and therefore if that I misspeak, or say, white it the ale of Southwark, I you pray, for I will tell a legend and a life both of a carpenter and of his wife, how that a clerk hath set the right's cap. The reeve answered and said, Stint thy clap. Let be thy lewd drunken harlotry. 
it is a sin, and eke a great folly to appear in any man, or him defame, and eke to bring wives in evil name. Thou mayest enough of other things sayen. This drunken miller spake full swoon again, and said, Leave brother Oswald, who hath no wife, he is no cuckold. But I say not therefore that thou art one. There be full good wives, many one. Why art thou angry with my tale now? I have a wife, pardy, as well as thou. Yet an old I, for the oxen in my plough, taken upon me more than enough, to demon of myself that I am one, I will believe well that I am none. An husband should not be inquisitive of God's privity, nor of his wife, so he may find God's foison there, of the remnant needeth not to inquire. What should I more say, but that this miller, he would his words for no man forbear, but told his churlish tale in his manner, me thinketh that I shall rehearse it here. And therefore every gentle wight, I pray, for God's love, to deem not that I say of evil intent, but that I must rehearse their tales all, be they better or worse or else falsen some of my matir, and therefore whoso list it not to hear, turn o'er the leaf, and choose another tale, for he shall find enough, both great and smale, of storial thing that toucheth gentleness, and eke morality and holiness. Blame not me if that ye choose amiss. The miller is a churl, ye know well this, so was the reeve, with many other mo, and harlotry they told both too. Avise you now, and put me out of blame, and eke men should not make earnest of game. THE TALE Willem there was dwelling in Oxenford a rich nof that guests held to board, and of his craft he was a carpenter. With him there was dwelling a poor scholar, had learned art, but all his fantasy was turned to learn astrology. He could a certain of conclusions to deem by interrogations, if that men asked him in certain hours, when that men should have drought or else showers, or if men asked him what should fall of everything, I may not reckon all. This clerk was called Hendy Nichols. Of Dern love he knew, and of solace, and therewith he was sly and full privy, and like a maiden meek for to see. A chamber had he in that hostelry, alone withouten any company. Full fetisly I dight with herbs swoot, and he himself was sweet as is the root of licorice or any set a wall. His almagest and books great and small, his astrolabe, belonging to his art, his ogrim stones laid fair apart, on shelves couched at his bed's head, his pressy covered with a folding red, and all above there lay a gay psaltery, on which he made at night's melody, so sweetly the chamber rang. And Angelus ad virginum he sang, and after that he sung the king's note, full often blessed was his merry throat, and thus this sweet clerk his time spent, after his friend's finding and his rent. This carpenter 
had wedded new a wife, which that he loved more than his life. Of eighteen year I guess she was of age. Jealous he was, and held her narrow in cage, for she was wild and young, and he was old, and deemed himself belike a cuckold. He knew not Cato, for his wit was rude, that bade a man wed his similitude. Men should wedden after their estate, for youth and eld are often at debate. But since that he was fallen in the snare, he must endure as other folk his care. Fair was this young wife, and therewithal as any weasel her body gent and small. A saint she weared, barred all of silk, a barm cloth eke as white as morning milk upon her lens full of many a gore white was her smock and broidered all before and eke behind on her collar about of coal black silk within and eke without the tapes of her white volupere were of the same suit of her colour, her fillet broad of silk, and set full high, and sickerly she had a lycoris eye. Full small it pulled were her brows too, and they were bent and black as any slow. She was well more blissful on to see than is the new pergenet tree, and softer than the wool is of a weather, and by her girdle hung a purse of leather tasselled with silk and pearled with laton. In all this world, to seeken up and down, there is no man so wise that could thench so gay a populot or such a wench. Full brighter was the shining of her hue than in the tower the noble forged knew. But of her song it was as loud and yearn as any swallow chittering on a burn. There too she could skip and make a game as any kid or calf following his dame. Her mouth was sweet as bracket, or as meath, or hoard of apples laid in hay or heath. Wincing she was as is a jolly colt, long as a mast, and upright as a bolt. A brooch she bare upon her low collar, as broad as is the boss of a buckler, her shoon were laced on her legs high. She was a primarole, a pig is nigh. For any lord to have ligging in his bed, or yet for any good yeoman to wed. Now, sir, and eft, sir, so befell the case, that on a day this Hendy Nicholas fell with this young wife to rage and play, while that her husband was at Ossene. As clerks be full subtle and full quaint, and privily he caught her by the quaint, and said, I wis but if I have my will, for dern love of thee, the man I spill, and held her fast by the haunch bones, and said, Lemon, love me well at once, or I will die, and also God me save. 
and she sprang as a colt doth in the trave, and with her head she writhed fast away, and said, I will not kiss thee by my fay. Why, let be, quoth she, let be, Nicholas, or I will cry out hero and alas. Do away your hands for your courtesy. This Nicholas gan mercy for to cry, and spake so fair, and proffered him so fast, that she her love him granted at the last, and swore her oath by St. Thomas of Kent, that she would be at his commandment, when that she may her leisure well espy. My husband is so full of jealousy, That but ye wait well, and be privy, I wot right well I am but dead, quoth she. Ye must be full dern as in this case. Nay, thereof, care thee not, quoth Nicholas. A clerk had litherly beset his wile, But if he could a carpenter beguile. And thus they were accorded and sworn To wait a time, as I have said before, When Nicholas had done thus every deal, And thwacked her about the lens well, He kissed her sweet and taketh his psaltery, and playeth fast, and maketh melody. Then fell it thus, that to the parish church of Christ's own works for to work, this good wife went upon a holy day. Her forehead shone as bright as any day, so was it washen when she left her work. Now was there of that church a parish clerk, the witch that was yclept Absalon. Curled was his hair, and as the gold it shone, And strutted as a fan, large and broad, Full straight, and even lay his jolly shod. His road was red, his iron gray as goose, With Paul's windows carven on his shoes, In hosen red, he went full fettisly. He clad he was full small and properly, All in a kirtle of light wadget. And thereupon he had a gay surplice, As white as is the blossom on the rise. A merry child he was, so God me save, Well could he letten blood, and clip, and shave, And make a charter of land and acquittance, in twenty manners could he trip and dance after the school of Oxenford, though, and with his legs cast to and fro and playin songs on a small rebible. Thereto he sung sometimes a loud quinible, and as well could he play on a guitern. In all the town was brewhouse nor tavern That he not visited with his solas. There, as that any garnard tapstair was, But sooth to say, he was some deal squamous, Of farting and of speech dangerous. This Absalom that jolly was and gay, went with a censer on the holy day, sensing the wives of the parish fast, and many a lovely look he on them cast, and namely on this carpenter's wife, to look on her him thought a merry life. She was so proper and sweet and likerous, I dare well say, if she had been a mouse, and he a cat, he would her hent anon, This parish clerk, this jolly Absalon. 
hath in his heart such a love longing, that of no wife took he none offering, for courtesy he said he would none. The moon at night full clear and bright shone, and Absalom his guitar hath he taken, for paramours he thought for to waken, and forth he went, jolliff and amorous, till he came to the carpenter's house, a little after the cock had he crow, and dressed him under a shot window that was upon the carpenter's wall. He singeth in his voice gentle and small. Now, dear lady, if thy will be, I pray that ye will rue on me. Full well accordant to his guiterning, this carpenter awoke and heard him sing, and spake unto his wife, and said anon, What, Alison, hearest thou not Absalom that chanteth thus under our bower wall? And she answered her husband there withal, Yes, God wot, John, I hear him every deal. This passeth forth, what will ye bet than well? For day to day this jolly Absalom so wooeth her, that him is woe begone. He waketh all the night and all the dale to comb his locks broad and make him gay. He wooeth her by means and by brocage, and swore he would be her own page. He singeth brocking as a nightingale, he sent her piment, mead, and spiced ale, and wafers piping hot out of the gleed, and for she was of town he proffered mead. For some folk will be wanen for richness, and some for strokes, and some with gentleness. Sometimes to show his lightness and mastery, he playeth Herod on a scaffold high. But what availeth him as in this case? So loveth she the hendy Nicholas, that Absalom may blow the buck's horn. He had for all his labour but a scorn, and thus she maketh Absalom her ape, and all his earnest turneth to a jape. Forsooth is this proverb, it is no lie. Men say right thus alway, the nigh sly, maketh oft time the far leaf to be loth. For though that Absalom be wood or wroth, because that he far was from her sight, this nigh Nicholas stood still in his light. Now bear thee well, thou hendy Nicholas, for Absalom may wail and sing, alas! And so befell that on a Saturday this carpenter had gone to Osenay, and hendy Nicholas and Alison accorded were to this conclusion, that Nicholas shall shape him a while, the silly, jealous husband to beguile, and if so were the game went aright, she should sleepen in his arms all night, for this was her desire and his also. And right anon, without words mo, this Nicholas no longer would he tarry, but doth full soft unto his chamber carry both meat and drink for a day or tway, and to her husband bade her for to say, If that he asked after Nicholas, she should say, She wist not where he was. Of all the day she saw him not with eye, She trowed he was in some malady. For no cry that her maiden could him call, He would answer, for naught that might befall. Thus passed forth all filk Saturday, that Nicholas still in his chamber lay, and ate and slept, and did what him list, till Sunday that the sun went to rest. 
this silly carpenter had great marvail of Nicholas, or what thing might him ail, and said, I am a drad by St. Thomas, it standeth not aright with Nicholas. God shield that he died suddenly, this world is now full fickle sickerly. I saw to-day a corpse born to church, that now on Monday last I saw him worch. Go up, quod he unto his knave, anon clep at his door, or knock with a stone. Look how it is, and tell me boldly. This knave went him up full sturdily, and at the chamber door, while that he stood, he cried and knocked, as that he were wood. What how? What do ye, Master Nikolai? How may ye sleep in all the long day? But all for naught, he heard not a word, and whole he found full low upon the board, whereas the cat was wont in for to creep and at that hole he looked in full deep, and at the last he had of him a sight. This Nicholas sat ever gaping upright, for he had kiked on the new moon. Adown he went and told his master soon in what array he saw this ilk man. This carpenter to blissen him began, and said, now help us, Saint Frideswide, a man what little what shall him betide. This man is fallen with his astronomy into some woodness or some agony. I thought I well how that it should be. Men should know not of God's privity. Yea, Blessed be alway a lewed man, That not but only his believe can. So farred another clerk with astronomy, He walked in the fields for to pry Upon the stars what there should befall, Till he was in a moral pity fall. He saw not that, but yet by St. Thomas, me rueth sore of Handy Nicholas. He shall be rated of his studying, if that I may, by Jesus, heaven's king, get me a staff that I may underspore, while that thou, Robin, heavest off the door. He shall out of his studying, as I guess and to the chamber door he gan him dress. His knave was a strong carl for the nonce, and by the hasp he heaved it off at once. Into the floor the door fell down anon. This Nicholas sat aye as still as stone, and ever he gaped upward into the air. The carpenter weaned he were in despair, and hent him by the shoulders mightily, and shook him hard, and cried spitously, What, Nicholas? What how, man? Look adown! Awake, and think on Christ's passion. I crouch thee from elves and from whites. Therewith the night spell he said he anon writes, and the four halves of the house about, and on the threshold of the door without, Lord Jesus Christ and Saint Benedict, bless this house from every wicked wight, from the night mare, the white pater noster, where wonnest thou now, Saint Peter's sister? And at the last, this hendy Nicholas gan for to sigh full sore, and said, Alas, shall all time world be lost eftsoons now? This carpenter answered, 
what sayest thou? What? Think on God, as we do, men that swink. This Nicholas answered, Fetch me a drink, and after will I speak in privity of certain thing that toucheth thee and me. I will tell it to no other man certain. This carpenter went down and came again, and brought of mighty ale a large quart, and when that each of them had drunk his part, this Nicholas his chamber door fast shut, and down the carpenter by him he set, and said, John, mine host full leaf and dear, thou shalt upon thy truth swear me here, that to no wight thou shalt my counsel ray, for it is Christ's counsel that I say, and if thou tell it, man, thou art forlorn, for this vengeance thou shalt have therefore, that if thou ray me, thou shalt be wood. Nay, Christ forbid it for his holy blood, quoth then this silly man, I am no blab, nor though I say it am I leaf to gab. Say what thou wilt, I shall it never tell to child or wife by him that harried hell. Now, John, quoth Nicholas, I will not lie. I have, if found in my astrology, as I have looked in the moon bright, that now on Monday next quarter night shall fall a rain, and that so wild and wood, that never half so great as Noah's flood. This world, he said, in less than half an hour shall all be drained. So hideous is the shower. Thus shall mankind drench and lose their life. This carpenter answered, Alas, my wife, and shall she drench? Alas, my Alison! For sorrow of this he fell almost adown, and said, Is there no remedy in this case? Why, yes, for God! Quoth Hendy Nicholas, If thou wilt worken after lore and red, Thou mayest not worken after thine own head. For thus saith Solomon, That was full true, Work all by counsel, And thou shalt not rue. And if thou work wilt by good counsel, I undertake without mast or sail, Yet shall I save her, And thee and me. Hast thou not heard how saved was Noah, when that our Lord had warned him before, that all the world with water should be lorn? Yes, quoth this carpenter, full year ago. Hast thou not heard, quoth Nicholas, also the sorrow of Noah, that his fellowship, that he had ere he got his wife to ship? Him had been lever, I dare well undertake, at thilk time than all his weathers black, that she had had a ship herself alone. And therefore knowest thou what is best to be done? This asketh haste, and of an hasty thing men may not preach or make tarrying, anon go get us fast into this inn, a kneading trough, or else a kemelin, for each of us. But look that they be large, in which we shall swim as in a barge, and have therein vitile sufficient but for one day, fie on the remnant, the water shall a slake and go away, About prime upon the next day. But Robin may not know of this thy knave, Nor eke thy maiden gill I may not save. Ask me not why, 
for though thou ask me, I will not tell God's privity. Sufficeth thee, but if thy wit be mad, to have as great a grace as Noah had, thy wife shall I well saven out of doubt. Go now thy way, and speed thee hereabout. But when thou hast for her and thee and me I gotten us these kneading tubs three, then shalt thou hang them in the roof full high, so that no man our purveyance espy. And when thou hast done thus, as I have said, and hast our vitail fair in them laid, and eke an axe to smite the cord in two, when that the water comes, that we may go and break an ole on high upon the gable, into the garden word over the stable, that we may freely pass forth our way when that great shower is gone away, then shalt thou swim as merry I undertake, as doth the white duck after her drake. Then will I clep. How Alison, how John, be merry, for the flood will pass anon, and thou wilt say, Hail, Master Nicolay, Good morrow, I see thee well, for it is day, and then shall we be lords all our life of all the world as Noah and his wife. But of one thing I warn thee full right, be well advised on that Ilka night, when we be entered into ship's board, that none of us not speak a single word, nor clip, nor cry, but be in his prayer, for that is God's own hest, dear. Thy wife and thou must hang in far atween, for that betwixt you shall be no sin, no more in looking than there shall indeed. This ordinance is said, Go, God, thee speed, to-morrow night, when men be all asleep in our kneading tubs, we will creep and sit there, abiding God's grace. Go now thy way, I have no longer space to make of this no longer sermoning. Men say thus, send the wise and say nothing. Thou art so wise, it needeth thee not teach. Go, save our lives, and that I thee beseech. This silly carpenter went forth his way. Full oft he said, Alas, and well a day. And to his wife he told his privity, And she was where and better knew than he What all this quaint cast was for to say. But nay the less she feared as she would day, And said, Alas, go forth thy way anon, help us to scape, or we be dead, each one. I am thy true and very wedded wife, go, dear spouse, and help to save our life. Lo, what a great thing is affection! Men may die of imagination, so deeply may impression be take. This silly carpenter begins to quake. He thinketh verily that he may see this new flood come weltering as the sea to drench in Alison his honey dear. He weepeth, waileth, maketh sorry cheer. He sigheth, 
with full many a sorry sow. He goeth and getteth him a kneading trough, and after that a tub and a kemelin, and privily he sent them to his inn, and hung them in the roof full privily. With his own hand then made he ladders three to climb by the ranges and the stalks upon the tubs hanging in the bulks, and victualled them, kemelin, trough, and tub, with bread and cheese and good ale in a jub, sufficing right enough as for a day. But ere that he had made all this array, he sent his knave, and eke his wench also, upon his need to London for to go, and on the Monday when it drew to night he shut his door without candlelight, and dressed everything as it should be. And shortly up they climbed, all the three. They sat still well a furlong way. Now, Pater Noster, clum, said Nicolay, and clum, quoth John, and clum, said Alison. This carpenter said his devotion, and still he sat and bided his prayer, awaking on the rain if he it hear. The dead sleep, for weary business, fell on this carpenter right as I guess, about the curfew time, or little more. For travail of his ghost he groaned sore, and eft he routed, for his head mislay. Adown the latter stalked Nicolay, and Alison, full soft adown she sped, without words more, they went to bed. There, as the carpenter was wont to lie, there was the revel and the melody. And thus lay Alison and Nicholas in business of mirth and in solace, until the bell of lauds gone to ring, and friars in the chancel went to sing. This parish clerk, this amorous Absalon, That is for love alway so woe begone, Upon the Monday was at Osine, With company him to disport and play, And asked upon a cass a cloisterer, Full privily after John the carpenter. And he drew him apart out of the church, And said, I not, I saw him not here work, since Saturday, I trow that he be went for timber, where our abbot hath him sent, and dwellen at the grange a day or two, for he is wont for timber for to go, or else he is at his own house certain, where that he be I cannot soothly sain. This Absalom full jolly was, and light, and thought, Now is the time to wake all night. For sickerly I saw him not stirring about his door since day began to spring. So may I thrive, but I shall at cock-crow full privily go knock at his window that stands full low upon his bower wall. To Alison then will I tell in all my love-longing, for I shall not miss that at the least way I shall her kiss. Some manner comfort shall I have, parfait. My mouth hath itched all this live-long day, that is a sign of kissing at the least. All night I met, eke I was at a feast. Therefore I will go sleep an hour or tway, and all the night then will I wake and play. When that the first cock crowed had, anon up rose this jolly lover Absalon, and he arrayed gay at point devise. But first he chewed grains and liquorize to smell sweet ere he had combed his hair. Under his tongue a true love he bare, For thereby thought he to be gracious. 
Then came he to the carpenter's house, and still he stood under the shot window, unto his breast it wrought. It was so low, and soft he coughed with a semi-son. What do ye, honeycomb, sweet Alison, my fair bird, my sweet cinnamon? Awaken, lemon mine, and speak to me. Full little think ye upon my woe, that for your love I sweat there as I go. No wonder is that I do swelt and sweat. I mourn as doth a lamb after the teat. I whistle, man, I have such love-longing, that like a turtle true is my mourning. I may not eat no more than a maid. Go from the window, thou jack-fool, she said. As help me, God, it will not be. Come, bar me. I love another, else I were to blame. Well, better than thee, by Jesus, Absalom, go forth thy way, or I will cast a stone, and let me sleep a twenty devil way. Alas, quoth Absalom, and well away, that true love ever was so ill beset then kiss me since it may be no bet for jesus love and for the love of me wilt thou then go thy way therewith quoth she yea certes le man quoth this absalon then make thee ready quoth she i come anon and unto Nicholas she said, full still, Now, peace, and thou shalt laugh anon thy fill. This Absalom down set him on his knees, and said, I am a lord at all degrees, For after this I hope there cometh more. Lemon, thy grace, and sweet bird, thine oar. The window she undid, and that in haste. Have done, quoth she. Come off and speed thee fast, lest that our neighbours should thee espy. Then Absalom gan wipe his mouth full dry. Dark was the night, as pitch or as the coal, and at the window she put out her hole, and Absalom him fell na bet na worse. But with his mouth he kissed her naked arse, full savourly. When he was ware of this, aback he start, and thought it was amiss. For well he wist, a woman hath no beard. He felt a thing all rough and long he haired, and said, Fie! Alas, what have I do? Tee-hee, quoth she, and clapped to the window too, and Absalom went forth at sorry pace. A beard, a beard, said Handy Nicholas. By God's corpus this game went fair and well. This silly Absalom heard every deal, and on his lip he gan for anger bite, and to himself he said, I shall thee quite. He rubbeth now, who frotteth now his lips, With dust, with sand, with straw, with cloth, with chips. But Absalom, that saith full oft, Alas, my soul betake I unto Sathanas, But me were liever than all this town. Quoth he, I this despite a rockin' for to be. Alas, alas, that I have been I blent. His hot love is cold, and all equent. For from that time that he had kissed her arse, Of paramours 
he set not a carse. For he was healed of his malady, Full often paramours he gan defy, And weep as doth a child that hath been beat. A soft pace he went over the street, Unto a smith, men callen Dan Garvis, That in his forge smithed plough harness, He sharped share and culter busily, This Absalom knocked all easily, And said, Undo, Garvis, and that anon. What? Who art thou? It is I, Absalom. What? Absalom, what? Christ, sweet tree, why rise so wrath? Hey, Benedicite, what aileth you? Some gay girl, God it wot, hath brought you thus upon the vire tote. By Saint Neot, ye wot well what I mean. This Absalom he wrought not a bean. Of all his play no word again he gaff, For he had more tau on his distaff Than Garvis knew, and said, Friend so dear, that hot culter in the chimney here Lend it to me, I have therewith to don. I will it bring again to thee full soon. Garvis answered, Certs, were it gold, or in a poke, nobles all untold, thou shouldst it have, as I am a true smith. Nay, Christ's foot, what will ye do therewith? Thereof, quoth Absalom, be as be may, I shall well tell it thee another day. And caught the culter by the cold steel, Full soft out at the door he gan to steal, And went unto the carpenter's wall. He coughed first, and knocked there withal Upon the window, light as he did air. This Alison answered, Who is there that knocketh so? I warrant him a thief. Nay, nay, quoth he, God wot my sweet lef, I am thine Absalom, my own darling of gold, quoth he, I have thee brought a ring, my mother gave it me, so God me save, full fine it is, and thereto may ye grave, this will I give to thee, if thou me kiss. Now Nicholas was risen up to piss, and thought he would amenden all the jape, he should kiss his arse, ere that he scape, and up the window did he hastily, and out his arse he put full privily over the buttock to the haunch bone, and therewith spake this clerk, this Absalom. Speak, sweet bird, I know not where thou art. This Nicholas anon let fly a fart, as great as it had been a thunder dent that with the stroke he was well nigh e blent. But he was ready with his iron hot, and Nicholas amid the arse he smote. Off went the skin and hand-breadth all about, the whole culter burned so his tout, that for the smart he weaned he would die, as he were wood for woe, he gan to cry, Help! Water! Water! Help for God's heart! This carpenter, out of his slumber start, and heard one cry, Water! As he were wood, and thought, Alas, now cometh Noah's flood! He sat him up without words mo, and with his axe he smote the cord in two, and down went all. He found neither to sell, nor bread, nor ale, till he came to the cell, upon the floor, and there in swoon he lay. Up started Alison and Nicolay, and cried out, A harrow in the street, the neighbors all, both small and great, in ran for to garn on this man, 
that yet in swoon lay both pale and wan, for with the fall he broken had his arm, but stand he must unto his own harm, for when he spake he was anon borne down with Hendy Nicholas and Allison. They told to every man that he was wood. He was aghast, so of Noah's flood, through fantasy that of his vanity, he had bought him kneading tubs three, and had them hanged in the roof above, and that he prayed them for God's love to sit in the roof for company. The folk gan laughin' at his fantasy. Into the roof they kiken and they gape, and turned all his harm into a jape. For whatsoe'er this carpenter answered, it was for naught. No man his reason heard. With oaths great he was so sworn adown that he was holden wood in all the town. For every clerk anon right held with other, they said, The man was wood, my leave, brother, and every white gun laughin at his strife. Thus swived was the carpenter's wife, for all his keeping and his jealousy, and Absalom hath kissed her nether eye, and Nicholas is scalded in the tout. This tale is done, and God save all the rout. End of the Miller's Tale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poem by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalogue page of the Canterbury Tales. The Reeves Tale The Prologue When folk had laughed all at this nice case of Absalon and Hendy Nicholas, diverse folk, diversely, they said, but for the more part they laughed and played. And at this tale I saw no man him grieve, but it were only Oswald the reeve, because he was of carpenter's craft, and little ire is in his heart to laugh. He gan to grudge, and blamed it alight. So the eye, quoth he, full well could I him quite, with blearing of a proudy miller's eye, if that me list to speak of ribble dry. But I am old, me list not play for age, Grass time is done, my fodder is now forage. This white atop writeth mine older years, Mine heart is also moulded as mine hairs, And I do fare as doth an open erse, That ilke fruit is ever longer worse. Till it be rotten in mullock or in stray, We older men I dread so far away. Till we be rotten, can we not be ripe? We hop away, while that the world will pipe. For in our will there stricketh eye and nail To have a hoary head and a green tail, As hath a leek. For though our might be gone, Our will desireth folly ever in one. For when we may not do, then will we speak. Yet in our ashes cold does fire reek. Four gleeds have we which I shall devise, Vaunting and lying, anger covetise. These four sparks belonging unto eld, Our older limbers well may be unwelled. But will shall never fail us, and that is sooth, And yet have I always a colter's tooth, As many a year as it is past and gone, Since that my tap of life began to run. For sickly when I was born anon, Death drew the tap of life and let it gone, And ever since hath so the tap be run, Till that almost all empty is the tun. The stream of life now droppeth on the chime, the silly tongue may well ring and chime of wretchedness that passed is full yore. With oldy folk, save dotage, is no more. When that our host had heard this sermoning, he gan to speak as lordly as a king, and said, To what amounteth all this wit? What? Shall we speak all day of holy writ? 
The devil made a reeve for to preach, as of a suitor, a shipman, or a leech. Say forth thy tale, and tarry not the time. Lo, here is Detford, and his half-past prime, lo, Greenwich, where many a shrew is in. It were high time thy tale to begin. Now, sirs, quoth then this Oswald the reeve, I pray you all that none of you do grieve, though I answer and somewhat set his hove, for lawful is force off with force to shove. This drunken miller hath he told us here, how that beguiled was a carpenter. Paraventure in scorn, for I am one, and, by your leave, I shall him quite anon. Right in his churlish term is will I speak. I pray to God his neck might to break. He can well in mine eye see a stalk, but in his own he cannot see a bork. End of prologue to the Reeve's Tale The Reeve's Tale At Trompington, not far from Canterbridge, there goes a brick, and over that bridge, upon the which brook, there stands a mill. And this is very sooth that I you tell. A miller was there dwelling many a day, as any peacock he was proud and gay. Pipen he could, and fish, and net his beat, and turn cups, and wrestle well, and sheet. I by his belt he bar a long pavada, and of his sword full trenchant was the blade. A jolly popper bare he in his pouch, there was no man for peril durst him touch. A Sheffield whittle bare he in his hose, round was his face, and Camus was his nose. As pill as an ape's was his skull, he was a market-beater at the full. There durst no wicht a hand upon him legger, that he ne swore anon he should a beggar. A thief he was, for sorth of corn and meal, and that a sly and used well to steal. His name was Hotten Dana Simican. A wife he had, come of noble kin, the parson of the town her father was. With her he gave full many a pan of brass, for that Simkin should in his blood a lie, she was fostered in a nunnery. For Simkin would in no wife, as he said, but she were well nourished and a maid, to save in his estate and yeomanry, and she was proud and pert as is a pie. A full fair sight it was to see them too, on holy days before her he would go with his tippet he bound about his head, and she came after in a sheet of red, and Simkin had a hosen of the same. There durst her no wish to call her ocht but dame, none was so hardy walking by that way, that with her either durst a raja or play. But if he would be slain by Simikin, with pavada, or with knife, or bodikin, for jealous folk be perilous evermore. Algate, they would their wives wend her so, and eke, for she was somewhat smutterlish, she was as dignant as water in a ditch, and so full of hocker and bismere, her thought that a lady should her spare her, for her kindred and her notel rai, that she had learned in the nunnery. One daughter had a they betwixt them two, of twenty year, withouten any mo, saying that a child was of half-year age, in cradle it lay, and was a proper page. This wench thick and welly grown was, with camusa nose and iron grey as glass, with buttocks broad and breasters round and high, but right fair was her hair, I will not lie. The parson of the town, for she was fair, in purpose was to make of her his hair, both of his chattels and his messuage, and strange he made it of her marriage. His purpose was for to bestow her high in some worthy blood of ancestry, for holy church's good may be dispended on holy church's blood that is descended. Therefore he would his holy blood honour, though that he her holy church ye would devour. Great soaken hath this miller, out of doubt, with wheat and malt of all the land about, and namely there was a great college, men called the Solar Hall at Canterbridge. There was their wheat and eke their malty ground, and on a day it happed in a stound, sick lay the manciple of a malady, men weened wisely that he should die for which this miller stole both meal and corn an hundred times more than before, and heretofore he stole but courteously, but now he was a thief outrageously, for which the warden chid and made far, but thereof set the miller not a tar. He cracked his boast, and swore it was not so. Then there were a younger, poorer scholars, too, that dwelled in the hall of which I say, testy if they were, and lusty for to play, 
and only for their mirth and revelry upon the warden busily they cry, they gave him leave, for but a little stound, to go to mill and see their corn aground. And hardily they durst lay their neck, the miller should not steal them half a peck of corn by slight, nor them by force bereave, and at the last the warden gave them leave. John hight the one, and Alain hight the other. Of one town were they born, that hight a strother. Far in the north, I cannot tell you where, this Alain he made ready all his gear, and on a horse the sack he cast anon. Forth went Alain the clerk, and also John, with good sword, and with buckler by their side. John knew the way, him needed not no guide, and at the mill the sack adown he layeth. A line spake first, All hail, Simon, in faith, how fares thy fair daughter and thy wife? A line welcome, quoth Simkin, by my life, and John also, how now, what do you hear? By God, Simon, quoth John, need has no peer, him serve himself behoves that has no swain, or else he is a fool, as Clark is saying. Our manciple, I hope, he will be dead. So work as I, the wange is in his head, and therefore is I come and eke a line to grind our corn and carry it home again. I pray you speed us hence as well ye may. It shall be done, quoth Simkin, by my fay. What will ye do while that is in hand? By God, right by the hopper will I stand, quoth John, and see how the corn goes in. Yet saw I never by my father's kin how that hopper waggers to and fro. A line answered, John, and wilt thou so? Then will I be beneath by my crown, and see how that the meal falls adown into the trough that shall be my disport. For, John, in faith I may be of your sort, I is as ill a miller as is ye. This miller smiled at their nicety, and thought, All this is done but for a while. They weenen that no man may them beguile, but by my thrift yet shall I blear their eye. For all the slight in their philosophy, the more quaint a knackers that they make, the more will I steal when that I take, instead of yet flour, yet will I give them bren. The greatest clerks are not the wisest men. As Willem to the wolf thus spake the mayor, of all their art ne count I not a tear. Out at the door he went full privily, when that he saw his time softly, he looked up and down until he found the clerker's horse, there as he stood he bound behind the mill, under a leavesel, and to the horse he went him fair and well, and stripped off the bridle right anon. And when the horse was loose, he gan to gone towards the fen, where wild mares run, forth with wahi through thick and eke through thin. This miller went again, no word he said, but did his note, and with these clerks played, till that their corn was fair and well he ground. And when the meal was sacked and he bound, then John went out, and found his horse away, and gan to cry, Haroo, and well away. Our horse is lost, a line for God's bones. Step on thy feet, come off, man, all at once. Alas, our warden has his palfrey lawn. This a line all forgot, both meal and corn. All was out of his mind, his husbandry. What? Which way is he gone? he gan to cry. The wife came leaping inward at a wren, and said, Alas, your horse went to the fen, with wild mares as fast as he could go. Unthank came on his hand that bound him so, and his that better should have knit the rein. Alas, quoth John, a line for Christus' pain, lay down thy sword, and I shall mine also. I is full wished, God wait, as is a row. By God's soul he shall not escape us bathe. Why and had thou put the capel in the lathe? Ill hail, a line, by God thou is a fawn. These silly clerks have full fast y run toward the fen, both a line and eke John, and when the miller saw that they were gone, he half a bushel of their flour did take, and bade his wife go knead it in a cake. He said, I trow the clerk is where afeard, yet can a miller make a clerk's beard, for all his art, yea, let them go their way. Lo, where they go, yea, let the children play. They get him not so lightly by my crown. The silly clerk is runnin' up and down with keep, keep, stand, stand, yossa wadarera, go whistle thou, and I shall keep him here. But shortly, till that it was very night, they could a not, though they did with all their might, their capel catch, he ran away so fast, till in a ditch they caught him at the last. Weary and wet as beasties in the rain, 
comes silly John, and with him comes Elaine. Alas, quoth John, the day that I was born, now we are driven till heathing and till scorn. Our corn is stolen, men will us fonners call, both the warden and eke our fellows all, and Nemily the miller well away. Thus plain John, and as he went by the way toward the mill, and byard in his hand, the miller sitting by the fire he found, for it was night, and for the might they not. But for the love of God they him besought of herborow and ease for their penny. The miller said again, If there be any such as it is, yet shall ye have your part. Mine house is straight, but ye have learned art, ye can by arguments make in a place a mile broad of twenty foot of space. Let's see, now, if this place may suffice, or make it room with speech, as is your guise. Now, Simon, said this John, by Saint Cuthbert, I is thou merry, and that is fair answered. I have heard say, men shall take of two things, such as he finds, or such as he brings, but specially I pray thee, hoster dear, gar us, have meat, and drink, and make us cheer, and we shall pay thee truly at the full, with empty hand men may not hawk as toll, lo, here our silver ready for to spend. This miller to the town his daughter send, for ale and bread, and roasted them a goose, and bound their horse he should no more go loose, and them in his own chamber made a bed, with sheets and with shallons fairy spread, not from his own bed ten foot or twelve, his daughter had a bed all by herself, right in the same chamber, by and by. It might no better be, and cause a why, there was no room a heberow in the place. They suppen, and they speaken of solace, and drink an ever strong ale at the best. About a midnight went they all to rest. Well had this miller varnished his head. Full pale he was, fore-drunken and naught red. He yoxed, and he spake through the nose, as were he in the quacker or in the pose. To bed he went, and with him went his wife, as any jay she light was and jolliffe. So was her jolly whistle welly wet. The cradle at her bed's feet was set, to rock, and eke to give the child to suck. And when that drunken was, all in the crock, to bed went the daughter right anon, to bed went Elaine, and also John. There was no more, needed them no dwell. This miller had so wisely but ale, that as a horse he snorted in his sleep, nor of his tail behind he took no keep. His wife bare him a burden full strong. Men might their routing here in a furlong. The wench routed eke for company. A line the clerk that heard this melody, he poked John and said, Sleepest thou? Heardest thou ever such a song ere now? Lo, what a compline is he mail them all! A wilder fire upon their bodies fall! Who hearkened ever heard such a fairly thing? Yea, they shall have the flower of ill ending. This longer night their tiders me no rest, but yet no force all shall me for the best. For John, said he, as ever may I thrive, if that I may yon wench, will I swive. Some easement has lawry shapen us, for John there is a law that saith thus, that if a man in one point he aggrieved, that in another he shall be relieved. Our corn is stolen, soothly it is no nay, and we have had an evil fit to-day, and since I shall have none amendment against my loss, I will have easement. By God a soul it shall none other be. This John answered, A line, avise thee, the miller is a perilous man, he said, and if he that out of his sleep abrade, he might do us both a villainy. A line answered, I count him not a fly, and up he rose, and by the wench he crept. This wench lay upright, and fast she slept, till he so nigh was, ere she might espy, that it had been too late for to cry. And shortly for to say, they were at one. Now play a line, for I will speak of John. This John lay still a furlong way or two, and to himself he made ruth and woe. Alas, quoth he, this is a wicked jape. Now may I say, that I is but an ape. Yet has my fellow somewhat for his harm, he has the miller's daughter in his arm. He answered him, and hath his needers sped, and I lie as a draught-sack on my bed. And when this jape is told another day, I shall be held a daff or a cockenay. I will arise and answer it by my fay. Hardy is unsully, as men say. And up he rose, and softly he went, unto the cradle, and in his hand it hent, and bare it soft unto his bedder's feet. 
Soon after this the wife her routing leet, And gan awake, and went out to piss, And came again, and gan the cradle miss, And groped here and there, but she found none. Alas, quoth she, I had almost misgone, I had almost gone to the clerk's bed. Eh, benedicite, then I had foully sped. And forth she went, till she the cradle fand. She groped away further with her hand, and found the bed, and thought not but good, because that the cradle by it stood. And wist not where she was, for it was deck, but fair and well she crept in by the clerk, and lay full still, and would have thought asleep. Within a while this John the clerk up leap, and on his good wife laid on full sore. So merry a fit she had not had full yore, he pricked hard and deep as he were mad. This jolly life have these two clerkers had, till that the third a cocker began to sing. A line waxed weary in the morrowing, for he had wonken all the longer night, and said, Farewell, Malkin, my sweet wished, the day is come, I may no longer bide, but evermore, where so I go or ride, I is thine own clerk, so have I hailer. Now, dear Liman, quoth she, go fair wailer, but ere thou go, one thing I will thee tell, when that thou wendest homeward by the mill, right at the entry of the door behind, thou shalt a cake of half a bushel find, that was ye make of thine own meal, which that I helped my father for to steal. And goodly man, God save thee and keep. And with that word she gan almost to weep. A line up rose and thought, Ere the day door I will go creepin in by my fellow, and found the cradle with his hand anon. By God, thought he, all wrong I have misgone, my head is totty of my swink to-night. That maketh me I go not aright, I wot well by the cradle I have misgo, here lie the miller and his wife also. And forth he went a twenty devil way, unto the bed there as the miller lay. He weaned it to have creeped by his fellow John, and by the miller in he crept anon, and caught him by the neck and gan him shake, and said, Thou, John, thou swinest head, awake, for Christus' soul, and here a noble game, for by that lord that is called St. Jame, I have thrice in this shorter night swived the miller's daughter bolt upright, while thou hast as a coward lain aghast. Thou falser harlot, quoth the miller, hast, ah, false traitor, false clerk, quoth he, thou shalt be dead by God's dignity, who durst to be so bold to disparage my daughter that is come of such lineage and by the throat a bowl he caught a line, and he him hent dispiteously again, and on the nose he smote him with his fist, down ran the bloody stream upon his breast, and in the floor with nose and mouth all broke they wallow as do two pigs in a poke, and up they go, and down again anon, till that the miller spurned on a stone, and down he backward fell upon his wife, that wist a nothing of this nice strife, for she was fallen asleep a little wicht with John the clerk that had waked all the night. And with the fall out of her sleep she brayed, Help, holy cross of Bromholm, she said, In manners to us, Lord, to thee I call, Awake, Simon, the fiend is on me fall, Mine heart is broken, help, I am but dead, There lieth one on my womb and on mine head, Help, Simkin, for these false clerks do fight, This John start up as fast as e'er he might, And groped by the walls to and fro to find a staff, And she start up also, and knew the estress better than this John, and by the wall she took a staff anon, and saw a little shimmering of a light, for at an hole in shone the moon a-bright, and by that light she saw them both the two, but sickerly she wist not who was who, but as she saw a white thing in her eye, and when she gan this white thing a spy, she weaned the clerk had heard a volupair. And with the staff she drew eye near and near, and ween to have hit this a line on the full, and smote the miller on the pillared skull. And down he went, and cried, Harrow, I die! These clerkies beat him well, and let him lie, and grithen them, and take their horse anon, and eke their meal. And on their way they gone, and at the mill-door eke they took their cake, of half a bushel flour, full well ye bake. Thus is the prouder miller well ye beat, and hath he lost the grinding of the wheat, and paid for the supper every deal, of a line and of John that beat him well, his wife is swived and his daughter also. Lo, such it is a miller to be false, and therefore this proverb is said full sooth, him thou not win and well that evil doth, a guiler shall himself beguiled be. 
and God, that sitteth high in majesty, save all this company, both great and small, thus have I quit the miller in my tale. End of the Reeves Tale Read in Nottingham, England, on the 3rd of July, by Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 3rd, 2006. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer Edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Cook's Tale The Prologue the cook of London, while the reeve thus spake, For joy he laughed, and clapped him on the back. Aha! quoth he, for Christ's passion this miller had a sharp conclusion, Upon this argument of herbergage, well said Solomon in his language, Bring thou not every man into thine house, For harboring by night is perilous. Well ought a man advised for to be, whom that he brought into his privity. I pray to God to give me sorrow and care, if ever, since I height hodge of ware, heard I a miller better set a work. He had a jape of malice in the dirk. But God forbid that we should stint a hear, and therefore, if ye will, vouchsafe to hear a tale of me, that am a poor man, I will tell you as well as e'er I can a little jape that fell in our city. Our host answered and said, I grant it thee. Roger, tell on, and look that it be good. For many a pasty hast thou let in blood, And many a jack of Dover hast thou sold, That had been twice hot and twice cold. Of many a pilgrim hast thou Christ's curse, For of thy parsley yet fare they the worse. They that have eaten in thy stubble goose, For in thy shop doth many a fly go loose. Now tell on, gentle Roger, by thy name, But yet I pray thee, be not wroth for game. A man may say full sooth in game and play, Thou sayest full sooth, quoth Roger, By my fay, but sooth play quad play, As the Fleming saith, and therefore Harry Bailey by thy faith. Be thou not wroth, else we departe here, though that my tale be of an hostilere. But natheless I will not tell it yet, but ere we part, e wis thou shall be quit. And there wall he laughed, and made cheer, and told his tale, as ye shall after hear. THE TALE A prentice, will whom dwelt in our city, And of a craft of victuallers was he, Galliard he was, as goldfinch in the shaw, Brown as berry, a proper sort fellow, With lockers black combed full fetishly, And dance he could so well and jollily, That he was called Perkin Reveller, he was full of love and paramour, as is the honeycomb of honey sweet. Well was the wench that with him might meet. At every bridal would he sing and hop, he better loved the tavern than the shop. 
For when there any riding was in cheap, Out of the shop thither he would leap, And till that he had all the sight he seen, And danced well, he would not come again, And gathered him a meanie of his sort, To hop and sing and make such disport, As there they set steven for to meet, To plan at dice in such a street, for in the town there was no prentice that fairer could cast a pair of dice than Perkin could, and thereto he was free of his dispense in place of privity, that found his master well in his chaffar, for oftentimes he found his box full bare. For soothly apprentice revelor that haunteth dice riot and paramour his master shall it in his shop a be all that he had no part in the minstrelry for theft and riot they be convertible all can they play on gittern or ribible revel and truth as in a low degree they be full wroth all day as men may see this jolly prentice with his master bold till he was nigh out of his prenticehood all were he snubbed both early and late and sometimes led with revel to newgate but at the last his master him bethought upon a day when he his paper sought of a proverb that saith this same word Better is rotten apple out of hoard than it should rot all in the remnant. So fares it by a riotous servant. It is well less harm to let him pace than he shend all the servants in the place. Therefore his master gave him a quittance and bade him go with sorrow and mischance, and thus this jolly prentice had his leve now let him riot all the night or leave and for there is no thief without a luke that helpeth him to wasten and to suke of that he bribe can or borrow may anon he sent his bed and his array unto a compare of his own sort that loved dice and riot and disport, and had a wife that held for countenance a shop, and swived for her sustenance. So ends the cook's tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February ninth, two 2006. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these notes, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Man of Law's Tale The Prologue our host saw well that the bright sun, the arc of his artificial day, had run the fourth part and half an hour more, and though he were not deep expert in lore, he wist it was the eight-and-twenty day of April that is messenger to May, and saw well that the shadow of every tree was in its length the same quality, that was the body erect that caused it, and therefore by the show he took his wit that Phoebus, which that shone so clear and bright degrees, was five-and-forty clomon height, and for that day, 
as in that latitude it was ten of the clock, he gan conclude, and suddenly he plight his horse about. Lordlings, quoth he, I warn you all this rout. The fourth party of this day is gone now, for the love of God and of St. John, lose no time as far forth as ye may, lordlings. The time wasteth night and day, and steals from us what privily sleeping, and what through negligence in our waking, as doth the stream that turneth never again, descending from the mountain to the plain, well might Senec and many a philosopher bewail time more than gold in coffer, for loss of chattels may recovered be, but loss of time shendeth us, quoth he. It will not come again without dread, no more than will Malkin's maidenhead, when she hath lost it in her wantonness. Let us not mould thus in idleness. Sir man of law, quoth he, so ye have bliss, tell us a tale anon as forward is. Ye be submitted through your free assent to stand in this case at my judgment, Acquit you now, and hold your behest, That ye have done your devoir in the least. Host, quoth he, De par Dieu j'ai To break forward is not mine intent, Behest is debt, and I would hold it fain, All my behest I can no better sane, For such law as a man gives another wight, he should himself usen it by right. Thus will our text, but nay the less certain, I can right now no thrifty tale sayn, but Chaucer, though he can but lewdly on meters and on rhyming craftily, hath said them in such English as he can of old time, as knoweth many a man. And if he have not said them, Lave, brother, in one book, he hath said them in another. For he hath told of lovers up and down more than Ovid made of mention in his epistole that be full old. Why should I tell them, since they be told? In youth he made of Ceyx and Alcyon, and since then he hath spoke of every one those noble wives and lovers eke, whoso will his large volume speak, called The Saint's Legend of Cupid. There may he see the large wounds wide of Lucrece, and of Babylon Thisbe, the sword of Dido for the false Ine, the tree of Phyllis for her Demophon, the plaint of Diane and of Hermion, of Ariadne and Hypsipyle, the barren isle standing in the sea, the drowned Leander for his fair hero, the tears of Helen and eke the woe of Briseis and Ladomia, the cruelty of the Queen Medea, thy little children hanging by the halls for thy Jason, that was of love so false. Hypermestra, Penelope, Alceste, your wifehood he commandeth with the best. But certainly no word writeth he of thick wick example of Canasse, that loved her own brother sinfully. Of all such cursed stories I say fie, or else of Tyrius Apollonius, and how the cursed king Antiochus bereft his daughter of her maidenhead, that is so horrible a tale to read, when he threw her upon the pavement, and therefore he, of full advisement, would never write in none of his sermons of such unkind abominations. Nor will I none rehearse, if I may, but of my tale, how shall I do this day? Me here loath to be likened doubtless to muses that men call Pyrides, metamorphoses, what I mean. But natheless I reck not a bean, though I come after him with hawkbake, I speak in prose, and let him rhymes make. 
And with that word he with a sober cheer Began his tale, and said, as ye shall hear. So ends the prologue to the Man of Law's Tale. THE TALE O scathful harm, condition of poverty, With thirst, with cold, with hunger so confounded, To ask help thee shameth in thine heart, If thou none ask, so sore art thou e wounded, That very need unwrappeth all thy wound hid, Maugre thine head, thou must for indignance, Or steal, or beg, or borrow thy dispense. Thou blamest Christ, and sayest full bitterly, He mid-separateth Richard's temporal, Thy neighbor thou whitest sinfully, And sayest thou hast too little, and he hath all, Parfait, sayest thou, some time he reckon shall, When that his tale shall brennen in the glade, For he not helped the needful in their need. Hearken what is the sentence of the wise, Better to die than to have indigence. Thyself, neighbor, will thee despise, If thou be poor, farewell thy reverence. Yet of the wise man take this sentence, All the days of poor men be wick, Beware, therefore, ere thou come to that prick. If thou be poor, Thy brother hated thee, and all thy friends flee from thee, alas. O rich merchants, full of wealth be ye, O noble, prudent folk, as in this case. Your bags be not filled with Amby's ace, but with six sank that runneth for your chance, And Christenmas will merry be ye dance. Ye seek land and sea for your winnings, As wise folk ye know in all the estate of Regnes, Ye be fathers of tidings and tales, Both of peace and of debate. I were right now of tales desolate, But that a merchant gone in many a year, Me taught a tale, which ye shall after hear. In Syria will whom dwelt a company of chapmen rich, and thereto sad and true, clothes of gold and satins rich of hue, that wide ware sent their spicery, their chaffare was so thriftily and so new, that every white had dainty to chaffar, with them and eke to sell them their ware. Now, Fell it that the masters of that sort Have sharpened them to roam for to wend, Were it for chapmanhood or for disport, None other messages would they thither send, But come themselves to roam. This is the end, And in such place as thought them a vantage, For their intent they took their herbigage. Sojourned have these merchants in that town a certain time, as fell to their pleasance, and so befell that in the excellent renown of the emperor's daughter, Dame Constance, reported was, with every circumstance, unto these Syrian merchants in such wise, from day to day, as I shall you devise. This was the common voice of every man, Our emperor of Rome, God him see, A daughter hath, that since the world began To reckon as well her goodness and beauty Was never such another as is she. I pray to God in honour her sustain, And would she wear of all Europe the queen. In her is high beauty without pride, And youth without greenhood or folly. To all her works virtue is her guide, Humbleness hath slain in her all tyranny. She is the mirror of all courtesy, Her heart a very chamber of holiness, Her hand minister of freedom for almness. 
And all this voice was sooth, as God is true, But now to purpose let us turn again. These merchants have done freight their shippes new, And when they have this blissful maiden seen, Home to Syria then they went full fain, And did their needs, as they have done your, And lived in weal, I can you say no more. Now fell it that these merchants stood in grace of him that was the Sudan of Siri, for when they came from any stranger place he would of his benigny courtesy make them good cheer, and busily espy tidings of sundry regnes for to leer the wonders that they might see or hear. Among his other things, specially, these merchants have told him of Dame Constance, so great nobleness in earnest so royally, that this Sudan hath caught so great pleasance to have her figure in his remembrance, that all his lust and all his busy cure was for to love her while his life may dure. Paraventure in the like large book which that men call the heaven he written was with stars, when that he his birth it took, that he for love should have his death, alas, for in the stars clearer than in the glass is written God wrought, whoso could it read, the death of every man without a dread. In stars many a winter there beforn Was writ the death of Hector, Achilles, Of Pompey, Julius, ere they were born, The strife of Thebes and of Hercules, Of Samson, Turnius, and of Socrates, The death but menes wittes be so dull That no white can well read it at the full. This Sudan for his privy counsel sent, And shortly of this matter for the pace, He hath to them declared his intent, And told them certain, but he might have grace To have Constance within a little space. He was but dead, and charged them in high To shape for his life some remedy. Diverse men diverse things said, and arguments they casten up and down, many a subtle reason forth they laid. They speak of magic and abusion, but finally, as in conclusion, they cannot see in that none advantage, nor in no other way, save marriage. Then saw they therein such difficulty by way of reason for to speak all plain, because that there was such diversity between their both laws, and they sayin they trow that no Christian prince would fain wedden his child under our laws sweet, that us was given by Mahud our prophet. And he answered, Rather than I lose Constance, I will be christened, doubtless. I must be hers. I may none other choose. I pray you, hold your arguments in peace. Save my life, and be not reckless, To get to her that hath my life in cure, For in this woe I may not long endure. What needeth greater dilatation, I say, by treaty and ambassadry, And by the Pope's meditation, and all the church, And all the chivalry, that in destruction of mametry, And in increase of Christ's law dear, They be accorded, so as ye may hear. How that the Sudan and his baronage and all his lieges shall ye christened be, and shall have constance in marriage, and certain gold, I not what quality, and hereto find they sufficient surety, the same accord is sworn on either side. Now, fair constance, 
Almighty God thee guide. Now would some men waiten, as I guess, That I should tell in all the purveyance, The which the emperor of his nobleness Hath shapen for his daughter, Dame Constance. Well may men know that so great ordinance May no man tellen in a little clause, As was arrayed for so high a cause. Bishops be sharpen with her for to wend, Lordes, ladies, and knights of renown, And other folk enough, this is the end, And notified is throughout all the town That every wight with great devotion Should pray to Christ that he this marriage Receive in gree and speed this voyage. The day is comen of her departing, I say the woeful fatal day is come, That there may be no longer tarrying, But forward they them dressen all and some, Constance, that was with sorrow all o'ercome, Full pale arose and dressed her to wend, For well she saw there was no other end. Alas, what wonder it is, though she wept, That shall be sent to a strange nation From friends that so tenderly her kept, And to be bound under subjection of one, She knew not his condition, Husbands be all good, and have been of yore, That no wives, I dare say no more. Father, she said, thy wretched child Constance, thy younger daughter, fostered up so soft, and you, my mother, my sovereign pleasance, over all thing outtaken Christ on loft. Constance, your child, her recommendeth oft unto your grace, for I shall to Siri, nor shall I ever see you more with I. Alas, unto the barbarous nation I must anon, Since, if that is your will, but Christ, that starve for our redemption, So give me grace his hestus to fulfil. I, wretched woman, no force, though I spill, Women are born to thraldom and penance, And to be under manna's governments. I trow at Troy when Pyrrhus break the wall, Or Ilion burnt, or Thebes the city, Nor at Rome for the harm through Hannibal That Romans hath the vanquished time as three, Was heard such tender weeping for pity, As in the chamber was for her parting, But forth she must, whether she weep or sing. O first a-moving cruel firmament, With thy diurnal sway, That crowdest I, and hurlest all, From east till occident, That naturally would hold another way, Thy crowding set in the heaven, In such array, At the beginning of this fierce voyage, That cruel Mars hath slain this marriage. Unfortunate ascendant torturous, of which the Lord is helpless, fallen, alas, Out of his angle into the darkest house. O Mars, O Atziar, as in this case, O feeble moon, unhappy is thy pace, Thou knittest thee where thou art not received, Where thou art well, from thenest art thou weaved. Imprudent emperor of Rome, alas, Was there no philosopher in all thy town? Is no time bet than other in such case? Of voyage is there none election, Namely to folk of high condition, Not when a root is of a birth, ye you know? Alas, we be too lewd or too slow. To ship was brought this woeful fair maid Solemnly with every circumstance. Now Jesus Christ be with you all, she said. There is no more but farewell, fair Constance. 
she pained her to make good countenance, and forth I let her sail in this manner, and turn I will again to my matter. The mother of the Sudan, well of vices, espied hath her son's plain intent, how he will leave his old sacrifices, and right anon she for her counsel sent, and they become to Noah what she meant, and when assembled was this folks in fear, she sat her down, and said, as ye shall hear, Lordes, she said, ye knowen every one how that my son in point is for to leet the holy laws of our Alacron, given by God's messenger Mahomet. But one avow to great God I hate, life shall rather out of my body start than Mahomet's law go out of mine heart. What should us tighten of this new law, but thrall them to our bodies and penance, and afterward in hell to be ye draw, for we reigned Mahomet our treance, but, Lord, as will ye make an assurance, as I shall say, assenting to my lore, and I shall make us safe for evermore. They sworen and assented every man to live with her, and die, and by her stand, and every one in the best wise he can, to strengthen her, shall all his friendes fan. And she hath his emprise taken in hand, which ye shall hear, that I shall devise, and to them all she spake right in this wise. We shall first feign us christendom to take. Cold water shall not grieve us but a light, And I shall such a feast and revel make, That, as I trow, I shall the Sudan quite, For, though his wife be christened ne'er so white, She shall have need to wash away the red, Though she a font of water with her lead. O Sudaness, root! of iniquity, virago thou, Semiramis the second, O serpent under femininity, like to the serpent deep in hell bound, O feigned woman, all that may confound virtue and innocence, though thy malice is bred in thee, as nest of every vice. O Satan envious, since the like day, that thou wert chased from our heritage, well knowest thou to woman the old way, thou madest Eve to bring us in servage. Thou wilt fordo this Christian marriage, thine instrument so, well away the while, makest thou of women when thou wilt beguile. This Sudanus, whom I thus blame and warre, led privily her counsel go their way. Why should I in this tale longer tarry? She rode unto the Sudan on a day, and said him that she would renie her lay, and Christendom of priestes handes fong, repenting her she heathen was so long beseeching him to do her that honour, that she might have the Christian folk to feast. To please them I will do my labour, the Sudan said, I will do it at your hist, and, kneeling, thanked her for that request. So glad he was he wist not what to say, and kissed her son, and home she went her way. Arrived be these Christian folk to land in Syria with a great solemn rout, and hastily this Sudan sent his son for first to his mother and all the realm about, and said his wife had come out of doubt, and prayed them to ride again the queen, the honour of his regne to sustain. 
Great was the press, and rich was the array of Syrians and Romans met in fair. The mother of the Sudath rich and gay received her, with all so glad a cheer as any mother might her daughter dear, and to the next city there beside a soft pace solemnly they ride. Not trow I the triumph of Julius, of which that Lucan maketh such a boast, was royaler or more curious, than was the assembly of this blissful boast, but, O oh, this scorpion, this wicked ghost, the Sudaness, for all her flattering cast under this full mortally to sting. The Sudan came himself soon after this, so royally that wonder is to tell, and welcomed her with all joy and bliss, and thus in mirth and joy I let them dwell. The fruit of his matter is that I tell. When the time came, men thought it for the best, that rebels stint, and men go to their rest. The time is come that this old Sudaness ordained hath the feast of which I told, and to the feast the Christian folk them dress in general, yea, both young and old. There may men feast, and royalty behold, and dainties more than I can you devise, but all too dear they bought it ere they rise. O sudden woe that ever art successor to worldly bliss, sparent is with bitterness, the end of our joy, our worldly labor. Woe occupies the fine of our gladness. Hearken this counsel for thy sickerness. Upon thy glade days have in thy mind the unware woe of harm that comes behind. For shortly, for to tell it at a word, the Sudan and the Christians, every one, were all too hewn and sticked at the board. But it was only Dame Constance alone, this old Sudaness, this accursed crone, had with her friends done this accursed deed, for she herself would all the country lead. Nor there was Syrian that was converted, that of the council of the Sudan wot, that was not all too hewn, ere he asserted, and Constance have they ta'en anon for tot, and in a ship all steererless, God wot, they have her set, and bid her learn to sail out of Syria againward to Ital. A certain treasure that she thither lad, and soon to say of victual great plenty, there have her given, and clothes eke she had, and forth she sailed in the salty sea. O oh, my Constance, full of benignity, O oh, emperor's young daughter dear, he that is lord of fortune be thy steer. She blessed herself, and with full piteous voice unto the cross of Christ, thus said she, O dear, O wheelful altar, holy cross, red of the Lamb's blood, full of pity, that washed the world from old iniquity, me from the fiend, and from his claws keep, that day that I shall drenchen in the deep. Victorious tree, protection of the true, that only worthy were for to bear the king of heaven, with his woundes new, the white lamb that hurt was with a spear, flemmer of fiends out of him, and her on which thy limbs fully extend, me keep, and give me might my life to mend. Years and days floated this creature throughout the sea of Greece unto the strait of Maroc, as it was her aventure on many a sorry meal now may she bait. After her death full often may she wait, ere that the wild waves will her drive unto the place thereas she shall arrive. 
Men mighten ask why she was not slain, Eke at the feast who might her body save, And I answer to that demand again, Who saved Daniel in the horrible cave, Where every white, save he, master or knave, Was with the lion threat, ere he a start, No white but God that he bare in his heart. God list to shew his wonderful miracle in her, That we should see his mighty works, Christ, which that is to him harm trickle, By certain means oft, as he knows clerks, Doth thing for certain end, That full dirk is to man's wit, That for our ignorance, Ne cannot know his prudent purveyance. Now since she was not at the feast, ye slaw, Who kept her from drowning in the sea, Who kept Jonas from the fish's maw, Till he was sprouted up at Nineveh, Well men may know it was no white, But he that kept the Hebrew people from drowning, With dry feet throughout the sea passing. Who bade the four spirits tempest that the power have to annoy land and sea, both north and south, and also west and east, annoy neither sea nor land nor tree? Soothly the commander of that was he that kept the tempest I this woman kept, as well when she awoke as when she slept. Where might this woman meat and drink have, Three year and more, how lasted her vitality? Who fed the Egyptian Mary in the cave, Or in the desert, no white but Christ, son Fei? Five thousand folk it was as great marvail With loaves and five and fishes too to feed. God sent his poisson at her great need. She drived forth into our ocean, throughout our wildest sea, Until at the last, under a hold, that Nempen I not can, Far in Northumberland the wave her cast, And in the sand her ship sticked so fast, That thinness it would not in all a tide, The will of Christ was that she should abide. The constable of the castle did down fare to see this wreck, And all the ship he sought, and found this weary woman full of care. He found also the treasure that she brought, in her language mercy she besought, The life out of her body for to twin her to deliver of woe that she was in. A manner Latin corrupt was her speech, But all gate thereby she was understood, The constable, when him list no longer seech, This woeful woman brought he to the land. She kneeled down and thanked God's son, But what she was she would no man to say, For fair nor foul, although that she should day. She said she was so mazed in the sea That she forgot her mind by her truth. The constable had of her so great pity, And eke his wife, that they wept for Ruth. She was so diligent without sleuth To serve and please every one in that place That all her loved that looked in her face. The constable and Dame Mermelgild his wife were pagans, and that country everywhere, but Hermelgild loved Constance as her life, and Constance had so long sojourned there in orisons with many a bitter tear, till Jesus had converted through his grace Dame Hermelgild constableness of that place. In all that land no Christians durst rout, All Christian folk had fled from that country, Though pagans that conquered all about The plagues of the north by land and sea, To Wales had fled the Christianity of old Britons Dwelling in this isle, there was their refuge for the meanwhile. 
But yet ne'er Christian Britain so exiled, That there ne'er some which in their privity Honoured Christ, and heathen folk beguiled, And nigh the castle such there dwelled three, And one of them was blind, and might not see, But it were with silk iron of his mind, With which men may see when they are blind. Bright was the sun as in a summer's day, For which the constable and his wife also, And Constance have ye take the right away, Toward the sea a furlong way to go, To playen and to roam to and fro, And in their walk this blind man they met, Crooked and old, with even fast yet. In the name of Christ called this blind Briton, Dame Ermelgild, give me my sight again. This lady waxed afraid of that sound, Lest that her husband, shortly for to sayn, Would her for Jesus Christ's love have slain, Till Constance made her hold, And bade her wirch the will of Christ, As daughter of holy church. The constable waxed abashed out of that sight, and said, What amounteth all this fair? Constance answered, Sir, it is Christ's might that helpeth folk out of the friend's snare. And so far forth she gan our law declare, that she, the constable, ere that it were eve, converted, and on Christ made him believe. This constable was not lord of the place of which I speak there, as he Constance fanned, but kept it strongly many a winter space under Allah, king of Northumberland, that was full wise and worthy of his hand against the scots, as men may well hear. But turn I will again to my matter. Satan, that ever us waiteth to beguile, Saw of Constance all her perfection, And cast anon how he might quite her while, And made a young knight that dwelleth in that town Love her so hot of foul affection, That verily him thought that he should spill, But he of her might ones have his will. He wooed her, but it availed not, she would no sin by no way, And for despite he compassed his thoughts To make her a shameful death to-day. He waiteth when the constable is away, And privily upon a night he crept In her Melgilda's chamber while she slept. Weary, forewaked, in her orisons, Sleepeth constant, and her Melgild also. This night, through Satan's temptation, All softly is to the bed ye go, And cut the throat of her Melgild in two, And laid the bloody knife by Dame Constance, And went his way. There God gave him mischance. Soon after came the constable home again, And eke Allah that king was of this land, And saw his wife dispiteously slain, For which full oft he wept and wrung his hand, And ill the bed the bloody knife he found By Dame Constance. Alas, what might she say? For very woe her wit was all away. To King Allah was told all this mischance, And eke the time, and where, and in what wise, That in a ship was founden this Constance. And here before ye have me heard devise, The king's heart for pity gan agrise, When he saw so benign a creature Fall in disease and in misadventure. For as the lamb toward his death is brought, So stood this innocent before the king, This false knight that had this treason wrought, Bore her in hand that she hath done this thing. 
but natheless there was great murmuring among the people, that say they cannot guess that she had done so great a wickedness. For they had seen her ever virtuous, and loving her Melgild right as her life, of this bear witness each one in that house, save he that her Melgild slew with his knife. This gentle king had caught a great motif of this witness, and thought he would inquire deeper into this case, the truth to lure. Alas, Constance, thou hast no champion, nor fight canst thou not so well away, but he that starf for our redemption, and bound Satan, and yet lieth where he lay. So be thy stronger champion this day, for but Christ upon the miracle kith, without a guilt, thou shall be slain as swife. She set her down on knees, and thus she said, Immortal God that saved Suzanne from false blame, And thou merciful maid, Mary, I mean, The daughter of Saint Anne, Before whose child the angels sing Ozan, If I be guiltless of this felony, My succor be, or else shall I die. Have ye not seen some time a pale face among a press of him that hath been lad toward his death, where he getteth no grace, and such a color in his face hath had, men might know him that was so bestad amongst all the faces in that rout? So stood Constance, and looked her about. O queenes living in propriety, duchesses, and ye ladies every one, have some ruth of her adversity, and emperor's daughter she stood alone. She had no wight with whom to make her moan, O blood royal that standest in the dread, far be thy friends in thy great need. This king Allah had such compassion as gentle heart is fulfilled of pity, that from his iron ran the water down, now hastily to fetch a book, quoth he, and if this knight will swear how that she this woman slew, yet will we us advise with that we will that shall be our justice. A Britain book, written with evangiles, was fetched, and on this book he swore anon she guilty was, in the meanwhiles, and hand him smote upon the neck a bone, that down he fell at once, right as a stone, and both his iron burst out of his face, in sight of everybody in that place. A voice was heard in general audience that said, Thou hast dislandered guiltless, the daughter of holy church in high presence. Thus hast thou done, and yet hold I my peace? Of this marvel aghast was all the press, as mazed folk they stood every one, for dread of reek save Constance alone. Great was the dread, and eke the repentance of them that bade wrong suspicion upon this saily innocent Constance, and for this miracle in conclusion, and by Constance's meditation the king, and many another in that place, converted was, thanked be Christ's grace. This false knight was slain for his untruth by judgment of Allah hastily, and yet Constance had of his death great ruth, and after this Jesus of his mercy made Allah wed full solemnly, this holy woman that is so bright and sheen, 
And thus hath Christ y made Constance a queen. But who was woeful, if I shall not lie, Of this wedding, but Donegilt, And no mo the king's mother, full of tyranny? Her thought, her cursed heart, would burst in two. She would not that her son had done so, Her thought it despite that he should take So strange a creature unto his make. Me list not of the chaff, nor of the stray, Make so long a tale as of the corn, What should I tellen of the royalty of this marriage? Or which course goes before who bloweth in a trump or in a horn? The fruit of every tale is for to say, They eat and drink and dance and sing and play. They go to bed, as it was skill and right, For though that wives be full of holy things, They must take in patience at the night Such manner necessaries as be pleasings to folk That have e wedded them with rings, And lay a light their holiness aside, As for the time it may no better be tied. On her he got a knave child anon, And to a bishop, and to his constable eke, He took his wife to keep, when he is gone, To Scotland ward, his foeman for to seek. Now fair Constance, that is so humble and meek, So long is gone with child, Till that still she held her chamber, Abiding Christ's will. The time is come, a knave and child she bear, Mauritius at the front stone they him call. This constable doth forth come a messenger, And wrote unto his king that clept was all, How that this blissful tiding is befall, And other tidings speedful for to say, He hath the letter, and forth he goeth his way. This messenger, to do his advantage, Unto the king's mother rideth swithe, And saluteth her full flare in his language. Madame, quote he, Ye may be glad and blithe, And thank God on hundred thousand scythe. My lady queen hath child without doubt, To joy and bliss of all this realm about. Lo, here is the letter sealed of this thing, That I must bear with all haste I may. If ye will aught unto your son the king, I am your servant, both night and day. Donagid answered, And now at this time nay, But here I will with all night thou take thy rest. To-morrow will I say thee, what me lest. This messenger drank sadly ale and wine, And stolen where his letters privily, Out of his box, where he slept as a swine, And counterfeited was full subtly. Another letter wrote full sinfully Unto the king direct of this matter, From his constable, as ye shall after hear. This letter said the queen delivered was of so horrible a fiend-like creature that in the castle none so hardy was that any while she durst therein endure the mother was an elf by adventure become by charms or by sorcery and every man hated her company. Woe was this king when this letter had seen, But to no wight he told his sorrows sore, But with his own hand he wrote again, Welcome the son of Christ for evermore, To me that I am now learned in this lore, Lord, welcome be thy lust and thy presence, My lust 
I put all in thine ordinance. Keeps this child, albeit foul or fair, And eke my wife unto mine homecoming. Christ, when him list, may send to me an heir, More agreeable than this to my liking. This letter be he sealed, privily weeping, Which to the messenger was taken soon, And forth he went, there is no more to doon. O messenger, full filled of drunkenness, Strong is thy breath, thy limbes falter I, And thou betrayest all secretness, Thy mind is lorn, thy janglest as a jay, Thy face is turned in a new array, Where drunkenness reigneth in any rout, There is no counsel hid without doubt. O Donegild, I have no English dine unto thy malice and thy tyranny, and therefore to the fiend I thee resign. Let him indict for all thy treachery. Fie, manish, fie! O nay, by God I lie, fie, fiend-like spirit! For I dare well tell, though thou here walk, Thy spirit is in hell. This messenger came from the king again, And at the king's mother court he light, And she was of his messenger full fain, And pleased him in all that e'er she might. He drank, and well his girdle under pight he slept, And eke he snored in this guise all night until the sun began to rise. Eft were his letters stolen, every one, and counterfeited letters in this wise, the king commanded his constable anon on pain of hanging, and of high jew eyes that he should suffer in no manner wise Constance within his regne, For to abide three days and a quarter of a tide. But in the same ship as he her fanned, Her and her younger son and all her gear, He should put and crowd her from the land And charge her, that she never eft come there. O oh, my Constance, well may thy ghost have fear, And sleeping in thy dream be in penance, When Donegild cast all this ordinance. This messenger on morrow, when he woke Unto the castle, held the next away, And to the constable the letter took, and when his dispiteous letter say, Full oft he said, Alas, and well away, Lord Christ, quoth he, How may this world endure? So full of sin is many a creature. O mighty God, if that be thy will, Since thou art rightful judge, how may it be that thou wilt suffer innocence to spill, And wicked folk reign in prosperity? Ah, good Constance, alas, so woe is me That I must be thy tormentor, or day a shameful death. There is no other way. Wept both young and old in that place, when that the king this cursed letter sent, And Constance, with a deadly pale of face, The fourth day toward her ship she went, But none the less she took in good intent The will of Christ, and kneeling on the strand she said, Lord, I welcome be thy son. He that kept me from the false blame, While I was in the land among us you, He can keep me from harm and eke from shame In the salt sea, 
although I see not how, as strong as ever he was, he is not now. In him trust I, and in his mother dear, that is to me my sail, and eke my steer. Her little child lay weeping in her arm, and kneeling piteously to him she said, Peace, little son, I will do thee no harm. With that her kerchief off her head she braid, and over his little iron even there it laid, and in her arm she lulled it full fast, and unto heaven her iron up she cast. Mother, quoth she, and maiden bright, Mary, sooth is that through a woman's eggment man was lorn, and damned I to die, for which thy child was on a cross he rent. Thy blissful iron saw all his torment, then is there no comparison between thy woe and any woe man may sustain? Thou sawst thy child is slain before thine eyne, and yet thou lives, my little child parfait, now lady bright, to whom the woeful cryan, thou glory of womanhood, thou fair may, thou heaven for refuge, bright star of the day, rue on my child, that of thy gentleness ruest on every rueful in distress. O little child, alas, what is thy guilt, that never wroughtest sin as yet pardy? Why will thine hard father have thee split, O mercy, dear constable, quoth she? And let my little child here dwell with thee, and if thou darest not save him from blame, so kiss him once in his father's name. Therewith she looked backward to the land, and said, Farewell, husband ruthless, and up she rose, and walked down the strand toward the ship, her following all the press. And ever she prayed her child to hold his peace, and took her leave, and with an holy intent she blessed her, and to the ship she went. Victualled was the ship, it is no dread, abundantly for her a full long space, and other necessities that should need, for she had enough, harried be God's grace, for wind and weather almighty God purchase, and bring her home, I can no better say, but in the sea she driveth forth her way. Allah the king came home soon after this unto his castle, of the which I told, and asked where his wife and his child is. The constable gan about his heart feel cold, and plainly all the matter he him told, as ye have heard, I can tell it no better, and shewed the king his seal, and eke his letter, and said, Lord, as ye commanded me on pain of death, so have I done certain. Must ye be no, and tell it flat and plain, From night to night in what place he hath lain, And thus, by wit and subtle inquiring, Imagined was by whom this harm gan spring. The hand was known that had the letter wrote, and all the venom of that cursed deed, but in what wise, certainly, I know not. The fact is this, that Allah out of dread his mother slew, that may men plainly read, 
for that she traitor was to legiance, thus ended old Donegild with mischance. The sorrow that this Allah night and day made for his wife and for his child also, there is no tongue that it teller may, but now will I again to Constance go, that floated in the sea in pain and woe five year and more as like Christ's son, ere that her ship approacheth to the land. Under an heathen castle at the last, of which the name in my text I not find, Almighty God that saved all mankind have on Constance and her child some mind, that fallen is in heathen hand eftsoon in point to spill, as I shall tell you soon. Down from the castle comes there many a wight to Garin on this ship and on Constance, but shortly from the castle on a night the lord is steward. God give him mischance, a thief that had reigned our creance came to the ship alone, and said he would her layman be, whether she would or nood. Woe that this wretched woman then begone, her child cried, and she cried piteously. But blissful Mary helped her right anon, for with her struggling well and mightily the thief fell overboard all suddenly, and in the sea he drenched for vengeance, and thus hath Christ unwemmed kept Constance. O foul lust of luxury, lo thine end, not only that thou faintest manna's mind, but verily thou wilt his body shend. The end of thy work, or of thy lustes blind, is complaining. How many may men find that not for work sometimes, but for the intent to do this sin, be either slain or shent. How may this weak woman have the strength her to defend against this renegade? O Goliath unmeasurable of length, how mighty David made thee so mate, so young, and of armor so desolate! How durst he look upon thy dreadful face? Well may men see it was but God's grace. Who gave Judith courage or hardiness to slay him, Holofrens, in his tent, and to deliver out of wretchedness the people of God? I say for this intent that right as God's spirit of vigor sent to them, and saved them of mischance, so sent he might and vigor to Constance. Forth went her ship throughout the narrow mouth of Jubalter and Septa driving all way, sometime west and sometime north and south, and sometime east, full many a weary day, till Christ's mother, blessed be she, I, had shaped through her endless goodness to make an end of all her heaviness. Now let us stint of Constance but a throw, and speak we of the Roman emperor, that out of Syria had by letters know the slaughter of Christian folk, and dishonor done to his daughter by a false traitor, I mean the cursed wicked Sudaness, that at the feast let slay both more and less. For which this emperor had sent anon his senator with royal ordinance, and other lords God wot many a one on Syrians to take high vengeance. They burn and slay and bring them to mischance full many a day. But shortly this is the end, Homeward to Rome they shaped them to wend. This senator repaired with victory to Romeward, sailing full royally, 
and met the ship driving, as saith the story, in which Constance sat full piteously, and nothing knew he what she was, nor why she was in such array, nor she will say of her estate, although that she should day. He brought her unto Rome, and to his wife. He gave her, and her younger son also, and with the senator she led her life. Thus can Our Lady bring out of woe woeful Constance, and many another moe, and longer time she dwelled in that place, in holy works ever, as was her grace. The senator's wife her aunt was, for all that she knew her never the more, I will no longer tarry in this case, but to King Allah, whom I spake of yore, that for his wife he wept and sighed sore, I will return and leave, I will, Constance, under the senator's governance. King Allah, which that had his mother slain upon a day, fell in such repentance, that if I shortly tell it shall and plain, to Rome he came to receive his penitence, and put him in the Pope's ordinance in high and low, and Jesus Christ besought, forgive his wicked works that he had wrought. The fame anon throughout the town is born, How Allah king shall come on pilgrimage By harbingers that went him before, For which the senator was the usage, Rode him again, and many of his lineage, As well to show his high magnificence, As to do any king a reverence. Great cheer did this noble senator to King Allah's, and to him also. Each of them did the other proud, and so befell that in a day or two this senator did to King Allah go, to feast, and shortly, if I shall not lie, Constance's son went in his company. Some men would say, at request of Constance, this senator had led this child to feast, I may not tell in every circumstance, be as be may, there was he at the least. But sooth is this, that at his mother's hest, before Allah during their meetest space, the child stood, looking at the king's face. This Allah king had of this child great wonder, And to the senator he said, Anon, Whom is that fair child that standeth yonder? I not, quoth he, by God and by St. John, A mother he hath, but father hath he none, That I of what, and shortly in a stone, He told to Allah, how the child was found. But God wot, quoth this senator also, so virtuous a liver in all my life. I never saw as she nor heard of mo of worldly woman, maiden, widow, or wife. I dare well say she had a liver, a knife through her breast, than be a woman's wick. There is no man could bring her to that prick. Now was this child as like to Constance as possible is a creature to be. This Allah had the face in remembrance of Dame Constance, and thereon mused he, If the child's mother were aught she, that was his wife. And privily he sight, and sped him from the table that he might. Parfait, thought he, phantom is in mine head. I ought to dream of skilful judgment that in the salt sea my wife is dead. And afterwards he made this argument. 
Why won't I, if that Christ have hither sent my wife by sea, as well as he her sent to my country from Venice that she went? And afternoon home with the senator went Allah for to see this wondrous chance. This senator did Allah great honor, and hastily he sent after Constance, but trust to well, her listed not to dance, when that she wist therefore was that sond unneth upon her feet she might stand. When Allah saw his wife, fair he her gret and wept, that it was Rutha for to see, for at the first looked he on her set, he knew well verily that it was she, and she for sorrow, as dumb stood as a tree, so was her heart shut in her distress, when she remembered his unkindness. Twice she swooned in his own sight. He wept, and him excused piteously. Now God, quoth he, and all his hollows bright, so wisely on my soul have mercy, that of your harm as guiltless am I as is Maurice, my son, so like your face. Else may the fiend me fetch out of this place. Long was the sobbing and the bitter pain, Ere that their woeful hearts might cease. Great was the pity, for hear them plain, Though which plaints gan their woe increase. I pray you all my labor to release. I may not tell all their woe till to-morrow. I am so weary for to speak of sorrow. But finally, when that the sooth is wist that Allah guiltless was of all her woe, I trow an hundred times have they kissed, and such a bliss is there betwixt them two, that save the joy that lasteth evermore, there is none like that any creature hath seen, or shall see, while the world may dure. Then prayed she her husband meekly, in that relief of her long piteous pine, that he would pray her father specially, that of his majesty she would incline to vouchsafe some day with him to dine. She prayed him to eke, that he should by no way unto her father no word of her say. Some men would say now that the child Maurice did this message unto the emperor, but, as I guess, Allah was not so nice to him that is so sovereign of honor. As he that is of Christian folk the flower, Send any child but better dis to deem, He went himself, and so it may well seem. This emperor hath granted gently to come to dinner, As he him besought, and well read I, He looked busily upon this child, And on his daughter thought. Allah went to his inn, and as him ought arrayed for his feast in every wise, and far forth as his cunning may suffice. The morrow came, and Allah gan him dress, and eke his wife the emperor to meet. And forth they rode in joy and in gladness, and when she saw her father in the street, she lighted down and fell before his feet. Father, quoth she, your younger child Constance is now full clean out of your remembrance. I am your daughter, your Constance, quoth she, that will whom ye have sent into Siri. It am I, father, that in the salt sea was put alone and damned for to die. Now, good father, I your mercy cry, send me no more into none heatheness, 
but thank my lord here of his kindness. Who can the piteous joy tellen all betwixt them three, since they be thus y met? But of my tale make an end I shall, the day goes fast I will no longer let. These glad folk to dinner be ye set, In joy and bliss at meat I let them dwell, A thousandfold well more than I can tell. This child Maurice was since then emperor, Made by the Pope, and lived Christianly, To Christ's church did he great honor. But I let all his story pass by, Of Constance is my tale especially, in the old Roman guestes men may find Maurice's life, I bear not it in mind. This King Allah, when he his time say, With his Constance, his holy wife so sweet, To England are they come in the right way, Where did they live in joy and in quiet? But little while it lasted, I you hate, Joy of this world for time will not abide. From day to night it changeth as the tide. Who lived ever in such delight one day That him not moved either conscience, Or ire, or talent, or some kind affray, Envy, or pride, or passion, or offence, I say, But for this end this sentence, that little while in joy or in pleasance Lasted the bliss of Allah with Constance. For death that takes of high and low his rent, When passed was a year even as I guess, Out of this world this King Allah he hent, For whom Constance had full great heaviness, and let us pray that God his soul bless, And Dame Constance finally to say, Toward the town of Rome went her way. To Rome is come this holy creature, And findeth there her friends whole and sound. Now she is scaped all her ventures, And when that with her father hath thee found, down on her knees hath fallen she to ground, Weeping for tenderness in heart blithe, She heareth God an hundred thousand sighs. In virtue and in holy alms deed They liven all, and ne'er asunder wend, Till death departed them, this life they lead. And fare now well, my tale is at an end. Now Jesus Christ, that of his might, May send joy after woe, Govern us in his grace, And keep us all that be in this place. So ends the Man of Law's Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com. Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. The Wife of Bath's Tale. The Prologue. Experience, though none authority, were in this world, is right enough for me to speak of woe that is in marriage. For lordings, since I twelve year was of age, thank it be God that is eternal live, husbands at the church door have I had five. For I so often have ye wedded be, and all were worthy men in their degree. But me was told, not long a time gone is, that Sithen Christa went never but once to wedding in the kind of Galilee, that by that ilk example taught he me, that I not wedded should be but once. Lo, hearken eke a sharp word for the nonce. 
Beside a well Jesus, God and man, spake in reproof of the Samaritan. Thou hast ye had five husbands, said he, and Thilke man, that now hath wedded thee, is not thine husband. Thus said he, Sir Tyne, what that he meant thereby I cannot sign. But that I ask, why the fifth man was not husband to the Samaritan? How many might she have in marriage? Yet heard I never tell in mine age upon this number definition. Men may divine and glossen up and down, but well I wot, express without a lie, God bade us four to wax and to multiply. That gentle text can I well understand. Eek, well I wot, he said, that mine husband should leave father and mother, and take to me. But of no number mention made he, of bigamy or of octogamy. Why then should men speak of it villainy? Lo here, the wise king Dan Solomon, I trow that he had wives more than one. As would to God it lawful were to me to be refreshed half so oft as he. What gift of God had he for all his wives? No man hath such that in this world alive is. God wot this noble king, as to my wit, The first night had many a merry fit, With each of them so well was him on live. Blessed be God that I have wedded five. Welcome the sixth whenever he shall, For since I will not keep me chaste in all, When mine husband is from the world he gone, Some Christian man shall wed me anon. For then the apostle saith that I am free to wed a God's half where it liketh me. He saith that to be wedded is no sin, better is to be wedded than to brin. What recketh me, though folk say villainy, of shrewd Lamech and his bigamy? I wot well Abraham was a holy man, and Jacob eke as far as ever I can, and each of them had wives more than two, and many other holy men also. Where can ye see, in any manner age, that high God defended marriage? By word express. I pray you tell it me, or where commanded he virginity? I wot as well as you it is no dread. The apostle, when he spake of maidenhead, he said that precept thereof he had none. Men may counsel a woman to be one, but counselling is no commandment. He put it in our own judgment. For had a god commanded maidenhead, Then had he damned wedding out of dread. And certes, if there were no seedy so, Virginity then whereof should it grow? Paul durst not commanden, at the least, A thing of which his master gave no hest. The dart is set up for virginity. Catch whoso may, who runneth best, let's see. But this word is not ta'en of every wight, But there as God will give it of his might. I wot well that the apostle was a maid, but natheless, although he wrote and said, he would that every wight were such as he, all is but counsel to virginity. And since to be a wife he gave me leave of indulgence, so is it no reprieve to wed a me, if that my make should die without exception of bigamy. All were it good no woman for to touch, he meant as in his bed or in his couch. For peril is both fire and tow to assemble, Ye know what this example may resemble. This is all and some, he held virginity, More profit than wedding in frailty. Frailty, clep I, but if that he and she Would lead their lives all in chastity. I grant it well, I have none envy, Who maidenhead prefer to bigamy. It liketh them to be clean in body and ghost, Of mine estate I will not make a boast. For well ye you know, a lord in his household hath not every vessel all of gold. Some are of tree, and do their lord service. Good calleth folk to him in sundry wise, and each one hath of God a proper gift. Some this, some that, as liketh him to shift. Virginity is great perfection, and continence eke with devotion. But Christ, that of perfection is the well, bade not every wight he should go sell all that he had, and give it to the poor, and in such wise follow him and his lore. He spake to them that would live perfectly, and lordings, by your leave, that am not I. I will bestow the flower of mine age, in the axe and in the fruits of marriage. Tell me also to what conclusion were members made of generation, 
and of so perfect wise a white ye wrought. Trust me right well, they were not made for naught. Glows whoso will, and say both up and down, that they were made for the purgation of urine and of other things small, and eke to know a female from a male. And for none other cause? Say ye no, experience what well, it is not so. So that the clerks be not with me wroth, I say this, that they were made for both, that is to say, for office and for ease. Of engenderer there we God not displease. Why should men Ellis in their book is set? That man shall yield unto his wife her debt. Now wherewith should he make his payment if he used not his silly instrument? Then were they made upon a creature to purge urine and eke for engenderer. But I say not that every wight is hold, that hath such harness as I to you told, to go and use them in engenderer. Then should men take of chastity no cure. Christ was a maid, and shapen as a man, and many a saint, since that this world began, yet ever lived in perfect chastity. I will not be with no virginity. Let them with breed of purid wheat be fed, and let us wives eat our barley bread. And yet with barley bread, Mark tell us can, our Lord Jesus refreshed many a man. In such a state as God hath clept us, I'll persevere. I'm not precious. In wifehood I will use mine instrument as freely as my Maker hath it sent. If I be dangerous, God give me sorrow. Mine husband shall it have, both eve and morrow, when that him list come forth and pay his debt. A husband I will have, I will no let, which shall be both my debtor and my thrall, and have his tribulation withal, upon his flesh, while that I am his wife. I have the power during all my life upon his proper body, and not he. Right thus the apostle told it unto me, and bade our husbands for to love us well. All this sentence me liketh every deal. Upstart the pardoner, and that a nun. Now, dame, quoth he, by God and by St. John, ye are a noble preacher in this case. I was about to wed a wife, alas! What, should I buy it on my flesh so dear? Yet had I lever wed no wife this year. Abide, quoth she, my tale is not begun. Nay, thou shalt drinken of another ton ere that I go, shall savour worse than ale. And when that I have told thee forth my tale of tribulation in marriage, of which I am expert in all mine age, that is to say, myself hath been the whip, then mayest thou choose whether thou wilt sip of the tune that I sh now shall broach. Beware of it, ere thou too nigh approach, for I shall tell examples more than ten. Whoso will not beware by other men, by him shall other men corrected be. These same words writeth Ptolemy. Read in his Almagest, and take it there. Dame, I would pray you, if your will it were, said this pardoner, as ye began, tell forth your tale, and spare for no man, and teach us young men of your practique. Gladly, quoth she, since that it may you like, but that I pray to all this company, if that I speak after my fantasy, to take not a grief what I may say, for mine intent is only for to play. Now, sirs, then will I tell you forth my tale, as ever I may drink wine or ale, I shall say sooth. The husbands that I had three of them were good, and two were bad. The three were good men, and rich, and old. Unethis might they the statute hold, and which that they were bounden unto me. Yet what well what I mean of this, party, as God me help, I laugh when that I think how piteously at night I made them swink. But by my fay I told of it no store. They had me given their land and their trezor. We needed not do longer diligence to win their love or do them reverence. They loved me so well by God above that I told no dainty of their love. A wise woman will be busy in her ever in one to get their love, where that she hath none. But since I had them wholly in my hand, and that they had given me all their land, why should I take keep them for to please, but it were for my profit or mine ease? I set them so a work, by my fay, that many a night they sang well away. 
The bacon was not fetched for them, I trow, that some men have an Essex at dumb now. I governed them so well after my law, that each of them full blissful was and fa to bring me gay things from the fair. They were full glad, when that I spake them fair, for, God it what, I chide them spidiously. Now hearken how I bear me properly. Ye wise wives that can understand, thus should ye speak, and bear them wrong on hand, for half so boldly can there no man swearin' and lyin' as a woman can. I say not this by wives that be wise, but if it be when they them misadvise. A wise wife, if that she can her good, shall bear them on hand the cow is wood, and take witness of her own maid, of their assent. But hearken how I said, Sir old Cainard, is this thine array? Why is my neighbour's wife so gay? She is honoured over all where she goeth. I sit at home, I have no thrifty cloth. What dost thou at my neighbour's house? Is she so fair? Art thou so amorous? What rowest thou with our maid, Benedict? Sir old lecher, let thy japes be. And if I have a gossip or a friend, without guilt, thou chidest as a fiend, if that I walk or play unto his house. Thou comest home as drunken as a mouse, and preachest on thy bent with evil prefa. Thou sayest to me, It is a great mischief to wed a poor woman for costage, and if that she be rich of high parage. Then sayest thou, that it is a tormentry to suffer her pride and melancholy. And if that she be fair, thou very knave, thou sayest that every holler will her have. She may no while in chastity abide, that is assailed upon every side. Thou sayest some folk desire us for riches, some for our shape, and some for our fairness, and some for she can either sing or dance, and some for gentleness or dalliance, some for her hands, and her arm is small. Thus goes all to the devil by thy tale. Thou sayest, men may not keep a castle wall that may be so assailed over all, and if that she be foul, thou sayest that she coveteth every man that she may see. For as a spaniel she will on him leap, till she may find some man her to cheap, and none so grey goose goes there in the lake. So sayest thou, that will be without a make. And sayest, it is a hard thing for to weld a thing that no man will, his thank is held. Thou sayest thou, Laurel, when thou goest to bed, that no wise man needeth for to wed, nor no man that intendeth unto heaven. With wild a thunder dint and fiery leaven mote thy wicked neck to be broke. Thou sayest that dropping houses and eke smoke and chiding waves make men to flee out of their own house. Ah, Bendicte, what aileth such an old man for to chide? Thou sayest we wives will our vices hide till we be fast, and then we will them shew. Well, may that be a proverb of a shrew. Thou sayest that oxen, asses, horses, hounds, they be assayed at differs stounds, basins and lavers, ere that men them buy, spoonus, stoolus, and all such husbandry, and so be pots and clothes and awry. But folk of wives make none assay, till they be wedded, old dotard shrew. And then, sayest thou, we will our vices shew. Thou sayest also, that it, displeaseth, that it displeaseth me, but if that thou wilt praise my beauty, and but thou pour always upon my face, and call me a fair dame in every place, and but thou make a feast on thilke day that I was born, and make me fresh and gay, and but thou do to my Norris honour, and to my chamberer within my bower, and to my father's folk, and mine allies, and mine allies. Thus sayest thou, old barrel full of lies. And yet also of our prentice Jenkin, for his crisp hair shining as gold so fine, and for he squireth me both up and down, yet hast thou caught a false suspicion. I will him not, though thou wert dead to-morrow. But tell me this, why hidest thou with sorrow, the keys of thy chest away from me. It is my good as well as thine, party. What thinks to make an idiot of our dame? 
Now by that Lord that called his Saint James, thou shalt not both, although that thou wert wood, be master of my body and my good. The one thou shalt forego, maugre thine iron. What helpeth it of me to inquire and spy in? I trow thou wouldest lock me in thy chest. Thou shouldest say, Fair wife, go where thee lest. Take your disport. I will believe no tales. I know you for a true wife, Dame Alice. We love no man. What taketh keep or charge where that we go, we will be at our large. Of all the men most blessed may he be, the wise astrologer, Dan Ptolemy, that saith this proverb in his Almagest. Of all men his wisdom is highest, that recketh not who hath the world in hand. By this proverb thou shalt well understand, have thou enough, what thar thee wreck or care, how merrily that other folks fare. For certes, old dotard, by your leave, ye shall have pleasure right enough at eve. He is too great a niggard that will wern a man to light a candle at his lantern. He shall have never the less light, pardy. Have thou enough, thee thar, not plind thee, thou sayest also. If that we make us gay with clothing and with precious array, that it is peril of our chastity. And yet with sorrow thou enforcest thee, and sayest these words in the apostle's name. Inhabit made with chastity and shame, ye women shall apparel you, quoth he, and not in tressed hair and gay pari, as pearls nor with gold nor clothes rich. After thy text, nor after thy rubric, I will not work as much as a gnat. Thou sayest also, I walk out like a cat, for whoso will descend the cat's skin, then will the cat a well dwell in her inn. And if the cat's skin be sleek and gay, she will not dwell in house half a day, but forth she will, ere any day be dawed, to shew her skin and go a caterwaud. This is to say, if I be gay, sir shrew, I will run out my borel for to shew. Sir old a fool, what helpeth thee to spy in? Though thou pray Argus with his hundred iron to my wardacorpse, as he can best in faith, he shall not keep me, but me lest. Yet could I make his beard, so may I the. Thou sayest eke that there be thingest three, which thingest greatly trouble all this earth, and that no wight may endure the firth. O Lephus, sir shrew, may Jesus short thy life. Yet preachest thou, and sayest thou, a hateful wife he reckoned is for one of these mischances. But there are none other manner resemblances that ye may liken your parables unto, but if a silly wife be one of those. Thou likenest a woman's love to hell, to barren land where water may not dwell. Thou likenest it also to wild fire. The more it burns, the more it hath desire to consume everything that burnt will be. Thou sayest, right as wormish end, a tree. Right so a wife destroyeth her husband. This know they well that be to wives bond. Lordings write thus, as ye have understand, bear I stiffly mine old husbands on hand, that thus they sighed in their drunkenness. And all was false, but that I took witness on Jenkin, and upon my niece also. O oh Lord, the pain I did them, and the woe, full guiltless by God a sweet pine. For as a horse I could a bite and whine, I could a plain, and I was in the guilt, or else oft time I had been spilt, who so first cometh to the nil, first grint. I plained first, so was our wary stint. They were full glad to excuse them full blithe, Of things that they never a guilt their live. Of wenches would I bear them on hand, When that for sickness scarcely might they stand, Yet tickled I his heart, for that he weaneth, That I had of him so great chert. I swore that all my walking out by night Was for to espy wenches that he dight. Under that colour I had many a mirth, For all such wit is given us at birth. Deceit, weeping, and spinning, God doth give to women kindly, While that they may live. And thus of one thing I may vaunt a me, At the end I had the better in each degree, By slight or force, or by some manner thing, As by continual murmur or grudging, Namely a bed, there had they mischance, There would I chide, and do them no pleasance. I would no longer in the bed abide, If that I felt his arm over my side, Till he had made his ransom unto me, then would I suffer him do his nicety, 
and therefore every man this tale I tell, win whoso may, for all is for to sell. With empty hand men may no hawkis lure, for winning would I all his will endure, and make me a feigned appetite. And yet in bacon had I never delight. That made me that I ever would them chide, for though the Pope had sitten them beside, I would not spare them at their own board, for by my troth I quit them word for word, as help me very God omnipotent. Though I write now should make my testament, I owe them not a word, that is not quit, I brought it so about by my wit, that they must give it up, as for the best or else we had never been in rest. For though he look it as a wood lion, yet should he fail of his conclusion. Then would I say, now, good Alefa, tack keep, how meekly looketh Wilkin our sheep. Come near, my spouse, and let me ba thy cheek. Ye shall be all patient and meek, and have a sweet e spiced conscience, since ye so preached of Job's patience. Suffer alway, since ye so well can preach, and but ye do, certain we shall you teach that it is fair to have a wife in peace. One of us two must bow, doubtless, and since a man is more reasonable than woman is, ye must be sufferable. What aileth you to grudge thus and groan? Is it for ye would have my love alone? Why, take it all. Lo, have it every deal, Peter. Shrew you, but ye love it well, for if I would sell my bellachos, I could walk as fresh as is a rose. But I will keep it for your own tooth. Ye be to blame by God, I say you sooth. Such manner word as had we on hand." Now will I spake of my fourth husband. My fourth husband was a reveller, that is to say he had a paramour, and I was young and full of raggery, stubborn and strong, and jolly as a pie. Then could I dance to a harp a small, and sing you wis, as any nightingale, when I had drunk a draught of sweet wine. Natalius, the foul churl, the swine, that with a staff bereft his wife of life, for she drank wine, though I had been his wife. Never should he have daunted me from drink. And after wine of Venus, most I think. For all so sure as cold engenders hail, A licorice mouth must have a licorice tail. In woman vinolent is no defence, This no lechers by experience. But Lord Christ, when that it remembereth me Upon my youth and on my jollity, It tickleth me about mine heart root. Unto this day it doth mine heart boot, that I have had my world as in my time. But age, alas, that all will envenime, hath me bereft my beauty and my pith. Let go, farewell, the devil go therewith. The flower is gone, there is no more to tell, the bran, as I best may, now must I sell. But yet to be right merry will I fand, now forth to tell you of my fourth husband. I say, I in my heart, and great despite, that he of any other had delight. But he was quit by God and by St. Joseph. I made for him of the same wood a cross. Not of my body in no foul manner, But certainly I made folks such cheer, That in his own grease I made him fry For anger and for very jealousy. By God in earth I was his purgatory, For which I hope his soul may be in glory, For, God it wot, he sat full oft and sung, When that his shoe full bitterly him wrung. There was no wight save God and he, that wist in many wise how sore I did him twist. He died when I came from Jerusalem, and lies in grave under the rudebeam, although his tomb is not so curious as was the sepulchre of Darius, which that appell is wrought so subtly. It is but waste to bury them preciously. Let him farewell, God give his soul rest. He is now in his grave and in his chest. Now of my fifth husband will I tell, God let his soul never come into hell, And yet was he to me the most shrew, That feel I on my ribbis all by rue, And ever shall until mine ending day. But in our bed he was so fresh and gay, And therewithal so well could he me glossa, When that he would have my bell shows, Though he had beaten me on every bone, Yet could he win again my love anon. I trow I loved him better, for that he was of his love so dangerous to me. We women have, if that I shall not lie in this manner, a quaint fantasy. Whatever thing we may not lightly have, thereafter will we cry all day and crave. Forbid us thing, and that desire we, 
Press on us fast, and then a we will flee. With danger utter we all our chaffare, Great press at market maketh dear wear, And too great cheap is held at little price. This knoweth every woman that is wise. My fifth husband, God his soul bless, Which that I took for love and no riches, He sometime was a clerk of Oxenford, And had left school and went at home to board With my gossip dwelling in our town. God have her soul, her name was Alison. She knew my heart and all my privity, But then our parish priest, so may I the. To her betrayed I my counsel all, For had my husband pissed on a wall, Or done a thing that should have cost his life To her and to another worthy wife, And to my niece which that I loved well, I would have told his counsel and every deal. And so I did full often, God it wot, that made his face full often red and hot for every shame, and blamed himself. For he had told me so great a privity, and so befell that once in a Lent, so oftentimes I to my gossip went, for ever yet I loved to be gay, and for to walk in March, April, and May, from house to house, to hear sundry tales, that Jenkin clerk and my gossip, Dame Alice, and I myself, into the field as went. Mine husband was at London all that Lent. I had the better leisure for to play, And for to see, and eke for to be say, Of lusty folk. What wist I where my grace was shapen for to be, Or in what place? Therefore made I my visitations, To vigilies, and to processions, To preachings eke, and to these pilgrimages, To plays of miracles and marriages, And weird upon me gay scarlet guites, these worms, nor these moths, nor these mites, On my apparel fret them never a deal, And know'st thou why? For they were used well. Now will I tell forth what happened me. I say that in the field is walked we, Till truly we had such dalliance, This clerk and I, that of my purveyance I spake to him, and told him how that he, If I were widow, should wedded me. For certainly I say for no bobbins, Yet was I never without purveyance of marriage, nor of other things eke. I hold a mouse's wit, not worth a leek, That hath but one hole for to start to, And if that fail, then is all I do. I bear him on hand, he had enchanted me, My dame taught me that subtlety, And eke I said, I met of him all night, He would have slain me as I lay upright, And all my bed was full of very blood. But yet I hoped that he should do me good, For blood betokened gold, as me was taught. And all was false, I dreamed of him, right not, But as I was followed I my dame's lore, As well of that as of other things more. But now, sir, let me see, what shall I sign? Aha! By God, I have my tale again. When that my fourth husband was on beer, I wept Algate and made a sorry cheer, As wives must, for it is the usage, And with my kerchief covered my visage. But, for I was provided with a make, I wept but little that I undertake, to Churchill was mine husband born a-morrow, With neighbours that for him made sorrow, And Jenkin, our clerk, was one of tho, As help me God, when that I saw him go, After the beer, methought he had a pair of legis, And of feet so clean and fair, That all my heart I gave unto his hold. He was, I trow, a twenty winter old, And I was forty, if I shall say sooth. Gat-toothed I was, and that became me well, I had the print of St. Venus's seal. As help me God, I was a lusty one, and fair, and rich, and young, and well begone. For certes, I am all venerian in feeling, and my heart is Martian. Venus me gave my lust and licorishness, and Mars gave me my sturdy hardiness. Mine ascendant was Torah, and Mars therein. Alas, alas, that ever love was sin. I followed I mine inclination by virtue of my constellation. That made me that I could not withdraw my chamber of Venus from a good fella. Yet have I Marta's mark upon my face, and also in another privy place. For God so wisely be my salvation, I loved never by discretion, but ever followed mine own appetite. All where he short, or long, or black, or white, I took no keep so that he liked me. How poor he was, neither of what degree. What should I say, but that at the month's end this jolly clerk, Jenkin, that was so hend, had wedded me with great solemnity, and to him gave I all the land and fee that ever was me given there before. 
but afterward repented me full sore. He will suffer nothing of my list. By God he smote me once with his fist, for that I rent out of his book a leaf, that of the stroke of mine ear waxed all deaf. Stubborn I was, as is a lioness, and of my tongue a very jangleress. And walk I would, as I had done before, from house to house, although he had it sworn, for which he oftentimes will preach, and me of old Roman justice teach how that Sulpicius Gallius left his wife, and forsook for term of all his for naught but open-headed he her say, looking out at his door upon a day. Another Roman told he me by name, that for his wife was at a summer game without his knowing, he forsook her eke, and then would he upon his Bible seek that ilk a proverb of Ecclesiast, where he commandeth and forbiddeth fast, man shall not suffer his wife go roll about. Then would he say right thus without a doubt, Whoso that buildeth his house all of sallows, and pricketh his blind horse over the fallows, and suffereth his wife to go seek hallows, is worthy to be hanged on the gallows. But all for naught, I set not a haw of his proverbs, nor of his old saw, nor would I not of him corrected be. I hate them that my vices tell me, and so do more of us, God wot, than I. This made him wood with me all utterly. I will not forbear him in no case. Now will I say you sooth by St. Thomas, why that I rent out of his book a leaf, for which he smote me, so that I was deaf. He had a book that gladly night and day, for his disport, he would it read alway. He called it Valerie and Theoprast, and with that book he laughed alway full fast. And eke there was a clerk some time at Rome, a cardinal that hight a Saint Jerome, that made a book against Jovinian, which book was there, and eke Tertullian, Chrysippus, Trotola, and Heloise, that was an abbess not far from Paris, and eke the parables of Solomon, Ovida's art, and Bordus many one. And all these were bound in one volume, and every night and day was his costume, when he had leisure and vacation from other worldly occupation, to read in this book of wicked wives. He knew of them more legends and more lives than be of good wives in the Bible. For, trust me well, it is an impossible that any clerk will speak a good of wives, but if it be of holy saints' lives, nor of none other woman, never the mo who painted the lion, tell it me, who? By God, if woman had a written stories, as clerkes have within their oratories, they would have writ of men more wickedness than all the mark of Adam, many redress the children of Mercury and Venus, be in their working full contrarious. Mercury loveth wisdom and science, and Venus loveth riot and dispense, and for their diverse disposition each falls in others' exaltation, as thus, God wot, Mercury is desolate in Pisces, where Venus is exalted, and Venus falls where Mercury is raised. Therefore no woman by no clerk is praised. The clerk, when he is old, and may not do a Venus's works not worth his oldest shoe, then sits he down, and writes in his dotage, that women cannot keep their marriage. But now to purpose, why I told thee that I was beaten for a book party. Upon a night Jenkin, that was our sire, read on his book as he sat by the fire, of Eva first, that for her wickedness was all mankind brought into wretchedness, for which that Jesus Christ himself was slain, that bought us with his heart blood again. Lo here express of women may ye find, that woman was the loss of all mankind. Then he read me how Samson lost his hair sleeping, his leman cut them with her shears, through which a treason lost he both his iron. Then he read me, if that I shall not lion, of Hercules and of his Dejanir. That caused him to set himself on fire. Nothing forgot he of the care and woe that Socrates had with his wives too. How Xantippe cast piss upon his head. This silly man sat still, as he were dead, his whipped head, and no more durst he sign, but, ere the thunder stint, there cometh rain. Of Phasiphae, that was queen of Crete, for shrewdness he thought the tale sweet. 
Fie, speak no more, it is a grisly thing, Of her horrible lust and her liking, Of Clytemnestra for her lechery, That falsely made her husband for to die, He read it with full good devotion. He told me eke for what occasion Amphiorax at Thebes lost his life. My husband had a legend of his wife, Eraphile, that for an out of gold, had privily unto the Greeks told, where that her husband hid him in a place for which he had at Thebes sorry grace. Of Luna, he told me, and of Luci, they both made their husbands for to die, that one for love, that other was for hate. Luna, her husband, on an evening late, empoisoned had, for that she was his foe. Lucia licorice loved her husband so, that for he should always upon her think, she gave him such a manner love-drink, that he was dead before it were the morrow. And thus Algate's husbands had a sorrow. Then he told me how one Latimeus complained to his fellow Arius, that in his garden growed such a tree, on which he said how, that his wives three hanged themselves for heart dispiteous. O oh, leave a brother, quoth this Arius, give me a plant of thilk a blessed tree, and in my garden planted shall it be. Of later date of wives hath he read, That some have slain their husbands in their bed, And let their letter dight them all the night, While that the corpse lay on the floor upright. And some have driven nails into their brain, While that they slept, and thus they have them slain. Some have them given poison in their drink. He spake more harm than heart a may bethink. And therewithal he knew of more proverbs than in this world there groweth grass or herbs. Better, quoth he, thine habitation be with a lion or a foul dragon than with a woman using for to chide. Better, quoth he, high in the roof abide than with an angry woman in the house they be so wicked and contrarious. They hate that their husbands loven, I, he said. A woman cast her shame away when she cast off her smock, and farthermore. A fair woman, but she be chaste also, is like a gold ring in a sow's nose. Who could ween, or who could suppose that woe in mine heart was, and the pine? And when I saw that he would never find to read in on this cursed book all night, all suddenly three leaves have I plight out of this book, right as he read, and eke, I with my fist so took him on the cheek, that in our fire he backward fell adown. And he upstart, as doth a wood lion, and with his fist he smote me on the head, that on the floor I lay as I were dead. And when he saw how still that there I lay, he was aghast, and would have fled away, till at the last out of my swoon I bride. Oh, hast thou slain me, thou false thief, I said? And for my land hast thou murdered me? Ere I be dead, yet will I kiss thee. And near he came, and kneeled fair adown, and said, Dear sister, Alison, as help me God, I shall thee never smite. For that I have done it is thyself too white. Forgive it me, and that I thee beseek. And yet eftsoons I hit him on the cheek, and said, Thief, thus much I am a reek. Now will I die, I may no longer speak. But at the last, with much care and woe, we fell accorded by ourselves too. He gave me all the bridle in my hand, to have the governance of house and land, and of his tongue, and of his hand also. I made him burn his book anon right, though, and when that I had gotten unto me, by mastery all the sovereignty, and that he said, Mine owen true wife, do as thee list the term of all thy life, keep thine honour, and keep mine estate. After that day we never had debate. God help me so, I was to him as kind as any wife from Denmark unto Ind, and also true, and so was he to me. I pray to God that sits in majesty, so bless his soul for his mercy dear. Now will I say my tale, if ye will hear. The friar laughed when he had heard all this. Now, dame, quoth he, so have I joy and bliss, this is a long preamble of a tale. And when the Sompnor heard the friar gale, Lo, quoth this Sompnor, God is arms too, a friar will intermeet him evermo. Lo, good men, a fly and eke a frere, Will fall in every dish and eke matter. 
What speak'st thou of perambulation? What? Amble or trot, or peace, or go sit down, Thou lettest our disport in this matter. Yea, wilt thou so, Sir Sompnour? quoth the frere. Now by my faith I shall, ere that I go, Tell of a Sompnour such a tale or two, That all the folk shall laugh in, in this place. Now do, else, friar, I beshrew thy face, quoth this Sompnour, and I beshrew me, but if I tell a tales two or three of friars ere I come to Sittingbourne, that I shall make thine heart for to mourn, for well I wot thy patience is gone. Our host cried, Peace, and that a nun, and said, Let the woman tell her tale, ye fair as folk that drunken be of ale. Do, dame, tell forth your tale, and that is best. Already, sir, quoth she, write as you lest. If I have license of this worthy frere? Yes, dame, quoth he, tell forth, and I will hear. THE TALE In all the days of the King Arthur, of which that Britain speak of great honour, all was this land full filled of fairy. The elf queen with her jolly company danced full oft in many a green maid. This was the old opinion, as I read. I speak of many hundred years ago, but now can no man see none elves mo, For now the great charity and prayers of limitors, and other holy frères, that search every land and every stream, as thick as motes in the sunbeam, blessing halls, chambers, kitchens and bowers, cities and burgess, castles high and towers, thorps and barns, shepens and dairies. This makes that there be now no fairies. For there is one to walk a was an elf, There walketh now the limitor himself, In undermells and in morrowings, And saith his matins and his holy things As he goes in his limitation. Women may now go safely up and down, In every bush and under every tree. There is none other incubus but he, And he will do them no dishonour. And so befell it, that this King Arthur had in his house a lusty bachelor, that on a day came riding from river, and happened that, alone as she was born, he saw a maiden walking him before, of which maiden anon mogre her head, by very force he reft her maidenhead, for which oppression was such clamour and such pursuit unto the King Arthur, that damned was this knight for to be dead by course of law, and should have lost his head. Peraventure such was the statute, though, but that the queen and other ladies mo, so long they prayed the king of his grace, till he his life him granted in the place, and gave him to the queen, all at her will, to choose whether she would save him or spill. The queen thanked the king with all her might. And after this thus spake she to the knight, when that she saw her time upon a day, Thou standest yet, quoth she, in such array, that of thy life yet hast thou no surety. I grant thee life, if thou canst tell to me what thing is it that women most desire in. Beware, and keep thy neck-bone from the iron. And if thou canst not tell it me anon, yet will I give thee leave for to gone a twelve-month and a day, to seek and leer, and answer suffisant in this matter. And surety will I have, ere that thou pace, Thy body for to yielden in this place. Woe was the knight, and sorrowfully psyched, But what, he might not do all as him liked, And at the last he chose him for to wend, And come again right at the year's end, With such answer as God would him purvey, And took his leave, and wended forth his way. He sought in every house and every place, Whereas he hoped for to find a grace, To learn what thing women love the most. But he could not arrive in any coast, Whereas he might find in this matter Two creatures according and fair. Some said that women loved best riches, Some said honour, and some said jolliness, Some rich array, and some said lust a bed, And oft time to be widow and to be wed. Some said that we are in our heart most eased, When that we are y flattered and y praised. He went full nigh the sooth, I will not lie, A man shall win us best with flattery, And with attendance and with business, Be we y lamed, both more and less. 
and some men said that we do love the best for to be free, and do right as us lest, and that no man reprove us of our vice, but say that we are wise and nothing nice. For truly there is none among us all, if any wight will claw us on the gall, that will not kick, for that he saith us sooth. A say, and he shall find it, that so doth. For be we never so vicious within, we will be held both wise and clean of sin. And some men said, that great delight have we, for to be held stable and eke sacred. And in one purpose steadfastly to dwell, and not beray, a thing that men us tell. But that tale is not worth a rake steel. Pardy, we women can a nothing heal. Witness on Midas, will ye hear the tale? Ovid, amongst other things, small. Saith Midas had, under his long hairs, Growing upon his head, two asses' ears, The which vice he hid, as best he might, Full subtly from every man's sight. That, save his wife, there knew of it no more. He loved her most, and trusted her also. He prayed her that no creature she would tell in of his disfigure, she swore him, nay, for all the world to win, she would not do that villainy or sin, to make her husband have so foul a name. She would not tell it for her own shame. But natheless her thought that she died, that she so long should a counsel hide. Her thought it swelled so sore about her heart, that needes must some word from her a start, and, since she durst not tell it unto man down to a marish fast, thereby she ran, till she came there, her heart was all afire, and, as a bittern bumbles in the mire, she laid her mouth unto the water down. Beray me not, thou water, with thy sound, quoth she, to thee I tell it, and no more. Mine husband hath long ass's ears too, now is mine heart all whole, now is it out, I might no longer keep it out of doubt. Here, may ye see, though we a time abide, Yet out it must, we can no counsel hide. The remnant of the tale, if ye will hear, Read in Ovid, and there ye may it leer. This knight, of whom I tell especially, When that he saw he might not come thereby, That is to say, what women love the most, Within his breast full sorrowful was his ghost. But home he went, for he might not sojourn, the day was come that homeward he must turn, and in his way it happened him to ride, in all his care, under a forest side, where as he saw upon a dance go of ladies four and twenty, and yet mo. Toward this ilka dance he drew full yearn, the hope that he some wisdom there should learn. But certainly, ere he came fully there, he vanished was this dance, he knew not where. No creature saw he that bare life, save on the green he sitting saw a wife. A fouler wight there may no man devise. Against this knight this old wife gan to rise, and said, Sir knight, hereforth, lieth no way. Tell me what ye are seeking by your fay. Peraventure it may the better be. These old folk know much a thing, quoth she. My leve mother, quoth this knight, certain I am but dead. But if that I can sign, what thing it is that women most desire? Could ye me wis? I would well quite your hire. Plight me thy troth here in mine hand, quoth she. The next thing that I require of thee, thou shalt it do, if it be in thy might, and I will tell it thee ere it be night. Have here my troth, quoth the knight. I grant. Then, quoth she, I dare me well avant, thy life is safe, for I will stand thereby, upon my life the queen will say as I. Let's see which is the proudest of them all, that wears either a kerchief or a call, that dare say nay to that I shall you teach. Let us go forth without a longer speech. Then rowned she a pistol in his ear, and bade him to be glad, and have no fear. When they were come unto the court this night, said, he had held his day as he had height, and ready was his answer as he said, Full many a noble wife, and many a maid, and many a widow, for that they be wise. The queen herself, sitting as a justice, assembled be his answer for to hear, and afterward this knight was bid appear. 
to every white commanded was silence, and that the knight should tell in audience what thing that worldly women love the best. This night he stood not still as doth a beast, but to this question anon answered, with manly voice that all the court it heard. My liege lady, generally, quoth he, women desire to have the sovereignty as well over their husband as their love, and for to be in the mastery him above. This is your most desire, though ye may kill, do as you list, I am here at your will. In all the court there was no wife, nor maid, nor widow, that contraried what he said, but said, he worthy was to have his life. And with that word upstart that old wife, which that the knight saw sitting on the green. Mercy, quoth she, my sovereign lady queen, ere that your court depart, do me right. I taught this answer unto this knight, for which he plighted me his troth there, the first thing I would of him require. He would it do if it lay in his might. Before this court, then, I pray thee, sir knight, quoth she, that thou me take unto thy wife, for well thou knowest that I have kept thy life. If I say false, say nay, upon thy fay. This knight answered, Alas, and well away, I know right well that such was my behest. For God's love, choose a new request, take all my good, and let my body go. Nay, then, quoth she, I shrew us both too, for though that I be old and foul and poor, I nulled for all the metal nor the ore, that under earth is grave, or lies above, but if thy wife I were, and eke thy love. My love, quoth he, nay, my damnation, alas, that any of my nation should ever so foul disparaged be. But all for naught, the end is this, that he constrained was, that needs he must wed and take this old wife, and go to bed. Now will the some men say, paraventure, that for my negligence I do no cure, to tell you all the joy and all the ray that at the feast was made that ilka day. To which thing shortly answerin I shall, I say there was no joy nor feast at all, there was but heaviness and much sorrow, for privily he wed her on the morrow and all day after hid him as an owl. So woe was him, his wife looked so foul. Great was the woe the knight had in his thought, when he was with his wife to bed he brought. He wallowed, and he turned to and fro. This old wife lay smiling evermore, and said, Dear husband, Benedict, fair is every knight thus with his wife as ye? Is this the law of King Arthur's house? Is every knight of his thus dangerous? I am your own love, and eke your wife. I am she which that saved hath your life. And certes yet did I you ne'er unright. Why fare ye thus with me this first night? Ye fare like a man had lost his wit. What is my guilt? For God's love tell me it, and it shall be amended if I may. Amended, quoth this knight, Alas, nay, nay, it will not be amended never mo. Thou art so loathly, and so old also, and thereto comest of so low a kind, that little wonder though I wallow and wind. So will to God mine heart would breast. Is this, quoth she, the cause of your unrest? Yea, certainly, quoth he, no wonder is. Now, sir, quoth she, I could amend all this, if that me list, ere it were days three. So well ye might bear you unto me, but for ye speaken of such gentleness as is descended out of old riches, that therefore shall ye be gentlemen. Such arrogancy is not worth a hen. Look who that is most virtuous alway, prive and apert, and most intendeth I to do the gentle deeds that he can and take him for the greatest gentleman. Christ will we claim of him our gentleness, not of our elders for their old riches, for though they gave us all their heritage, for which we claim to be of high parage, yet may they not bequeath for no thing to none of us their virtuous living that made them gentlemen called to be. 
and bade us follow them in such degree. Well can the wise poet of Florence, that height Dante, speak of this sentence. Lo, in such manner rhyme is Dante's tale. Full celled, upriseth by his branches small prowess of man, for God of his goodness wills what we claim of him our gentleness. For of our elders may we nothing claim but temporal things that man may hurt and maim. Eke every white knows this as well as I, if gentleness were planted naturally unto a certain lineage down the line, prive and apert, then would they never find to do of gentleness the fair office, then might they do no villainy or vice. Take fire and bear it to the darkest house betwixt this and the mount of Caucasus, and let men shut the doors and go then. Yet will the fire as fair and light bren, as twenty thousand men might it behold, its office natural eye will it hold, on peril of my life till that it die. Here may ye see well how that gentry is not annexed to possession, since folk do not their operation alway, as doth the fire, lo, in its kind, for, God it wot, men may full often find, a lord's son do shame and villainy. And he that will have price of his gentry, for he was born of a gentle house, and had his elders noble and virtuous, and will himself do no gentle deeds, nor follow his gentle ancestry, that dead is. He is not gentle, be he duke or earl, for villain sinful deedest make a churl. For gentleness is but the renomy of thine ancestors for their high bounty, which is a strange thing to thy person. Thy gentleness cometh from God alone. Then comes our very gentleness of grace, it was no thing bequeathed us with our place. Think how noble, as saith Valerius, was Thilca Tullius Hostilius, that out of Provert rose to high reed in Senec, and reed ache in Boeta. There shall ye see express, that it no dread is, that he is gentle that doth gentle deeds. And therefore, leve husband, I conclude, albeit that mine ancestors were rude, yet may the high God, and so hope I, Grant me his grace to live virtuously. Then am I gentle, when that I begin to live virtuously, and wave sin. And whereas ye of povert me reprieve, The high God on whom that we believe, In willful provert chose to lead his life, And certes every man, maiden or wife, May understand that Jesus, heaven's king, Ne would not choose a virtuous living. Glad povert is an honest thing, certain. This will Senec and other clerkes sign, Whoso that holds him paid of his provert, I hold him rich, though he hath not a shirt. He that coveteth is a poor wight, For he would have what is not in his might, But he that not hath, nor coveteth to have, Is rich, although ye hold him but a knave. Very povert is sin properly, Juvenal saith of povert merrily, The poor man, when he goes by the way, Before the thieves, he may sing and play. Povert is hateful good, And, as I guess, a full great bringer out of business. A great amender ache of sapience, To him that taketh it, <coughs> To him that taketh it in patience. Povert is this, although it seem a lange, Possession that no wight will challenge, Povert, full often, when a man is low, Makes him his God, and eke himself to know. Povert, a spectacle is, as thinketh me, Through which he may his very friend see. And therefore, sir, since that I you not grieve, Of my povert no more may reprieve. Now, sir, of elder ye reprieve me, And certes, sir, though none authority Wherein no book ye gentles of honour, Say that men should an old white honour, and call him father for your gentleness. And author shall I find in as I guess. Now there ye say that I am foul and old, Then dread ye not to be a cuckold. For filth and eld, also may I the, Be great wardens upon chastity. But natheless, since I know your delight, I shall fulfil your worldly appetite. Choose now, quoth she, one of these things twy, 
to have me foul and old till that I day, and be to you a true humble wife, and never you displease in all my life, or else will ye have me young and fair, and take your adventure of the repair that shall be to your house because of me, or in some other place, it may well be. Now choose yourself whether that you liketh. This knight adviseth him, and sore he saketh. But at the last he said in this manner, My lady and my love, and wife so dear, I put me in your wise governance. Choose for yourself which may be most pleasance, and most honour to you and me also. I do no force the weather of the two, for as you liketh it sufficeth me. Then have I got the mastery, quoth she, since I may choose and govern as me lest. Yea, certes, wife, quoth he, I hold it best. Kiss me, quoth she, we are no longer wroth, for by my troth I will be to you both. This is to say, yea, both fair and good. I pray to God that I may serve a wood, but I to you be all so good and true, as ever was wife since the world was new. And but I be to-morrow as fair to seen, as any lady, empress, or queen, that is betwixt the east and eke the west, do with my life and death right as you lest. Cast up the curtain, and look how it is. And when the knight saw verily all this, that she so fair was, and so young thereto, for joy he hent her in his arms too, his heart bathed in a bath of bliss, a thousand times on row he gain her kissed. And she obeyed him in every thing, that might do him pleasant or liking, and thus they live unto their lives end in perfect joy. And Jesus Christ us send husbands meek and young, and fresh in bed, and grace to overlive them that we wed. And eke I pray, Jesus, to short their lives, that we'll not be governed by their wives. And old and angry niggards of dispense, God send them soon a very pestilence. End of the Wife of Bath of Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Edited by D. Lang Purves. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer, and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Friar's Tale The Prologue This worthy limitor, this noble frere, he made always a manner lowering chair upon the sompnor, but for honesty no villain word as yet to him spake he. But at the last he said unto the wife, Dame, quoth he, God give you right good life. Ye have here touched, also may ye thee, in school, matter, a great difficulty. Ye have said much a thing right well, I say, but, dame, here as we ride by the way, us needeth not but for to speak of Gama, and leave authorities in God's name, to preaching and to school ache of clergy. But if it like unto this company, I will you of a sompnor tell a Gama. Pardi, ye may well know by the name, that of a sompnor may no good be said. I pray that none of you be evil paid. A sompnor is a runner up and down, with mandaments for fornication, and is e beat at every town's end. Then spake our host, Ah, sir, ye should be hend and courteous, as a man of your estate. In company we will have no debate. Tell us your tale, and let the sompnor be. Nay, quoth the sompnor, let him say by me what so him list. When it comes to my lot, by God I shall him quiet in every groat. I shall him tell her what a great honour it is to be a flattering limitor. And his office I shall him tell e wis. Our host answered, Peace, no more of this. And afterward he said unto the frere, 
Tell forth your tale, mine Owen master dear. THE TALE Whilom there was dwelling in my country an archdeacon, a man of high degree, that boldly did execution in punishing of fornication, of witchcraft and ache of bawdery, of defamation and adultery, of churcheries and of testaments, of contracts and of lack of sacraments, and ache of many another manner crime, which needeth not rehearsen at this time, of usury and simony also, but certes lechers did he greatest woe. They should singen, if that they were hent, and smalle tithers were if foully shent, if any person would on them complain. There might start them no pecunial pain, for smalle tithes and small offering he made the people piteously to sing, for ere the bishop caught them with his crook, they were in the archdeacon's book. Then had he through his jurisdiction power to do on them correction. He had a sumpnor ready to his hand, a slyer boy was none in England, for subtly he had his espial, that taught him well where it might aught avail. He could a spare of lechers one or two to teach a him to four and twenty more. For, though this sompnor would be as a hare, to tell his harlotry I will not spare, for we be out of their correction, they have of us no jurisdiction, nay, never shall have term of all their lives. Peter, so be the women of the stives, quoth this sompnor, e put out of our cure. Peace with mischance and with misaventure, our hostess said, and let him tell his tale. Now tell a forth and let the sump nor gale, nor spare not, mine Owen master dear. This false thief, the sump nor, quoth the frere, had always bought as ready to his hand as any hawk to lure in England that told him all the secrets that they knew, for their acquaintance was not come of new, they were a his approvers privily. He took himself at great profit there be. His master knew not always what he won, without a mandament, a lewd man. He could summon on pain of Christus' curse. And they were inly glad to fill his purse, and make him great a feast as at the Nala, and right as Judas had a purse as smala and was a thief, right such a thief was he, his master had but half his duty. He was, if I shall give a him his laud, a thief, and eke a sompnor, and a bawd. And he had wenches at his retinue, that whether that Sir Robert, or Sir Hugh, or Jack, or Ralph, or whoso that it were, that lay by them, they told it in his ear. Thus were the wench and he of one assent, and he would fetch a feigned mandament, and to the chapter summon them both two, and pill the man, and let the wench a go. Then would he say, Friend, I shall for thy sake do strike thee out of our letters, Blake. Thee thar no more as in this case travail. I am thy friend, where I may thee avail. Certain he knew of bribers many more than possible is to tell in year as two. For in this world is no dog for the bow that can a hurt dear from a hole a no. Bet then this sompnor knew a sly lechor, or an adulterer, or a paramour, and for that was the fruit of all his rent, therefore on it he set all his intent. And so befell that once upon a day this sompnor, waiting ever on his prey, rode forth to summon a widow, an old ribibe feigning a cause, for he would have a bribe. And happened that he saw before him ride a gay yeoman, under a forest side. A bow he bare, and arrows bright and keen, he had upon a courtepy of green, a hat upon his head with fringes black. Sir, quoth this sompnor, hail and well or tack. Welcome, quoth he, and every good fellow, Whither ridest thou under this green shaw? Say to this yeoman, Wilt thou far to-day? The sompnor answered him, and said, Nay, here fast by, quoth he, is mine intent, 
to ride for to raisen up a rent that longeth to my lord's duty ah art thou then a bailiff yea quoth he he durst a not for very filth and shame say that he was a sompnor for the name de pardieu quoth this yeoman leve a brother thou art a bailiff and i am another i am unknown as in this country of thine acquaintance i will pray a thee and eke of brotherhood if that thee list i have a gold and silver lying in my chest if that thee hap to come unto our shire all shall be thine right as thou wilt desire grand mercy quoth this sompnor by my faith each in the other's hand his troth alaith for to be sworn a brethren till they day in dalliance they ride aforth and play this sompnor which that was as full of jangles as full of venom be those wary angles and ever inquiring upon every thing brother quoth he where is now your dwelling another day if that i should you seech this yeoman him answered in soft speech brother quoth he far in the north country where as i hope some time i shall thee see ere we depart i shall thee so well wis that of mine house shalt thou never miss now brother quoth this sompnor i you pray teach me while that we ride by the way since that ye be a bailiff as i am some subtlety and tell me faithfully for mine office how that i most may win and spare not for conscience or for sin but as my brother tell me how do ye now by my troth a brother mine said he as i shall tell to thee a faithful tale my wages be full straight and eke full smale my lord is hard to me and dangerous and mine office is full laborious and therefore by extortion i live for sooth i take all that men will me give algata by slighter or by violence from year to year i win all my dispense i can no better tell thee faithfully now certes quoth this sompnor so far ye ye spare not to take god it wot but if it be too heavy or too hot what he may get in counsel privily no manner conscience of that have ye ne'er mine extortion ye might not live for of such japers will ye not be shrive stomach nor conscience no ye none ye shrew the shrift of fathers every one well be we met by god and by saint jam but leve a brother tell me then thy name quoth this sompnor right in this mean a while this yeoman gan a little for to smile brother quoth he wilt thou that e thee tell i am a fiend my dwelling is in hell and here i ride about my purchasing to know where men will give me anything my purchase is the fact of all my rent look how thou ridest for the same intent to win a good thou reckest never how right so fair ye for ride a willy now into the world is ende for a prey ah quoth this sompnor benedicite what say ye ye weened ye were a yeoman truly ye have a manner shape as well as ye have ye then a figure determinate in hell where ye be in your estate nay certainly quoth he there have we none but when us liketh we can take us one or ellas make you seem that we be shape some time like a man or like an ape or like an angel can ye ride or go it is no wondrous thing though it be so a lousy juggler can deceive thee and pardie yet can he more craft than he why quoth the sompnor ride ye then or gone in sundry shapes and not always in one for we quoth he will us in such form mock as most is able our prey for to talk what maketh you to have all this labour full many a cause leve sir sompnor said this fiend but all thing hath a time the day is short and it is passed prime and yet have ye won nothing in this day ye will intend to winning if ye may and not intend our thing is to declare for brother mine thy wit is all too bare to understand although he told them thee 
but for thou askest, why labore we? For sometimes we be God's instruments, and meanest to do his commandments. When that him list upon his creatures, in divers acts, and in divers figures, without a him we have no might certain, if that him list to stand there again, and sometimes at our prayer have we leave, only the body, not the soul, to grieve. Witness on Job, whom that we did full woe, and sometimes have we might on both the two. This is to say, on soul and body ache, and sometimes be we suffered for to seek upon a man and do his soul unrest, and not his body, and all is for the best, when he withstandeth our temptation, it is a cause of his salvation. Albeit, that it was not our intent, he should be safe, but that we should him hent. And sometimes be we servants unto man, as to the archbishop, St. Dunstan, and to the apostle servant, eke was he. Yet tell me, quoth this Sompnor, faithfully, Mac ye knew we bodies thus alway of the elements? The fiend answered, Nay, sometimes we feign, and sometimes we arise with dead bodies in full sundry wise, and speak as reasonably and fair and well as to the pythonus did Samuel. And yet will some men say it was not he, ye do no force of your divinity, but one thing warn ye thee, ye will not jop. Thou wilt all gate as wheat, how we be shop. Thou shalt hereafterward, my brother dear, come where thee needeth not of me to leer. For thou shalt by thine own experience conna in a chair to raid of this sentence, better than Virgil while he was alive, or Dante also. Now let us ride blithe, for you will hold a company with thee, till it be so that thou forsake me. Nay, quoth this Sompnor, that shall ne'er be tied. I am a yeoman, that is known full wide. My troth a willy hold, as in this casse, for though thou wert the devil, Satanas, my troth a willy hold to thee, my brother, as ye have sworn, and each of us to other, for to be true brethren in this casse, and both we go about in our purchase. Take thou thy part, what that men will thee give, and ye shall mine, thus may we both a live. And if that any of us have more than other, let him be true, and part it with his brother. Ye grant, quoth the devil, by my fay. And with that word they rode forth their way, and right at the entering of the townus end, to which the Sompnor shope him for to wend, they saw a cart, that charged was with hay, which that a carter drove forth on his way. Deep was the way for which the carter stood. The carter smote and cried as he were wood, Height, Scot, height, brook, what spare ye for the stones? The fiend, quoth he, you fetch body and bones, as far forthly as ever ye were fold, so much a woe as ye have with you thold. The devil have all, horses and cart and hay. The Sompnor said, Here shall we have a prey, and near the fiend he drew, as not ne were, full privily and rounded in his ear. Hearken, my brother, hearken by thy faith, hearst thou not how that the carter saith? Hent it anon, for he hath given it thee, both hay and cart, and ache his couples three. Nay, quoth the devil, God wot never a deal, it is not his intent, trust thou me well. Ask him thyself, if thou not trowest me, or else stint a while, and thou shalt see. The carter thwacked his horses on the croup, and they began to draw in and to stoop. Height now, quoth he, there, Jesus Christ you bless, and all his handiwork both more and less. That was well twight, mine own liart boy. I pray God save thy body, and St. Loy. Now is my cart out of the slough, pardee. Lo, brother, quoth the fiend, what told he thee? Here may ye see, mine own dear brother, the churl spake one thing, but he thought another. Let us go forth about in our voyage. Here we need nothing upon this carriage. When that they came somewhat out of the town, the Sompnor to his brother gan to round, Brother, quoth he, here one's an old Rebeck, 
that had almost as lief to lose her neck as for to give a penny of her good. I will have twelve pence, though that she be wood, or ye will summon her to our office, and yet, God wot, of her know ye no vis. But for thou canst not, as in this country, win a thy cost, take here example of me. This Sompnor clapped at the widow's gate. Come out, he said, thou old very trait. I trow thou hast some friar or priest with thee. Who clappeth? said this wife. Benedicite. God save you, sir, what is your sweet will? I have, quoth he, of summons here a bill. A pain of cursing, look that thou be to morrow before our archdeacon's knee to answer to the court of certain things. Now, Lord, quoth she, Christ Jesus, King of kings, so wisely help me, as ye not may, ye have been sick, and that full many a day, ye may not go so far, quoth she, nor ride, but ye be dead, so pricketh it my side. May ye not ask a libel, Sir Sompnour, and answer there by my procurator, to such thing as men would oppose me? Yes, quoth this Sompnour, pay anon, let's see, twelve pence to me, and ye will the acquit. Ye shall no profit have thereby but lit. My master hath the profit, and not ye. Come off, and let me ride hastily. Give me twelve pence, ye may no longer tarry. Twelve pence? quoth she. Now, Lady Saint Mary, so wisely help me out of care and sin, this wide world, though that ye should it win. No, have ye not twelve pence within my hold? Ye know full well that ye am poor and old. Kith your almas upon me, poor wretch. Nay, then, quoth he, the fowler fiend me fetch, if ye excuse thee, though thou shouldst be spilt. Alas, quoth she, God wot ye have no guilt. Pay me, quoth he, or by the sweet Saint Anne, as ye will bear away thy newer pan for debt, which thou owest me of old, when that thou madest thine husband cuckold, ye paid at home for thy correction. Thou liest, quoth she, by my salvation, never was ye e'er now, widow or wife, summoned unto your court in all my life, nor never ye was, but of my body true, unto the devil rough and black of hue, give ye thy body, and my pan also. And when the devil heard her curse so upon her knees, he said in this manner, Now, Mabily, mine own mother dear, is this your will in earnest that ye say? The devil, quoth she, so fetch him ere he day, and pan and all. But he will him repent? Nay, old stoat, that is not mine intent, quoth this Sompnor, for to repent to me, for any thing that ye have had of thee, ye would ye had thy smock and every cloth. Now, brother, quoth the devil, be not wroth, thy body and this pan be mine by right. Thou shalt with me to Hella yet to-night, where thou shalt knowen of our privity, more than a master of divinity. And with that word the foul fiend him hent, body and soul he with the devil went. Whereas the Sompnors have their heritage, and God that maked after his image mankind save and guide us all and some, and let this Sompnor a good man become. Lordings, I could have told you, quoth this frere, had he had leisure for this Sompnor here, after the text of Christ and Paul and John, and of our other doctors many a one, such pain as that your heart as might agrees, albeit so that no tongue may devise, though that ye might a thousand winters tell the pains of Thilke cursed house of hell, but for to keep us from that cursed place, wake we, and pray we Jesus of his grace. So keep us from the tempter, Satanas, hearken this word, beware as in this cas. The lion sits in his await all way, to slay the innocent, if that he may. Dispose an eye your heart as to withstand the fiend that would you mak a thrall and bond. He may not tempt you over your might, for Christ will be your champion and your knight, and pray that this our sump nor him repent of his misdeeds, ere that the fiend 
him hent. End of The Friar's Tale Read by Kara Schallenberg on February 24, 2006 In Oceanside, California This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 23, 2006. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poem by Chaucer, and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Sompnor's Tale The Prologue The Sompnor in his stirrups high he stood upon this friar he heart was so wood, that like an aspen leaf he quoke for ire, lordlings, quoth he, but one thing I desire, I you beseech that of your courtesy, since ye have heard this false friar lie, as suffer me I may my tale tell, this friar boasteth that he knoweth hell, and God it wot that is but little wonder, friars and fiends be but little asunder, for pardy Ye have often time heard tell how that a friar ravished was sent to hell, in spirit ones by a vision, and as an angel led him up and down to shew him all the pains that there were, in all the place saw not he a frere, of other folk he saw enough in woe. Unto the angel spake the friar, though, now, sir, quoth he, have friars such a grace that none of them shall come into this place? Yes, quoth the angel, many a million, and unto Satanus he led him down, and now hath Satanus, said he, a tale broader than that of a carrack is the sail. Hold up thy tail, thou Satanus, quoth he. Show forth thine erse, and let the friar see where is the nest of friars in this place. And less than half a furlong way of space, right so as bees swarming out of a hive, out of the devil's erse there gan to drive a twenty thousand friars on a rout, and throughout hell they swarmed all about, and came again as fast as they may gone and in his erse they crippled every one. He clapped his tail again, and lay full still. This friar, when he looked, had his fill upon the torments of that sorry place. His spirit God restored of his grace into his body again, and he awoke. But natheless for fear yet he quoke. So was the devil's erse I in his mind, that is his heritage of very kind. God save you all, save this cursed frere. My prologue will I end in this manner. THE TALE Lordlings, there is in Yorkshire, as I guess, a marshy country called Holderness, in which there went a limitor about to preach and eke to beg, it is no doubt. And so befell that on a day this frere had preached at a church in his manner, and specially above every thing excited he the people in his preaching to trentles and to give for God's sake wherewith men mighty holy houses make. There, as divine service is honoured, not there, as it is wasted and devoured, nor where it is needeth, not for to be given as to possessioners, that they may live in, thanked be God, in wealth and abundance, 
frontals, said he, deliver from penance their friendes souls as well old as young. Yea, when they be hastily sung, not for to hold a priest jolly and gay, he singeth not but one mass in a day. Deliver out, quoth he, anon the souls. Full hard it is, with flesh-hook or with owls, to be e clawed, or to burn or to bake. Now speed you hastily, for Christ's sake, and when this friar had said all his intent, with qui cum patre forth his way he went, when folk in church had given him what them lest, he went his way, no longer would he rest. With scrip and tipped shaft he tucked high, in every house he gan to pour and pry, and begged meal and cheese or Ella's corn. His fellow had a staff tipped with horn, a pair of tables all of ivory, and a pointel he polished fetishly, and wrote alway the names as he stood of all the folk that gave him any good. As cons that he would for them pray, Give us a bushel, wheat, or malt, or ray, A goddess kitchel, or a trip of cheese, Or ellis what you list, we may not cheese, And goddess half penny, or a mass penny, Or give us of your brawn, if ye have any, A dagon of your blanket, Levedame, Our sister dear, lo, here I write your name, Bacon or beef or such thing as ye find, A sturdy harlot went them I behind, That was their hostess man, and bare a sack, And what men gave them laid it on his back. And when that he was out at door anon, He planed away the names every one That he before had written in his tables. He served them with knifles, and with fables. Nay, there thou liest, thou Sompanor, quoth the frere. Peace, quoth our host, for Christ's mother dear, tell forth thy tale, and spare it not at all. So thrive I, quoth this Sompanor, so I shall. So long he went from house to house, till he came to a house where he was wont to be refreshed more than in a hundred places. Sick lay the husbandman, whose that place is, bed-rid upon a couch low he lay. Deus hic, quoth he, O Thomas' friend, good day, said this friar, all courteously and soft. Thomas, quoth he, God yielded you full oft. Have I upon this bench fared full well? Here have I eaten many a merry meal, And from the bench he drove away the cat, And laid down his potent and his hat, And eke his scrip, and sat himself adown, His fellow was he walked into the town, Forth with his knave, unto that hostelry, Where as he shope him that night to lie. O oh, dear master, quoth the sick man, How have ye fared since that march began? I saw you not this for to-night and more. God wot, quoth he, Labored have I full sore, And specially for thy salvation Have I said many a precious orison, And for mine other friends God them bless, I have this day been at your church a mess. And said sermon after my simple wit, Not all after the text of holy writ, For it is hard to you, as I suppose, And therefore will I teach you I the glose. Glosing is a full glorious thing certain, For letter slayeth, as we clerkes sayen, There have I taught them to be charitable, And spend their good where it is reasonable, and there I saw our dame. Where is she? Yonder I trow, that in the yard she be, said this man, and she will come anon. 
Hey, master, welcome be ye by St. John, said his wife. How fare ye heartily? This friar riseth up full courteously, and her embraceth in his armes narrow, and kissed her, sweet and chirketh as a sparrow with his lips. Dame, quoth he, right well, as he that is your servant every deal, thanked be God that gave you soul and life. Yet saw I not this day so fair a wife in all the church. God so save me. Yea, God amend defaulters, sir, quoth she. All gates welcome be ye by my fay. Grand mercy, dame, that I have found alway but of your great goodness by your leave. I would pray you that ye not you grieve. I will with Thomas speak a little throw, these curates be so negligent and slow to grope tenderly a conscience in shrift, and preaching is my diligence, and study in Peter's words and in Paul's, I will walk and fish Christian men's souls, to yield our Lord Jesus his proper rent, to spread his word is all a mine intent. Now by your faith, O oh dear sir, quoth she, chide him right well for sainted charity. He is I angry as is a pismire, though that he have all that he can desire, though I him wry every night, and make him warm, and over him lay my leg, and eke my arm. He groaneth as our boar that lies in sty. Other disport of him right none have I. I may not please him in no manner case. O Thomas, je vous dis, Thomas, Thomas, this maketh the fiend, this must be amended. Ire is a thing that high God hath defended, and thereof will I speak a word or two. Now, master, quoth the wife, ere that I go, what, will ye dine? I will go thereabout. Now, dame, quoth he, je vous dis sans doubt, had I not of a capon but the liver, and of your white bread not but a shiver, and after that a roasted pig's head, but I would that for me no beast were dead, then had I with you homely sufficience. I am a man of little sustenance. My spirit hath its fostering in the Bible. My body is I so ready and penable to wake that my stomach is destroyed. I pray you, dame, that ye be not annoyed. Though I so friendly you my counsel shew by God, I would have told it but to few. Now, sir, quoth she, but one word ere I go. My child is dead within these weekes too. Soon after that ye went out of this town. His death saw I by revelation, said this friar, at home in our door tour, I dare well say, that less than half an hour after his death I saw him born to bliss in mine vision, so God we wis. So did our sexton, and our fermier, that they have been true friars fifty year. They may know, God be thanked of his love, make her jubilee, and walk above. And up I rose, and all our convent eke, with many a tear trilling on my cheek, without a noise or clattering of bells, te deum was our song and nothing else save that to Christ I have made an orison, thanking him of my revelation. For, sir and dame, trust me well right, our orisons are more effectual, and more we see of Christ's secret things than borel folk, although that they are kings. 
we live in poverty and in abstinence, and borrow folk in riches and dispense of meat and drink, and in their foul delight we have this world's lust all in despite. Lazar and Dives lived diversely, and diverse guerdon had a they thereby, who so will pray, he must fast and be clean, and fat his soul and keep his body lean. We fare as saith the apostle, clothed and food suffice us, although they be not full good. The cleanliness and the fasting of us prayers Maketh that Christ accepteth our prayers. Lo, Moses forty day and forty night fasted, Ere that the high God full of might Spake with him in the mountain of Sinai, With empty womb of fasting many a day, Received he the law that was writ with God's finger, and Eli, well ye wit, in Mount Horeb, ere he had any speech with higher God that is our Liba's leech, he fasted long, and was in contemplance, Aaron that had the temple in governance, and eke the other priestes every one into the temple, when they should gone, to pray for the people, and to do service, that would drinken in no manner wise no drink which that may them drunken make, but there in abstinence pray and wake, lest that they died take heed what I say, but they be sober that for the people pray. Where that I say no more, it is sufficeth, our Lord Jesus, as holy writ deviseth, gave us example of fasting and prayers. Therefore we mendicants, we silly frayers, be wedded to poverty and continence, to charity, humbleness, and abstinence, to persecution for righteousness, to weeping misericorde, and to cleanliness. And therefore may ye see that our prayers, I speak of us, we mendicants, we frayers, be to the high God more acceptable than yours, with your feasts at your table. From paradise first, if I shall not lie, was man out chased for his gluttony, and chaste was man in paradise certain, but hark now, Thomas, what I shall thee sayin, I have no text of it, as I suppose. But I shall find it in a manner glows, That specially our sweet Lord Jesus Spake this of friars, when he said thus, Blessed be they that poor in spirit be, And so forth all the gospel may ye see, Whether it be liker our profession or theirs, That swimmen in possession fie on their pomp, And on their gluttony, and on their lewdness I them defy. Me thinketh they like Jovian, fat as a whale, and walking as a swan, all vinolent as bottle in the spence. Their prayer is of full great reverence. When they for solas say the psalm of David, lo, buff, they say, cor meum ecrutavit, who follow Christ's gospel and his lore, but we, that humble be, and chaste, and poor, workers of God's word, not auditors, therefore right as a hawk upon the sours, up springs into the air, right so prayers of charitable and chaste, busy frayers, make their sores to God's ears too, Thomas, Thomas, so may I ride or go, And by that Lord that called is Saint Ive, Ne'er thou, our brother, shouldest thou not thrive. In our chapter pray we day and night to Christ, That he thee send a health and might, Thy body for to wield hastily. God wot, quoth he, Nothing thereof feel I, 
So help me, Christ, as I in few years have spended upon divers manners frares full many a pound. Yet fare I ne'er the bet, certain my good have I almost beset. Farewell, my gold, for it is all a go. That friar answered, O Thomas, dost thou so? What needest thou diverse friars to seech? What needeth him that had a perfect leech to seeken other leeches in the town? Your inconstance is your confusion. Hold ye then me, or Ella's our convent, to pray for you is insufficient? Thomas, that jape, it is not worth a mite. Your malady is, for we have too light. Ah, give that convent half a quarter oats, and give that convent four and twenty groats, and give that friar a penny, and let him go. Nay, nay, Thomas, it may no thing be so. What is a farthing worth parted on twelve? Lo, each thing that is owned in himself is more strong than when it is ye scattered. Thomas, of me thou shalt not be ye flattered. Thou wouldst have our labor all for naught. The high God that all this world hath wrought saith that the workman worthy is his hire. Thomas, not of your treasure I desire, as for myself, but that all our convent to pray for you is I so diligent, and for to build a Christ's own church. Thomas, if ye will learn for to work, of building up of churches may ye find, if it be good in Thomas, life of Eind, Ye lie here full of anger and of ire, With which the devil sets your heart on fire, And chide here this holy innocent, Your wife, that is so meek and patient. And therefore trow me, Thomas, if thee lest, Ne strive not with thy wife as for the best, And bear this word away now by thy faith, Touching such thing, lo, what the wise man saith, Within thy house be thou no lion, To thy subjects do none oppression, Nor make thou thine acquaintances for to flee, And yet, Thomas Elftsoon's charge I thee, Beware from ire that in thy bosom sleeps, where from the serpent that so slyly creeps under the grass and stingeth subtly? Beware, my son, and hearken patiently that twenty thousand men have lost their lives for striving with the laymen's and their wives. Now, since ye have so holy and meek a wife, what needeth you, Thomas, to make strife? There is, ye wis, no serpent so cruel, When men tread on his tail, Nor half so fell as woman is, When she hath caught an ire. Very vengeance is then all her desire. Ire is a sin, one of the great a seven, Abominable to the God of heaven, and to himself it is destruction. This every lewd vicar and parson can say how ire engenders homicide. Ire is, in sooth, the executor of pride. I could of ire you say so much sorrow, My tale should last until to-morrow, And therefore pray I God both day and night, an irous man, God send him little might. It is great harm, and certes great pity, To set an irous man in high degree. Will whom there was an irous potestate, As saith Senec, that during his estate Upon a day outrode nighters too, And as fortune would that it were so, 
the one of them came home, the other not. Anon the night before the judge is brought, that said thus, Thou hast thy fellow slain, for which I doom thee to death certain, and to another night commanded he, Go, lead him to the death, I charge thee. And happened, as they went by the way, toward the place where he should day, the night came, which men weaned had been dead. Then thought a day it was the best a red, to lead them both unto the judge again. They said, Lord, the knight hath not thee slain, his fellow here standeth whole alive. Ye shall be dead, quoth he, so I may thrive. That is to say, both one and two and three, and to the first a knight, right thus spake he, I damned thee, thou must all gate be dead, and thou also must needest lose thine head, for thou the cause art why thy fellow dieth, and to the third a knight right thus he saith, thou hast not done as I commanded thee, and thus he did do slay them all of three. Iris Cambyses was eke Dronclu, and I delighted him to be a shrew, and so befell a lord of his by knee that loved virtuous morality, said on a day betwixt them to write thus, A lord is lost, if he be vicious. An Iris man is like a frantic beast, in which there is of wisdom none arist. And drunkenness is eke a foul record of any man, and namely of a lord. There is full many an eye, and many an ear, awaiting on a lord he knows not where, for goddes love drink most attemptedly. Wine maketh man to lose wretchedly his mind, and eke his limbs every one. The reverse shalt thou see, quoth he anon, and prove it by thine own experience. What wine doth to folk, no such offence, there is no wine bereaveth me my might, of hand or foot, nor of mine iron sight. And for despite he drank a much a more, a hundred part, than he had done before, and right anon this cursed iris wretch, this knight's son let before him fetch, commanding him he should before him stand. And suddenly he took his bow in hand, and up the string he pulled to his ear, and with an arrow slew the child right there. Now whether I have a sicker hand or none, quoth he, is all my might and my mind agone? Hath wine bereaved me mine iron sight? Why should I tell the answer of the knight? His son was slain. There is no more to say. Beware, therefore, with lordes how ye play. Sing placebo, and I shall, if I can. But if it be unto a poorer man. To a poorer man men should his vices tell, But not to a lord, though he should go to hell. Lo, Iris Cyrus, the like Persian, How he destroyed the river of Gisen, For that a horse of his was drowned therein When he went Babylon to win. He made that the river was so small That women might wade it over all. Lo, what he said here, that so well teacher can, Be thou no fellow to an iris man, Nor with no wood man walker by the way, Lest thee repent, I will no farther say. Now, Thomas, lave, brother, leave thine ire, Thou shalt me find as just as is a squire, Hold not the devil's knife, I, at thine heart. Thine anger doth thee all too sore a smart. 
but shew to me all thy confession. Nay, quoth the sicker man, by St. Simon I have been shriven this day of my curate. I have him told all holy mine estate. Needeth no more to speak of it, saith he, but if me list of mine humility, give me then of thy good to make our cloister, quoth he, for many a mussel and many an oyster, when other men have been full well at ease, hath been our food, our cloister for to reese. And yet, God wot, uneth the fundament, performed is, nor of our pavement, is not a tile yet within our wounds. By God, we owe a forty pound for stones. Now help, Thomas, for him that harrowed hell, for Ellis must we our bookes sell. And if ye lack our predication, then goes this world all to destruction. For whoso from this world would us bereave, so God me save, Thomas, by your leave, he would bereave out of this world the sun. For who can teach, and worken as we can, and that is not of little time, quoth he, but since Elijah was, and Ellisy have friars been, that I find of record, in charity ye thanked be our Lord, now, Thomas, help for saint to charity. And down anon he set him on his knee. The sick man waxed well nigh wood for ire. He would that the friar had been afire with his false dissimulation. Such thing as is in my possession, quoth he, that may I give you, and none other. Ye say me thus, how that I am your brother. Yea, certes, quoth the friar, yea, trust her well. I took our dame this letter of our seal. Now well, quoth he, and somewhat shall I give unto your holy convent while I live, and in thine hand thou shalt it have anon, on this condition, and other none, that thou depart it so, my dear brother, that every friar have as much as other, this shalt thou swear on thy profession, Without fraud or cavillation, I swear it, quoth the friar, upon my faith. And there with all his hand in his he layeth, Lo, here my faith in me shall be no lack. Then put thine hand adown right by my back, said the man, And grope well behind, beneath my buttock, And there you shall find a thing that I have hid in privity. Ah, thought the friar, that shall go with me. And down his hand he launched to the cliff, in hope for to find a there a gift. And when this sicker man felt this frere about his tailor groping there and here, amid his hand he let the friar a fart. There is no capel drawing a cart that might have let a fart of such a sound. The friar upstart, as doth a wood lion. Ah, false churl, quoth he, for goddess bones, this hast thou in despite done for the nones. Thou shalt abide this fart, if that I may. His many, which that heard of this affray, came leaping in, and chased out the frere. And forth he went, with a full angry cheer, and fetched his fellow, there as lay his store. He looked as it were a wild boar, and ground with his teeth. So was he wroth, a sturdy pace down to the court he goth. Whereas there warned a man of great honour, To whom that he was always confessor, This worthy man was lord of that village, 
This friar came, as he were in a rage, Where this lord sat eating at his board, Oneths might that friar speak one word, Till at the last he said, God, you see, this lord gan look and said, Bendicity, what, Friar John, what manner world is this? I see well that there something is amiss. Ye look as though the wood were full of thieves. Sit down, Anon, and tell me what your grieve is, And it shall be amended, if I may. I have, quoth he, had despite to-day, God yielde you down in your village, That in this world there is none so poor a page, That would not have abomination of that I received in your town, And yet ne grieveth me nothing so sore, That the olde churl with Locke's whore Blasphemed hath our holy convent eke. Now, master, quoth the lord, if you beseek no master, sir, quoth he, but servitor, though I have had in schools that honour, God liketh not that men us rabbi call, neither in market nor in your large hall, no force, quoth he, but tell me all your grief. Sir, quoth the friar, an odious mischief this day betid, is to mine order and me, and so par consequence to each degree of holy church, God amend it soon. Sir, quoth the Lord, ye know what is to do, distempt you not, ye be my confessor, ye be the salt of the earth, and the Saviour for God's love your patience now hold, tell me your grief. And he anon him told. As ye have heard before, ye know well what. The lady of the house, I stiller sat, Till she had heard what the friar said. A goddess mother, quoth she, blissful maid, Is there aught else? Tell me faithfully. Madame, quoth he, how thinketh you thereby? How thinketh me, quoth she, so God me speed, I say, a churl hath done a churlish deed. What should I say? God let him never thee. His sick a head is full of vanity. I hold him in a manner frenesy. Madam, quoth he, by God I shall not lie, but I in otherwise may be a rake. I shall defame him over all there I speak. This false blasphemer that charged me to part that will not departed be, To every man alike with mischance. The Lord sat still, as he were in a trance, And in his heart he rolled up and down, How had this churl imagination to shew such a problem to the frere. Never ere now heard I of such matter. I trow the devil put it in his mind. In all ours metric shall there no man find before this day of such a question. Who should make a demonstration that every man should have alike his part, as of the sound and savour of a fart? O oh, nice perud a churl, I shew his face. Lo, sires, quoth the Lord with hard a grace, Who ever heard of such a thing ere now to every man alike? Tell me how. It is impossible, it may not be. Hey, nice a churl, God let him never thee. The rumbling of a fart, and ever sound is but of air reverberation, And ever wasteth light and light away. There is no man can demon by my fay. If that it were departed equally, what, lo, my churl, lo, yet how shrewdly, Unto my confessor to-day he spake, I hold him certain a demonic. Now eat your meat, and let the churl go play. 
let him go hang himself a devil way. Now stood the lord's squire at the board, That carved his meat, and heard a word by word, Of all this thing which that I have you said. My lord, quoth he, be ye not evil paid. I could tell for a gown a cloth to you, sir friar, So that ye be not wroth, How that this part should even dealed be Among your convent, if it liked thee. Tell, quoth the lord, and thou shalt have anon a gown a cloth by God and by St. John. My lord, quoth he, when that the weather is fair, without a wind or perturbing of the air, let bring a cartwheel here into this hall, but look that it have its spokes all. Twelve spokes hath a cartwheel commonly, and bring me then twelve friars. Know ye why? For thirteen is a convent, as I guess. Your confessor here, for his worthiness, shall perform up the number of his convent. Then shall they kneel down by one assent, and to each spoke's end in this manner. Full sadly lay his nose, shall a frere, your noble confessor there, God him save, shall hold his nose upright under the nave, and shall this churl, with belly stiff and taut as any tabor hither be ye bought, and set him on the wheel right of this cart, upon the nave, and make him let a fart, and ye shall see, on peril of my life, by very proof that is demonstrative, that equally the sound of it shall wend, and eke the stink unto the spoke's end, save that this worthy man, your confessor, because he is a man of great honour, shall have the first fruit, as reason is, this noble usage of friars, yet it is, the worthy man of him shall first be served, and certainly he hath it well deserved. He hath to-day taught us so much a good with preaching in the pulpit where he stood, that I may vouch safe, I say for me, he had the first smell of Farta's three, and so would all his brethren hardily, he beareth him so fair and holily. The Lord, the Lady, and each man save the frere, said that Jenkins spake in this matter as well as Euclid or as Ptolemy. Touching the churl, they said that subtly and high wit made him speaken as he spake. He is no fool, nor no demoniac. And Jenkin hath thee won a newer gown. My tale is done. We are almost at town. So ends the Sompnor's tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 7th, 2006. The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, edited by D. Lang Purvis. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of The Canterbury Tales. The Clerk's Tale The Prologue Sir Clerk of Oxenford, our hostess said, Ye ride as still and coy as doth a maid that were new spoused. Sitting at the board this day, I heard not of your tongue a word. I trow ye study about Sophim, but Solomon saith, Everything hath time, for God's sake, be of better cheer. It is no time for to study here. 
Tell us some merry tale by your fay, For what man that is entered in a play He needes must unto that play assent, But preache not, as friars do in Lent, To make us for our olde sinners weep, Nor that thy tale make us not to sleep. Take us some merry thing of adventures, Your terms, your colours, and your figures, Keep them in store, till so ye be in dight, High style, as when that men to kinges write. Speak so plain at this time, I you pray, That we may understand what you say. The worthy clerk benignedly answered, Hoste, quoth he, I am under your yerd. Ye have of us as now the governance, And therefore would I do you obeisance. As far as reason asketh hardily, I will you tell a tale, Which that I learned at Padova of a worthy clerk, As proved by his words and his work. He is now dead, and nailed in his chest. I pray to God give his soul good rest. Francis Petrarch, the laureate poet, Hyeth this clerk, whose rhetoric so sweet, Illumined all etale of poetry, As linen did of philosophy, Or law, or other art particular. But death, that will not suffer us dwell here, But as it were a twinkling of an eye, Them both hath slain, and all shall we die. But forth to tellen of this worthy man That taught me this tale as I began, I say that first he with high style indicteth, Ere he the body of his tale writeth, A poem, in the which describeth he Piedmont, And of Salises the country, And speaketh of the Pennine hills high, That be the bounds of all West Lombardy, And Mount Vesulus in special, Whereas the Po, out of a willa small, Taketh his first springing and his source, That eastward I increaseth in his course, Temilia ward to Ferraro and Venice, The which a long thing were to device, And truly, as to my judgment, Me thinketh it a thing impertinent, Save that he would convey this matter, but this is the tale which that ye shall hear. THE TALE PARS PRIMA There is, right at the west side of Itail, Down at the root of Vesuvius, The cold, a lusty plain, Abundant of Vitale, there many a town and tower thou mayst behold, That founded there in time of fathers old, And many another delectable sight, And Salusis this noble country height. A Marquis, whom lord was of that land, As were his worthy elders him before, And obedient, I ready to his hand, Were all his lieges, both less and more. Thus in delight he lived, and had done your beloved and drad, Though favour of fortune, both of his lords and of his commune. Therewith he was to speak of lineage, the gentlest deborn of Lombardy, A fair person, and strong, and young of age, and full of honour and courtesy, Discreet enough his country for to gee, Saving in some things that he was to blame, And Walter was this young lord's name. I blame him thus, that he considered not in time coming What might him betide, But on his present lust was all his thought, And for to hawk and hunt on every side, Well nigh all other cares let he slide, And eke he would, that was the worst of all, Wedde no wife for aught that might befall. Only that point his people bear so sore That Flockmel on a day to him they went, And one of them, that wisest was of lore, Or Ella's that the Lord would best assent, That he should tell him what the people meant, Or Ella's could he well shew such matter, 
he to the Marcus said, As ye shall hear. O noble Marcus, your humanity assureth us, and gives us hardiness, as oft as time is of necessity, that we to you may tell our heaviness. Accept, dear Lord, now of your gentleness, what we with piteous heart unto you plain, and let your ears my voice not disdain. All have I not to do in this matter, more than another man hath in his place, yet forasmuch as ye, my lord so dear, have always shewed me favour and grace, I dare the better ask of you a space of audience to shewen our request, and ye, my lord, to do right as you lest. For certes, Lord, so well us like you and your work, and ever have done, that we ne could not ourselves devise how we might live in more felicity. Save one thing, Lord, if that your will it be that for to be a wedded man you lest, then were your people in sovereign hearts rest. Bow your neck under the blissful yoke of sovereignty, and not of service, which that men call espousal or wedlock, and think, a Lord, among your thoughtes wise, how that our days pass in sundry wise, for though we sleep, or wake, or roam, or ride, I fleeth time, it will no man abide. And though your greene youth flower as yet in creepeth age always as still as stone, and death menaceth every age, and smit in each estate, for there escapeth none, and all so certain as we know each one that we shall die, as uncertain we all be of that day when death shall on us fall. Accept then of us the true intent that never yet refused your hest, and we will, Lord, if that ye will assent, choose you a wife in short a time at the last. Born of the gentlest and of the best of all this land, so that it ought to seem honour to God and you, and we can deem. Deliver us out of all this busy dread, and take a wife for high God's sake. For if it so befell, as God forbid, that through your death your lineage should slake, and that a strange successor should take your heritage, O oh, woe were us on leave, wherefore we pray you hastily to weave. Their meek prayer and their piteous cheer made the Marcus for to have pity. Ye will, quoth he, mine own people dear, to that I ne'er e'er thought constrain a me. I me rejoiced of my liberty, that seldom time is found in marriage. Where I was free, I must be in serviage. But natheless I see your true intent, and trust upon your wit, and have done I. Wherefore of my free will I will assent to wed me as soon as e'er I may. But whereas ye have proffered me to-day to choose me a wife, I you release that choice, and pray you of the proffer cease. For God it wot that children often been, unlike their worthy elders them before, bounty comes all of God, not of the strain, of which they be engendered and ebore. I trust in God's bounty, and therefore my marriage and mine estate and rest I him betake. He may do as him lest. Let me alone in choosing of my wife, that charge upon my back I will endure. But I you pray, and charge upon your life, that what wife that I shall take, ye me ensure to worship her, while that her life may dure, in a word and work both here and elsewhere, as she an emperor's daughter were. 
And furthermore this shall ye swear, That ye against my choice shall never grudge nor strive, For since I shall forego my liberty at your request, And ever may I thrive, Where as mine heart is set, there will I live. And but ye will assent in such manner, I pray you speak no more of this matter. With heartly will they sworn and assent to all this thing. There said not one white nay, beseeching him of grace, ere that they went, that he would grant to them a certain day of his espousal soon as e'er he may. For yet always the people somewhat dread, lest that the Marcus would no wife wed. He granted them a day, such as him lest, on which he would be wedded sickerly, and said he did with all this at their request, and they with humble heart, full buxomly kneeling upon their knees, full reverently he thanked all, and thus they have an end of their intent, and home again they wend. And hereupon he to his officers commanded for the feast to purvey, and to his privy knights and squires such charge he gave, as him list on them lay, and they to his commandment obey, and each of them doth all his diligence to do unto the feast all reverence. Pars Secunda not far from Thilic Palace Honourable, where, as this Marcus shope his marriage, there stood a thorpe of slighte delectable, in which the poor folk of that village had their beasts and their harbourage, and their labour took their sustenance after the earth gave them abundance. Among this poor folk there dwelt a man which that was holden poorest of them all, but high God sometimes sende can his grace unto a little ox's stall. Janicola, men of that thorpe him call, a daughter had he, fair enough to sight, and Griseldus this young maiden hight. But for to speak of virtuous beauty, then she was one the fairest under sun. For poorly fostered up was she, no likerous lust was in her heart de run. Well ofter of the well than of the tun she drank, And for she would virtue please, She knew well labour, but no idle ease. But though this maiden tender were of age, Yet in the breast of her virginity There was enclosed a sad and ripe courage, and in great reverence and charity her poor old father fostered she a few sheep spinning on the field she kept she would not be idle till she slept and when she homeward came she would bring waters and other herbs times oft the which she shred and seeth for her living and made her bed full hard and nothing soft and I she kept her father's life on loft with every obeisance and diligence that child may do to father's reverence. Upon Grisilda this poor creature full often sides this Marcus set his eye, and he on hunting road paradventure, and when it fell that he might her espy, he not with wanton looking of folly, his iron cast on her, but in sad wise upon her cheer he would him oft advise. Commending in his heart her womanhead, and eke her virtue passing any wight of so young age, as well in cheer as deed, for though the people have no great insight in virtue, he considered full right her bounty, and disposed that he would wed only her, if wed ever he should. The day of wedding came, but no wight can tell what woman that it should be, for such marvail wondered many a man, and said, 
when they were in privity, will not our Lord yet leave his vanity? Will he not wed? Alas, alas the while! Why will he thus himself and us beguile? But natheless this Marcus had done make of gemmas set in gold and in azure, brooches and rings for Griselda's sake, and of her clothing he took the measure of a maiden like unto her stature, and eke of other ornaments all that unto such a wedding should a fall. The time of undern of the same day approached that this wedding should be, and all the palace was put in array, both hall and chamber each in its degree, houses of office stuffed with plenty, that mayest thou see of daintiest vital that may be found as far as lasts ital. This royal marquis, richly arrayed, lordes and ladies in his company, the which unto the feast were prayed, and of his retinue the bachelory, with many a sound of sundry melody unto the village of the which I told, in this array the right way did they hold. Griseld of this God wot full innocent, that for her shapen was all this array, to fetch a water at a well is went, and home she came as soon as e'er she may, for well she heard say that on that day the Marcus should wed, and if she might, she fain would have seen somewhat of that sight. She thought, I will with other maidens stand, that be my fellows in our door, and see this marchioness, and therefore I will fand to do at home, as soon as it may be, the labor which belongeth to me, and then I may at leisure her behold, if she this way unto the castle hold. And as she would over the threshold gone, the Marcus came and gan for her to call, and she set down her water-pot anon beside the threshold in an ox's stall, and down upon her knees she gan to fall, and with sad countenance kneeled still, till she had heard what was the Lord's will. The thoughtful Marcus spake unto the maid full soberly, and said in this manner, where is your father, Griseldis? he said. And she, with reverence, in humble cheer, answered, Lord, he is already here. And in this she went without longer let, and to the Marcus she her father fet. He by his hand then took the poor man, and said thus, when he him had aside, Janicola, I neither may nor can longer the pleasance of mine heart to hide, if thou vouchsafe what so betide, thy daughter will I take, ere that I wend, as for my wife, unto her life's end. Thou lovest me, that know I well certain, and art my faithful liegeman e bore. And all that liketh me, I dare well sayen, it liketh thee. And specially, therefore, tell me that point that I have said before, If that thou wilt unto this purpose draw, to take me for thy son-in-law. This sudden case the man astonished so, that red he waxed abashed and all quaking, he stood on eths, and said he wordes mo, but only thus, Lord, quoth he, my willing is as ye will, nor against your liking I will do no thing, mine own lord so dear, right as you list govern this matter. Then will I, quoth the Marquis softly, that in thy chamber I and thou and she have a collation, and knowest thou why? For I will ask her, if her will it be, to be my wife, and rule her after me, and all this shall be done in thy presence. I will not speak out of thine audience." 
and in the chamber where they were about the treaty which ye shall thereafter hear, the people came into the house without, and wondered them in how honest manner and tenderly she kept her father dear, but utterly Griselda's wonder might, for never erst day saw she such a sight. No wonder is, though that she be a stoned, to see so great a guest come in that place. She never was to no such guestes woned, for which she looked with full pale face. But shortly forth this matter for to chase, these are the wordes that her marquis said, to this benigna very faithful maid. Griseld, he said, Ye shall well understand, it liketh to your father and to me, that I you wed. And eke it may so stand, as I suppose ye will that it so be. But these demands ask I first, quoth he, since that it shall be done in hasty wise. Will ye assent, or else you advise? I say this, be ye ready with good heart to all my lust, and that I freely may, as me best thinketh, do you laugh for smart, and never ye to grudge night or day, and eke when I say yea, you may not nay, neither by word nor frowning countenance, swear this, and here I swear our alliance. Wondering upon this word, quaking for dread, she said, Lord, indigny and unworthy am I to this honor that ye me bed. But as ye will yourself, right so will I. And here I swear, that never unwillingly, in word or thought, I will you disobey, for to be dead, though me were loath to day. This is enough, Griselda mine, quoth he. And forth he went, with a full sober cheer, out of the door, and after then came she. And to the people he said in this manner, This is my wife, quoth he, that standeth here. Honour her, and love her, I you pray. Whoso me loves, there is no more to say. And for that nothing of her olde gear she should bring into his house, he bade that women should despoil her right there, of which these ladies were nothing glad to hand her clothes wherein she was clad. But natheless this maiden bright of you from foot to head, they clothed have all new. Her hairs have they combed that lay untressed, full rudely, and with their fingers small. A crown upon her head they have dressed, and set her full of nouches, great and small. Of her array, why should I make a tale? Unless the people her knew for her fairness, when she transmuted was in such richness. The marquis had her spousid with a ring, brought for the same cause, and then her set upon a horse, snow-white, and well ambling, and to his palace, ere he longer let, with joyful people, that her led and met conveyed her, and thus the day they spend in revel till the sun again descend. And shortly forth this tale for to chase, I say that, to this new marchioness, God hath such favor sent her of his grace, that it nay seemed not by likeliness that she was born and fed in rudeness, and in a cot or in an ox's stall, but nourished in an emperor's hall. To every white she waxen is so dear and worshipful that folk where she was born that from her birth knew her year by year on at a strode, but they in durst have sworn that to Janicole, of whom I spake before, she was not daughter, for by conjecture them thought she was another creature. 
For, though that ever virtuous was she, she was increased in such excellence of Thua's good, ye set in high bounty, and so discreet and fair of eloquence, so benign and so digne of reverence, and could so the people's heart embrace, that each her loved that looked upon her face. Not only of Saluces in the town published was the bounty of her name, but eke besides in many a region, if one well said, another said the same. So spread of here high bounty the fame, that men and women, young as well as old, went to Saluces her for to behold. Thus Walter, lowly, nay, but royally, Wedded with fortunate Hoden state, in goddess peace, lived full easily, at home, and outward grace enough had he, and for he saw that now under low degree was honest virtue held, the people him held a prudent man, and that is seen full seld. Not only this Griselda through her wit couth all the feet of wifely homeliness, but eke when that case required it, the common prophet could she redress. There nas discord, rancor, or heaviness in all the land that she could not appease, and wisely bring them all in rest and ease. Though that her husband absent were or none, if gentlemen or other of that country were wroth, she would bring them at once, so wise and ripe worders had she, and judgment of so great equity, that she from heaven sent was, as men wend, people to save, and every wrong to mend. Not long a time after that this Griseld was wedded, she a daughter had he bore, all she had lever borne a knave child, glad was the Marcus, and his folk therefore, for though a maiden child came all before, she may unto a knave child attain, but likelihood since she is not barren. Pars Tertia there fell, as falleth many timers mo, when that his child had sucked but a throw, this Marcus in his heart longed so to tempt his wife, her sadness for to know, that he may not out of his heart a throw this marvellous desire his wife to say, needless God wot he thought her to affray. He had assayed her enough before, and found her ever good, that needed it her for to tempt, and always more and more, though some men praise it for a subtle wit. But as for me, I say that evil it sit, to say a wife when that it is no need, and put a her in anguish and in dread. For which this Marcus woke in this manner, he came at night alone, where, as she lay with stern of face, and with full troubled cheer, and said thus, Griseld, quoth he, that day that I took you out of your poor array, and put you in a state of high noblesse, ye have not forgotten, as I guess. I say, Grizel, this present dignity in which that I have put you as I trow, maketh you not forgetful for to be that I took you in poor estate full low. For any weal you must yourself a know, take heed of every word that I you say. There is no wight that hears it, but we tway. Ye know yourself well how that ye came here into this house, it is not long ago. And though to me ye may be right lefe and dear, unto my gentles ye be nothing so. They say to them it is a great shame and woe for to be subject and be in servage to thee, that art born of small lineage. And, namely, 
Since thy daughter was ye bore, these wordes have they spoken doubtless, but thy desire, as I have done before, to live my life with them in rest and peace. I may not in this case be reckless, I must do with thy daughter for the best, not as I would, but as my gentles lest. And yet, God wot, this is full loath to me, but natheless without your weeting I will not do. But this will I, quoth he, that ye to me assenten in this thing, shew now your pestilence in your working, that ye me height and swore in your village, the day that make it was our marriage. When she heard all this, she not amoved, neither in word, nor cheer, nor countenance. For, as it seemed, she was not aggrieved. She said, Lord, all lies in your pleasance. My child and I, with hearty obeisance, be yours all, and ye may save or spill your own thing. Work then after your will. There may no thing, so God my soul is save, like to you, that may displease me. Nor I desire nothing for to have, nor dread for to lose, save only ye. This will is in mine heart, and I shall be, no length of time, nor death may this deface, nor change my courage to another place. Glad was the Marcus for her answering, but yet he feigned as he were not so. All dreary was his cheer and his looking, when that he should out of the chamber go, soon after this, a furlong way or two, he privily hath told all his intent unto a man, and to his wife him sent. A manner sergeant was this private man, the which he faithful often founden had in thing as great, and eke such folk well can do execution in things bad. The Lord knew well that he him loved and dread, and when this sergeant knew his lord's will, into the chambers stalked he fuller still. Madam, he said, Ye must forgive it me, though I do thing to which I am constrained. Ye be so wise that right well know ye that Lord's hest may not be feigned. They may well be wailed and complained, but men must needs unto their lust obey. And so will I. There is no more to say. This child I am commanded for to take, and spake no more, but out the child he hent, dispiteously, and gan a cheer to make, as though he would have slain it, ere he went. Griseldus must all suffer and consent, and as a lamb she sat there meek and still, and let this cruel sergeant do his will. Suspicious was the defame of this man, suspect his face, suspect his word also, suspect the time in which he and this began. Alas, her daughter that she loved so she weaned, he would have it slain right though. But natheless she neither wept nor sight, conforming her to what the Marcus liked. But at the last to speak as she began, and meekly she unto the sergeant prayed, so as he was a worthy gentleman, that she might kiss her child ere that it died. And in her barm this little child she laid with full sad face, and gan the child to bless, and lulled it, and after gan to kiss. And thus she said in her benigne voice, Farewell, my child, I shall thee never see. 
But since I have thee marked with the cross Of that father ye blessed mayst thou be, That for us died upon a cross of tree, Thy soul, my little child, I him betake, For this night shall thy din for my sake. I trow that to a Norris in this case It had been hard this Ruthie for to see. Well might a mother then have cried, Alas! But natheless so sad steadfast was she That she endured all adversity, And to the sergeant meekly she said, Have here again your little younger maid. Go now, quoth he, and do my lord's behest, And one thing would I pray you of your grace, But if my lord forbade you at the least, Bury this little body in some place That neither beasts nor birds it erase. But he no word would to that purpose say, But took the child and went upon his way. The sergeant came unto his lord again, And of Griselda's words and of her cheer He told him point for point in short and plain, And him presented with his daughter dear. Somewhat this lord had ruth in his manner, But natheless his purpose held he still, As lorders do when they will have their will. And bade this sergeant, that he privily should the child full softly wind and wrap, With all circumstances tenderly, and carry it in a coffer or in lap, But upon pain his head off for to swap, that no man should know of his intent, Nor whence he came, nor whither that he went. But at Bologna to his sister dear, That at that time of panic was countess, He should it take, and shew her this matter, Beseeching her to do her business, This child to foster in all gentleness, And whose child it was he bade her hide From every wight for aught that might be tied. The sergeant went, and hath fulfilled this thing, But to the Marcus now returned we, For now he went full fast imagining, As if by his wife's cheer he might see, Or by her words apperceive that she were changed, But he never could her find, But ever in one alike sad and kind, As glad, as humble, as busy in service, and eke in love as she was wont to be, Was she to him in every manner wise. And of her daughter not a word spake she. No accident, for no adversity, was seen in her, Nor ere her daughter's name she named, or in earnest, or in game. Pars Quarta. In this estate there passed be four year, Ere she with child was, As God who would a knave child she bear By this Walter, full gracious and fair For to behold. And when that folk it to its father told, Not only he, but all his country merry Were for this child, and God they thank and harry. When it was two year old, And from the breast departed of the Norris, On a day this Marcus caught yet another lest To tempt his wife yet further, if she may. O oh, needless was she tempted in as say, But wedded men not conan no measure When that they find a patient creature. Wife, quoth the Marcus, ye have heard ere this, My people sickly bear our marriage, And namely, since my son ye born is, Now is it worse than ever in all our age, The murmur slays mine heart and my courage. 
For to mine ears cometh the voice so smart, That it well nigh destroyed hath mine heart. Now say they thus, when Walter is he gone, Then shall the blood of Janicol succeed, And be our lord, for other have we none. Such wordes say my people out of dread. Well ought I of such murmur take heed, For certainly I dread all such sentence, Though they not plainen in my audience. I would live in peace, if that I might, Wherefore I am disposed utterly, And I his sister served ere by night, Right so think I to serve him privily, This I warn you, that ye not suddenly out of yourself, for no woe should outray, be patient, and thereof I you pray. I have, quoth she, said thus, and ever shall, I will no thing, nor nil no thing certain, but as you list, not grieveth me at all, Though that my daughter and my son be slain at your commandment, that is so sane, I have not had no part of children twain, but first sickness, and after woe and pain. Ye be my lord, do with your own thing, write as you list, and ask no raid of me. For as I left at home all my clothing, When I came first to you, right so, quoth she, Left I my will and all my liberty, And took your clothing, whereof I you pray, Do your pleasance, I will your lust obey. And certes, if I had a prescience your will to know, Ere ye your lust me told, I would it do without a negligence, But now I know your lust, and what ye wold. All your pleasance firm and stable I hold, For whist I that my death might do you ease, Right gladly would I die in you to please. Death may make no comparison unto our love, and when this Marquis say the constance of his wife, He cast adown his iron too, And wondered how she may in patience suffer all this array. And forth he went with dreary countenance, But to his heart it was full great pleasance. This ugly sergeant, in the same wise that to her daughter caught, Right so hath he, or worse, if men can any worse devise, He hent her son, that full was of beauty, And ever in one so patient was she, That she no cheer made of heaviness, But kissed her son, and after gan him bless. Save this she prayed him, if that he might, her little son he would in earth a grave, His tender limbs delicate to sight, From fowls and from beasts for to save. But she none answer of him might have, He went his way, as him nothing ne not, But to Bologna tenderly it brought. The Marcus wondered ever longer more upon her patience, And, if that he not had as soothly known there before, That perfectly her children loved she, He would have weaned that of some subtly, And of malice or for cruel courage, She had suffered this with sad visage. But well he knew that next to himself certain she loved her children best in every wise. But now of women would I ask fain, if these assays might not suffice. What could a sturdy husband more devise to prove her wifehood and her steadfastness, And he continuing ever in sturdiness? But there be folk of such condition, That 
When they have a certain purpose take, they cannot stint of their intention, but right as they were bound unto a stake, that they will not of their first a purpose slake. Right so this Marquis fully hath proposed to tempt his wife, as he was first disposed. He waited, if by word or countenance, that she to him was changed and of courage, but never could he find a variance. She was I one in heart and in visage, and I the farther that she was in age, the more true, if that were possible, she was to him in love, and more penible. For which it deemed thus, that of them two there was but one will, for, as Walter Lest, the same pleasance was her lust also, and, God be thanked, all fell for the best. She shewed well for no unworldly unrest, a wife as of herself no thing should, will in effect, but as her husband would. The slander of Walter wondrous wide spread that of a cruel heart he wickedly, for he a poor woman wedded had, had murdered both his children privily. Such murmur was among them commonly, no wonder is, for to the people's ear there came no word, but that they murdered were. For which, whereas his people there before had loved him well, the slander of his defame made them that they him hated therefore. To be a murderer is a hateful name. But natheless, for earnest or for game, he of his cruel purpose would not stent to tempt his wife all his intent. When that his daughter twelve year was of age, he to the court of Rome in supple wise, informed of his will, set his message, commanding him such bullas to devise, as to his cruel purpose may suffice, how that the Pope, for his people's rest, bade him to wed another, if him lest. I say he bade they should counterfeit the Pope's bulls, making intention that he had leave his first wife too late, to stint to rancor and dissension betwixt his people and him, thus spake the bull, the wish they have published at full. The rude people, as no wonder is, weaned full well that it had been right so, but when these tidings came to Griseldis, I deem that her heart was full of woe. But she, alike sad, for evermore disposed was this humble creature, that adversity of fortune all tendure. Abiding ever his lust and his pleasance, to whom that she was given heart and all, as to her very worldly sufficience, but shortly, if this story tell I shall, the Marquis written hath in special a letter, in which he shewed his intent, and secretly it to Bologna sent. To the Earl of Panico, which had a though wedded his sister, prayed he specially to bring a home again his children too, in honourable estate, all openly. But one thing he him prayed utterly, that he to no wight, though men should inquire, should not tell whose children that they were. But, say, the maiden should de wedded be unto the Marquis of Salusanon, and as this earl was prayed, so did he. But, at day set, he on his way is gone toward Salus, and lord as many a one in rich array, this maiden for to guide, her younger brother riding her beside. Arrayed was toward her marriage, this fresher maiden full of gemmes clear, her brother 
which that seven year was of age, arrayed eke full fresh in his manner, and thus, in great noblesse, with glad cheer, toward Salus's, shaping their journey, from day to day they rode upon their way. Pars Quinta among all this, after his wick usage, the marquis, yet his wife, to tempt him more, to the uttermost proof of her courage, fully to have experience and lore, if that she were as steadfast as before, he on a day in open audience, full boisterously said her this sentence. Certes, Griseld, I had enough pleasance to have you to my wife, for your goodness, and for your truth, and for your obeisance, not for your lineage, nor for your richness. But now know I in very soothfastness that in great lordship, if I well advise, there is great servitude in sundry wise. I may not do as every ploughman may, my people me constraineth for to take another wife, and crieth day by day, and eke the pope a rancor for to slake, consenteth it, that dare I undertake, and truly thus much I will you say, my newer wife is coming by the way. Be strong of heart, and void anon her place, And the like dower that ye brought to me, Take it again, I grant it of my grace. Return it to your father's house, quoth he, No man may always have prosperity, With even heart I read you to endure The stroke of fortune, or of adventure. And she again answered in patience, My lord, quoth she, I know, and knew alway, How that betwixt your magnificence and my pauvert, No wight nor can nor may make comparison, It is no nay. I held me never digna in no manner, To be your wife, nor yet your chamberer, and in this house, where ye me lady make, The higher God take I for my witness, And all so wisely he my soul aglade, I never held me lady nor mistress, But humble servant to your worthiness, And ever shall, while that my life may dure, A broven every worldly creature that ye so long of your benignity have holden me in honour and nobly, where as I was not worthy for to be, that thank I God, and you to whom I pray, for yield it you there is no more to say. Unto my father gladly I will wend, and with him dwell, unto my life's end. Where I was fostered as a child full small, Till I be dead, my life there shall I lead, A widow clean in body, heart, and all, For since I gave to you my maidenhead, And am your true wife, it is no dread, God shield such a lord as wife to take, Another man to husband or to make. And of your new wife, God, of his grace, So grant you weal and all prosperity, For I will gladly yield to her my place, In which that I was blissful wont to be. For since it liketh you, my lord, quoth she, That while some were in all mine heart's rest, That I shall go, I will go when you lest. But whereas ye me proffer such dower as I first brought, It is well in my mind it was my wretched clothes, Nothing fair, to which to me were hard now for to find. O gentle God, 
How gentle and how kind you seemeth By your speech and by your visage, The day that naked was our marriage. But sooth is said, Dalgate, I find it true, For in effect it proved is on me. Love is not old as when that it is new, But certes, Lord, for no adversity To dine in this case, I shall not be that ere in word or work I shall repent that I gave you my heart in whole intent. My lord, ye know that in my father's place ye did me strip out of my poor weed, and richly ye clad me of your grace. To you brought I naught else out of dread, but faith and nakedness and maidenhead. And here again your clothing I restore, And eke your wedding ring for evermore. The remnant of your jewels ready be within your chamber, I dare safely send. Naked out of my father's house, quoth she, I came, And naked I must turn again. All your pleasance would I follow fain, But yet I hope it not be your intent, that smockless I out of your palace went. Ye could not do so dishonest a thing, That thilike womb in which your children lay, Should before the people be in my walking, Be seen all bare, and therefore I you pray, Let me not like a worm go by the way. Remember you, mine own lord so dear, I was your wife. Though I unworthy were. Wherefore in guerdon of my maidenhead, Which that I brought, and not again I bear, As vouchsafe to give me to my meed, But such a smock as I was wont to wear, And I therewith may we the womb of her That was your wife, And here I take my leave of you. Mine Owen Lord, lest I you grieve. The smock, quoth he, that thou hast on thy back, Let it be still, and bear it forth with thee. But, well, unless thilk word he spake, But went his way for ruth and for pity. Before the folk herself stripped she, And in her smock, with foot and head all bare Toward her father's house, Forth as she fare. The folk her followed, Weeping on her way, And fortune I they cursed As they gone, But she from weeping Kept her iron dray, Nor in this time Word spake she none. Her father, that this tiding heard anon, Cursed the day and time that nature shope to him Be a living creature. For out of doubt this old poor man Was ever in suspect of her marriage, For ever deemed he since it first began That when the Lord fulfilled had his courage, he would think it were a disparage to his estate, So low for to alight, And void her as soon as e'er he might. Against his daughter hastily went he, For he by noise of folk knew her coming, And with her old coat, as it might be, He covered her, full sorrowfully weeping. But on her body might he it not bring, For rude was the cloth, And more of age by days fillet Than at her marriage. Thus with her father for a certain space Dwelled this flower of wifely patience, That neither by her words nor by her face Before the folk nor eke in their absence ne shewed she she was done offence, Nor of her high estate no remembrance, Ne had a she as by her countenance. No wonder is, 
For in her great estate her ghost was ever in plain humility, No tender mouth, no heart delicate, no pomp, and no semblant of royalty, But full of patient benignity, discreet and prideless, aye honorable, And to her husband ever meek and stable. Men speak of Job, and most for his humbleness, As clerks, when them list, can well indite, Namely of men, but as in soothfastness, Though clerks praise women but delight, There can no man in humbleness him quite as women can, Nor can be half so true as women be, But it be fall of new. Pars Sexta From Boulogne is the Earl of Panic come, Of which the fame upsprang to more and less, And to the people's ears all and some was known, Eke that a newer marchioness he with him brought, In such pomp and richness that never was there seen With manna's eye so noble array in all West Lombardy. The Marquis, which that shope and knew all this, Ere that the Earl had come, Sent his message for thilike poor silly Griseldis, And she, with humble heart and glad visage, Nor with no swelling thought in her courage, Came at his hest, and on her knees her set, And reverently and wisely she him gret. Griseld, quoth he, my will is utterly, This maiden that shall wedded be to me, Receive me to-morrow as royally As it is possible is my house to be. And eke that every wight in his degree Have his estate in sitting and service, And in high pleasance as I can devise. I have no women sufficient certain, the chambers to array in ordinance after my lust, And therefore would I fain that thine were all such manner governance. Thou knowest eke of all my pleasance. Though thine array be bad and ill be say, Do thou thy devoir at the least away. Not only, Lord, that I am glad, quoth she, to do your lust, but I desire also you for to serve and please in my degree without fainting, and shall ever mow, nor ever, for no weal, nor for no woe, shall be the ghost within mine heart stent to love you best with all my true intent. And with that word she gan the house to dight, and tables for to set, and beds to make, and pained her to do all that she might, Praying the chamberers, for God's sake, To hasten them, and fast a sweep and shake, That she, the most serviceable of all, Hath every chamber arrayed, and in this hall. About Undern gan the earl alight, That with him brought these noble children tway, for which the people ran to see the sight of their array so richly base, and then at erst among us them they say that Walter was no fool, though that him least to change his wife, for it was for the best. For she is fairer, they demon all, than is Griseld, And more tender of age, And fairer fruit between them should have fall, And more pleasant for her high lineage. Her brother eke so fair was of visage, That them to see the people hath aught pleasance, Commending how the Marcus governance. O stormy people, unsad and ever true, And undiscreet, and changing as a vein, Delighting ever in rumour that is new, For like the moon so wax ye and wane, I, full of clapping, 
dear enough a Jane, your doom is false. Your constance evil preveth, a great fool is he that you believeth. Thus said the sad folk in that city, when that the people gazed up and down, for they were glad, right for the novelty, to have a newer lady in their town, no more of this now make I mention, but to Griseld again I will me dress, and tell her constancy and her business. Full busy was Griseld in every thing, that to the feast she was appurtenant, Right naught was she abashed of her clothing, though it was rude, and some deal eke to rent, but with glad cheer unto the gate she went with other folk to greet the marchioness, and after that did forth her business. With so glad cheer his guests she received, and so cunningly, each in his degree, that no default no man apperceived, but I they wondered what she might be, that in so poor array was for to see, and could such honor and reverence, and worthily they praise her prudence. In all this means, while she not stent this maid, and eke her brother to commend with all her heart, in full benign intent, so well that no man could her praise amend. But at the last, when that these lordes wend to sit down to meet, he gan to call Griseld, as she was busy in the hall. Griseld, quoth he, as it were in his play, how liketh thee my wife and her beauty? Right well, my lord, quoth she, for in good fay a fairer saw I never done than she. I pray to God give you prosperity, and so I hope that he will you to send pleasance enough unto your lives' end. One thing I beseech you, and warn also, that ye not prick with no tormenting this tender maiden as you have done mo, for she is fostered in her nourishing more tenderly, and to my supposing she might not adversity endure, as could a poor fostered creature. And when this Walter saw her patience, her glad a cheer, and no malice at all, and he so often had her done offence, and she I sad and constant as a wall, continuing ever her innocence o'er all, the sturdy Marcus gan her heart address to rue upon her wifely steadfastness. This is enough, Griselda mine, quoth he, be now no more aghast, nor evil paid. I have thy faith and thy benignity as well as ever woman's was assayed, in great estate and poorly arrayed. Now know I, dear wife, thy steadfastness. And her in arms he took and gan to kiss. And she, for wonder of it, took no keep. She heard not what thing he to her said. She farred as she had start out of a sleep, Till she was out of her amazedness abraid. Griseld, quoth he, By God that for us died, Thou art my wife. None other I have, nor ever had, as God my soul save. This is thy daughter, which thou hast supposed to be my wife, other faithfully shall be mine heir, as I have I disposed, thou bear them of thy body truly, at Bologna kept I them privily, take them again, for now mayest not thou say that Thou hast lorn none of thy children tway. And folk that otherwise have said of me, I warn them well that I have done this deed, for no malice, 
nor for no cruelty, but to assay in thee thy womanhead, and not to slay my children, God forbid, but for to keep them privily and still, till I thy purpose knew, and all thy will. When she this heard, in swoon down she falleth for piteous joy, and after her swooning she both her younger children to her calleth, and in her armes piteously weeping embraced them, and tenderly kissing full like a mother with her salta tears, she bathed both their visage and their hairs. Oh, what a piteous thing it was to see, her swooning and her humble voice to hear! Grand mercy, Lord God, thank it you, quoth she, that ye have saved me, my children dear. Now wreck I never to be dead right here, since I stand in your love and in your grace, no force of death, nor when my spirit pace. O tender, O dear, O younger children mine, Your woeful mother wean steadfastly, That cruel hounds or some foul vermin had eaten you. But God of his mercy and your benigne father tenderly Hath done you keep, and in that same stound All suddenly she swapped down to the ground. And in her swoon so sadly holdeth she her children too, That when she gan them embrace, that with great slight and great difficulty, The children from her arm they can erase, Oh, many a tear on many a piteous face, Down ran of them that stood to her beside, Uneth about her might they betide. Walter her gladdeth, and her sorrow slaketh, She riseth up abashed from her trance, And every wight her joy and feast to maketh, Till she hath caught again her countenance. Walter her doth so faithfully pleasance, That it was dainty for to see the cheer Betwixt them two, since they be met in fear. The ladies, when they their time assay, have taken her in into chamber gone, and stripped her out of her a rude array, and in a cloth of gold that brightly shone, and with a crown of many a richer stone upon her head, they into hall her brought, and there she was honoured as her ought. Thus had this piteous day a blissful end, for every man and woman did his might, This day in mirth and rebel to dispend, Till on the welkin shone and stars bright. For more solemn in every manna's sight This feast was, and greater of costage, Than was the rebel of her marriage. Full many a year in high prosperity Lived these two in concord and in rest, and richly his daughter married he unto a lord, One of the worthiest of all Ital, And then in peace and rest his wife's father in his court he kept, Till that the soul out of his body crept. His son succeeded in his heritage, In rest and peace after his father's day, And fortunate was eke in marriage, all he put not his wife in great assay. This world is not so strong, it is no nay, As it hath been in olden times yore, And hearken what this author saith, therefore. This story is said, not for that wives should follow Griselda in humility, For it were importable though they would, but for that every wight in his degree Should be constant in adversity, as was Griselda. Therefore Petrarch writeth this story, Which with high style he inditeth. For since a woman was so patient unto a mortal man, Well more we ought receiven all in gree that God has sent, for great skill is he proved that he wrought, 
but he tempteth no man that he hath bought. As saith St. James, If ye his pistol read, he proveth folk all day, it is no dread. And suffereth us for our exercise, with sharpe scourges of adversity, full often to be beat in sundry wise, not for to know our will, for certes be, ere we were born, knew all our frailty. And for our best is all his governance, let us then live in virtuous sufferance. But one word, lordlings, hearken ere I go, it were full hard to find a nowadays in all a town Griselda's three or two, for, if there were to put to such a says, the gold of them hath now so bad allays with brass that, though the coin be fair at eye, it would rather break in two than ply. For which here for the wife's love of bath, whose life and all her sex may God maintain in high mastery and elves were its scath, I will, with lusty heart fresh and green, say you a song to gladden you, I ween, and let us stint of earnstful matter, hearken my song that saith in this manner. L'envoy of Chaucer Griseld is dead, and eke her patience, And both at once are buried in a tale, For which I cry in open audience, No wedded man so hardly be to sail His wife's patience, In trust to find Griselda's, For in certain he shall fail. O noble wives, full of high prudence, let no humility your tongue's nail, nor let no clerk have cause or diligence to write of you a story of such marvail as of Grisilda, patient and kind, lest Chichivash you swallow in her entrail. Follow echo that holdeth no silence, but ever answereth at the counter-tale, be not bedaft of your innocence, but sharply take on you this governail. Imprint well this lesson in your mind, for common profit, since it may avail. Ye archy wives, stand I at defence, since ye be as strong as is a great camail, nor suffer not that men do you offence. And slender wives, feeble in battle, Be eager as a tiger, yon in ind, I clapping as a mill, I you consail. Nor dread him not, nor do him reverence, For though thine husband armed be in mail, These arrows of thy crabbed eloquence Shall pierce his breast, and eke his even tail. In jealousy, I read, eke thou him bind, And thou shalt make him couch, as does a quail. If thou be fair, where folk be in presence, Shew thou thy visage and thine apparel. If thou be foul, be free of thy dispense, To get thee, friends, I do thy travail. Be I of cheer, as light as leaf on lind, and let him care, and weep, and ring, and wail. So ends The Clerk's Tale by Geoffrey Chaucer.